This is Audible. This is Dodge City Nights, Book Six in the American Dragons series, written by Aaron Crash, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Chapter One. Stephen was trying to decipher a particularly complex passage in the third volume of the Dracarys Grimoire when Mouse stormed into his study. She was with the Wayne twins, Prudence and Chastity. Standing in front of his desk in lace-trimmed satin robes, their perfect legs were bare and shaved. Stephen's eyes drank in their luscious forms. There went his concentration. Mouse's eyes widened, her face turned red, and she stabbed a finger at the Texas twins. They have got to stop, Stephen, or I'm going to lose my shit. Her hair was mussed, like she'd been shot in the face with a leaf blower. She didn't have the slayer blade, so that was good. A big flaming sword in the hands of a pissed-off woman meant bloodshed and death, not a simple domestic squabble. Mouse was wearing an oversized Soundgarden t-shirt that went to her knees. As long as she stayed human, there was a good chance the Infinity Ranch wouldn't become a battlefield. Stephen sighed. He had all three of the Dracarys grimoires open, layered over each other, pondering what his next steps might be. The topaz pen lay next to his left hand, which was missing its pinky finger. To think, after all the fighting, he'd only lost that one body part. Most of the time, he didn't feel it at all. He reached out with his mind to check Mouse's animus. The ball of mystical energy spun inside her, spitting amber-colored light. She was at full strength. They all were. Things had been quiet since the Battle of the Thousand Steps Beach six weeks earlier. Chazzy was all smiles and ease. Prue, standing next to her, had cornered the market on crossed arms, frowns, and furrows. We aren't doing anything, Mouse, Chazzy cooed. We're just being a part of the family. Granted, we're the mothers, and if you do as we say, everything will be just fine, sugar. Just fine. Stephen winced and whispered, don't call her sugar. Mouse lost her shit. You want to address me, I would prefer in this order. Mouse, Melissa, or bitch. Got it? And I will not sit idly by while you try and rule over us. We are all fucking equals. I was here way before you, and I believed in Stephen's bullshit primacy long before you noticed us on your skank radar. Prue shook her head. No, we knew you were a skank right around the time you started drinking heavily with Rehagen Malk. Chazzy took over. Yep, you flashed a blinking red. She stretched out her pink-colored fingernails. Skank, skank, skank. The Wayne sisters were getting comfortable in their new surroundings, which meant they were taking what they thought were their positions as the alpha wives in the escort. That wasn't the case, but Chastity Virtue Wayne and Prudence Pride Wayne weren't what you would call team players. Unless they owned the team, called all the shots, fired people regularly, and were always there with a stern word, a team of lawyers and bullwhips. He tried to speak to them in a calm voice. Girls, this is not helping. You've got to... Yeah, that wasn't going to do much. I will smack you two bitches into one Texas road whore, I swear. Mouse shredded her t-shirt as she grew three feet to tower over them in her half-dragon form. Her back spines touched the ceiling. Her tail swished dangerously close to the wall of magical artifacts. Samael's lash, Carlo Bart Baxter's ten silver rings hanging on hooks, the angel knife, and the hell string, along with a bone arrow. Prue lifted her face up at Mouse, clearly not understanding the danger she was in. Stephen never had a bullshit primacy. Well, now, it was touch and go there for a bit, sister, Chazzy said, smiling. You have to admit, we weren't too bullish on him until after he took down Rehagen Mulk, which is when I think Mouse jumped in with both feet. Fire whooshed out of Mouse's nostrils. She flicked out her dagger-like claws. Maybe instead of one road whore, I'll carve you into several dozen pieces of slut. That's enough, Mouse, Stephen warned. Using Animus Chain, he gave her core a slight squeeze. He didn't drain her or hurt her. He only held her Animus, as if he'd gently taken her by the arm. The fire went out of Mouse, and she turned human, to stand there, naked, seething, 
but calming a little. Prue's frown turned into a smile. Good job, Stephen. I was wondering when you'd assert your lordshipness. Chazzy, on the other hand, giggled. Poor guy, this is the very last thing that he wants to be doing, but if you get seven women under the same roof, there is bound to be tons of shoes, showers, and drama. Never was before with us, Prue sniffed. The lesser wives generally knew their place and kept themselves there. Chazzy didn't think so. No, we just don't get along well with others, which is why we never have lived with our prime or his wives. Stephen decided it was time to step in. We're stopping this. Chazzy, Prue, no more. Mouse is right. There are no alpha wives or first wives or any of that. You're all the same, and if you can't get along, Mouse won't be the one who leaves. Yeah, you heard that, bitches? Mouse snapped her fingers, turned, and walked off. Her little butt wiggled up and down above her strong legs. The Wayne twins weren't impressed and didn't enjoy Mouse's strut. Stephen did enough for all three of them. Prue pulled up a chair for her sister, and then she herself sat down. Okay, Stephen, we are ready to take your punishment. Chazzy's eyes sparkled. Is this when you spank me for being bad? I've been such a bad, bad girl. If you love me good, I swear I'll be nicer to Mouse. Or maybe not. Then you can punish me again, and again, and again. Her robe had fallen open to reveal the perfect valley of her white cleavage. Stephen's mouth went dry and his breath caught in his lungs. His jeans got a little tighter. Well? Chazzy asked while Prue rolled her eyes. He held up a finger, smiled, and said, Give me a minute. It's hard to think when there's not much blood left in my brain. He let out a breath. I'll have to spank you later, Chazzy, because you have been bad. Come on, you both need to change. You are too smart not to know exactly what you need to do to be a part of this primacy. Your bullshit primacy? Prue smirked. Stephen gave her a long, steady look. She relented. Yeah, can't really call it that anymore. Most everything west of the Mississippi is yours, except for New Orleans and the Deseret Territory. And there's half of Australia you own, so yeah, she exhaled. I'm bored. Chazzy said loudly. Yes, we knew Mouse would come up here or try and kill us, and it was even odds on either. That says a ton about how far she's come. If she were boozing it up right now, she'd have snapped, and we'd have retaliated, and you'd be pulling 357 Magnum slugs out of that jiggly little ass. Stephen raised his eyebrows and blinked. Bored? No one has tried to kill us for six weeks and some change. I would have assumed you'd want the break. Chazzy leaned her head back and gave out an annoyed cry. Break? No, that's not what we want. We want it all. And we want it now, Prue finished. Stephen could understand how they felt. After getting so many territories so fast, after being on the run, hunted and harried, the last six weeks had been anticlimactic, and he wasn't getting much sleep researching Animus Chain, Flesh Forge, and Enchantrix, and there was the fifth Alfarian ability to consider, Stellar Flight. He had precious little information on the ability, though from his father's notes, it seemed to include aspects of Dark Armor and Serpent Grace. He pulled up the path of the Mirror Soul Dragon. He'd mastered Animus Chain, and Flesh Forge was next. Using both together, he wanted to help Uchiko and the Onari Guard either return them to being human or help them transition into full dragon skins. Speaking of which, Liam Strider had been going through the dragon skin rituals to see what was truly helpful in aiding humans to cultivate animus and what could be dropped. Dragons had added torture to the rituals just to keep humans in their place. That had to end. However, Liam did say that only humans who had Alfarian blood could make the transition. Some humans were simply primates and couldn't progress. Others had some of the genetic material handed down from the three brothers who'd escaped to Earth. Rahab, Mathal, and Icharam. He's doing it again, Prue muttered. Yeah, Chazzy answered. He's getting all up in his magic happy place. But we're sitting right here. But we kind of messed up. We shouldn't keep teasing Mouse about her grand self-sacrifice plays. 
we shouldn't, because you and I are guilty of them as well. So he's mad at us? Probably. Stephen switched his attention away from the skill tree. I am mad at you. Prue held up a finger to shush him. I know he's wishing Tessa and Sabina were here because he could bounce ideas off them. Chazzy smiled at him but answered Prue. I know you miss Sabina and her magic in the bedroom, ha. <laughs> but yeah, we can't help much with the woo-woo stuff since we do bullets more than spells. Yeah, we are the machine gun girls, but I've been kind of itching to try an impetum spell. Could really help us if we ever run out of bullets. That tickled Chazzy. Run out of bullets, what? Are you new? Prue laughed along with her and they bumped fists. Can I talk now? Stephen asked. The twins turned to him. Yes, Prue said. See, Chazzy said. We're totally a part of this family. Prue narrowed her eyes. And you think you're in charge, which is so fucking cute. Stephen laughed. You both understand we're all in this together, right? We're following my vision, but I need your keen minds. And I need you to behave. He pointed a finger at Chazzy. Or I will stop spanking you, bad girl, good girl, or gone girl. Chazzy pooched out her lower lip to fake a pout. Prue turned serious. Stephen, we both are yours. We both would go full mouse if it meant you'd be okay. We're in love. It's scary and it makes us kind of bitchy. We'll try and do better on the domestic side of things. As for our enemies, we'll torture them slowly in ways they won't understand until it's far too late. I'm Chastity Pride Wayne, and I approve of my sister's message. They bumped fists again. Stephen paged through to the last of the encrypted pages in the third volume. Okay, then let's get down to business. I'm seriously considering going after the Zotharic now. I'm tired of waiting. My father showed me the alternate Earth, and I know that's where we need to go. Also, remember how I told you about the three doors at the top of the St. Vrain Airy near Denver? My father has some sketches in the third volume. When you ascend the stairs, you come out of the dragon door. You face three others, and he has a few words about each. The wolf creature is Gaia Beta. The eagle is the Lyra, and the demon cat is Oikos. Prue frowned. Gaia Beta. Earth too, sure. Lyra is a constellation. As for Oikos, it's Greek, right? Means something like home. You go, girl. Chazzy squawked. Stephen was kind of impressed. Gaia Beta is the battle world, the second Earth, and that's where my father wanted us to go. Where you mean to fight the Zotharic? Prue had grown pale. Chazzy wasn't so smiley now. When I said I was bored, I didn't mean I wanted to try to outwit outer space demons. I can spot dragon soul shenanigans from a mile off, but mysterious genocidal shadowy fuckwads... Isn't that what your buddy Rahab called them? Shadows of fuckwads and dictards? Stephen had to pause to laugh. Okay, that's funny. It was shadows of teeth and talon. And yeah, not sure. But after all this shit with Arthur, Merlin, and the Dragon Knights, who knows what we'll find if we go balls to the wall after the Holy Grail. As I'm sure you're aware, Prue started, Chazzy and I have talked the holy hell out of this Holy Grail business. He could imagine their rapid-fire exchanges. He'd witnessed enough of them. They were sometimes called the Texas Machine Gun Twins because of their mutual love of firearms, but he was pretty sure it also referred to their way of thinking, talking, and bouncing ideas off each other. Yep, Chazzy said. I know this is hard on Tessa, being the daughter of both Merlin and the Dragon Slayer, but we need to see it through. And from what your visions told you, and from what you told us, the Holy Grail could be key in our fight against these nasty Z-things. We're trying not to say their name out loud. Bad mojo. The worst, Prue affirmed. Stephen nodded. He figured the quest for the Holy Grail was the right course of action, and he didn't possess all of the United States just yet. His western border was secure, thanks to the Pacific Ocean, but his eastern border was uncertain. Out of the eastern primes, only Morty Flint had made a deal with him. Chosen Ben Tozier of the New England primacy had offered some olive branches. Chosen Ben was probably the most trustworthy of the remaining American primes, aside from Morty. 
Stephen drummed his fingers on the spellbook. So once Tessa and Sabina get back from the Deseret Primacy, we head east to try and find this lake. They'd done some searching, but had come up empty. Then, with all the territories and people under his control, Stephen had been working non-stop, training, working on his sorcery, and enduring endless meetings with endless vassals and their lawyers. If Stephen never saw another PowerPoint presentation in his life, it would be too soon. But Novak and his law firm had a whole office just to handle the billing. The money involved was unimaginable, and every woman Stephen met was amazing, gorgeous, and in lust with him. That made the meetings and the presentations bearable, if a little... charged. The Wayne twins threw glances at each other. It was Prue who finally said something. Yeah, about that. Sending your two wives to talk to Cleet Soraya is a ballsy move. What if it's a trap? What if he tries to seduce them away? What if the proverbial shit hits the mythological fan? We took precautions. Stephen couldn't help but smirk. Sabina did some hardcore heavy divination magic and she didn't see a problem. And I'd like to see anyone mess with Tessa at this point. As for the seduction part, I trust both of them. They're free to do what they want. With other guys? Chastity asked, eyebrows raised. What other guy could compare? Prue laughed. We are all so hot and bothered around Stephen. Why on earth would any of us stray? A filly won't cheat if she's with the best, baddest, dragoniest stallion in the corral. Chazzy giggled. Dragon stallion, that's our Stevie. Girls, come on, Stephen said. Seriously, I don't own any of you. But that's gonna change and right quick and in a hurry, pal. Prue leaned forward, giving him a shot of her deep cleavage. Now that you've captured my heart as well as my coochie, I want to get married. Chazzy's with me. And if you don't think Aria, Mouse, and Sabina are on board, you are a special stupid kind of dumb. Zoe's not going to go for it. The sarcasm in Chazzy's voice was unmistakable. I'm not sure she's in love, since she's kind of cold and aloof when it comes to our boy Stevie. Steven he corrected, and no joking about Zoe. She's been making progress. Prue shot him a finger gun. And she won't be the problem. Tessa will be. She is what the professionals call polyamorous. Chazzy coughed into her fist. Slut! Stephen didn't want to talk about marriage, Zoe or Tessa, not at midnight, and not when he wanted to get on with his studying. Prue saw it and changed subjects. Hey. About the Animus Chain wards? Alarms cut her off, sirens wailed, and pulsating emergency lights filled the Infinity Ranch. An instant later, Stephen felt a presence break through the front door, moving fast. How could an entity move that fast? Was it the first of the Zotheric invaders? Or was it something else? Chapter 2 Naked and turned on beyond belief, Tessa had lost track of Sabina. The Latina magician was somewhere, in one of the many rooms of the Salt Flats Airy, a mansion lost in the wide flats of western Utah. That was where Eve Downfire had invited them. Most likely, Sabina was in the middle of what Abby Free called a puppy pile, a big group of loving bodies rejoicing in the love and the lust. They'd had a nice dinner. They'd chatted. Both Tessa and Sabina had asked about Cleet Soraya, but had been put off. Eve and the other wives had been so kind and hospitable, Tessa wondered if this was paradise or if it was a trap. Sabina had kept her divination magic up to help her see and to make sure that both she and Tessa were safe. Then Eve had made the first move, and the rest of the women had joined in. There had been nine women— some full dragon souls, other dragon skins, and the rest of a mixture of warlings, morphlings, and magicians. Three were in the bed with Tessa. The other six were for Sabina, who would play her games with them. The Latina magician had an imagination as big as her libido, and she could switch from dominant vamp to a submissive toy in seconds. Eve bent and kissed Tessa. The woman's soft breasts filled Tessa's hands. Her mouth was warm and she smelled so good. She was wearing a Chanel perfume, Chance, if Tessa wasn't mistaken. 
The older woman had sculpted her body into a weapon, part soft hips, part hard muscles. Her skin was flawlessly white, so pale compared to her nearly black hair. Eve's ice-blue eyes were nearly closed as she enjoyed Tessa as much as the barista enjoyed her. Two other naked women were on the bed with them, Hannah Cannon and Sun Savage. Sun was a Chinese-American woman on the larger side, who looked down on Eve and Tessa, kissing with fire in her big brown eyes. She was leaning back, her big breasts atop her little belly. Her nipples were big and dark. Perfect. Hannah was between Tessa's legs, kissing her thighs, licking her softly. And just when Tessa thought she'd lose herself in an orgasm, Hannah would pull back. The edging was as maddening as it was wonderful. Tessa felt the mystical energy swirling around them in the bed, up high in the master bedroom, at the top of the mansion. Come morning, the view of the sunrise would be gorgeous. Now, the eastern horizon was lost in midnight's darkness. Tessa's colt peacekeepers hung in their holsters off a chair at the desk about five feet away. She'd been practicing with the more telekinetic aspects of Magica Defensio and could have them in her hands in seconds. Yet in the end, she felt safe with Eve and the other Deseret Primacy ladies. Hannah gently nibbled Tessa's thigh. She had dirty blonde hair, cut short, with the sides of her head shaved. Her body was tanned and strong, her lips full, and she was remarkably talented with her tongue. Tessa also loved her breasts, simple handfuls of pliant flesh with tiny nipples, cute and pink. Out of the women on the bed, only Tessa had tattoos, and she loved each and every one. However, the hurricane circle above her heart, inches away from the talons of a red-tailed hawk, was the most special. She was back to shaving one side of her head and dyeing the rest of her hair an unnatural black. With dark eye makeup and bright red lips, she loved the way she looked. Eve's son and Hannah seemed to like her as well. No, you know where I want it, Tessa complained. Please, here. She reached down and spread herself in a vain attempt to get Hannah to lick her where she was the most sensitive. Eve trailed a hand down Tessa's throat until she was cupping one of Tessa's breasts. Sun leaned forward to kiss her other mound of sensitive flesh. Tessa reached and felt Sun's nipple harden in her palm. These women were spectacular. And smart. Tessa and Sabina had been drawn into their love. Seduced, really. But Tessa wasn't sure what the rules were for dragon souls, their wives, and dallying around with women in other primacies. Stephen said they were free to do what they wanted, and Tessa wanted this. And if she could bring him another primacy in the process, all the better. We know what you want, Eve said gently. She gave Tessa's lips a slow lick. That perfume, it was both warm and sensual at the same time, like a long hug. But we wanted to talk a little business with you. That surprised Tessa. What? Now? Eve laughed a little. Well, we certainly have gotten to know each other pretty well in the last few hours, wouldn't you agree? The barista-turned-magician couldn't argue with that. She'd pleasured each of the women in the bed multiple times. Eve made this cute squeaking sound when the ecstasy took hold of her. Fine, Tessa sighed. We might as well talk business, since Hannah is basically torturing me. You love it. Sun said and gave Tessa's breasts a little nibble. It was hard to think with all these lovely women around her, their skin, their scents, their gentleness. I don't hate it, Tessa laughed. Okay, Eve, what's really going on with your primacy? We don't have a prime, Eve murmured. Kleetsaraya met his end ten years ago. We kept his death a secret, and I've been showing up in his place when it was necessary— we didn't want another dragon lord to rule us. We want to rule ourselves. Tessa wanted to stop making love and get the full story. She tried to sit up. Hannah had other ideas. Her mouth finally found Tessa's sensitive nubbin, and all she could do was hiss because it felt so good. And Sun was there, sucking on her right breast, while Eve held the other, kissing her and telling secrets. The older woman... The real prime eased Tessa back down. 
Let me finish. We want to join with Stephen Dracarys. We want to free dragon soul females everywhere. But Tessa, we're afraid. We know how power can corrupt men, and we don't want to be slaves anymore. Again, Hannah took the barista to the very edge of a climax and then withdrew. Tessa had to laugh. Tessa moved her hand to her sex. Okay, I can't think straight. Let me finish myself off real quick. Hannah gently grabbed her hand to stop her. No, Tessa, not yet. I'll get you there, but first, business. This is some kind of fucked up hostile negotiation, all right. Tessa closed her eyes and exhaled. She felt frustrated, intrigued, and overwhelmed for a second. Then she took hold of her senses. With Stephen's help, she'd mastered Animus Chain. She reached out with her mind to feel the Animus cores of the women in the bed, all spun with the pure fire of dragon souls. Eve was the most powerful, but Sun wasn't any kind of slouch, and Hannah had a warrior's soul in her. Dragon souls. Tessa could almost taste their energies filling her, not from sex, but from slaughter. If they were to fight, and if she killed them, their souls would be hers. Inside, Tessa burned a hellfire that needed fuel. This was the dragon slayer part of her. For a mad second, she pictured herself reaching for her guns, igniting them with ion claws, and then letting that battle lust take her away. It was a jarring thought, and Tessa laughed it away. At her heart, she was a lover, not a fighter, right? Most days she knew. Sometimes at night, she had her doubts. There was one constant in her life, however. You can trust, Stephen. I made it clear that this bullshit dragon lord slavery must stop. I wouldn't be in Stephen's primacy if I didn't think we were doing the right thing. Would we have to sleep with him? Son asked. I haven't been with a man in a long time. I've gotten used to Eve and the other ladies. Not sure I can switch. Tessa grinned. Stephen is awesome in all kinds of ways, but no, you wouldn't have to sleep with him. If you wanted to walk away, you could, or you could find candidates to train as dragon skins, or you could petition to become a wife. At this point, Stephen is careful who he brings into his escort. Careful? Hannah asked. Was that wonder or suspicion in her voice? Either way, Tessa found the dirty blonde woman's slightly husky voice sexy as hell. Yes, careful. He has his hands full with us, his lucky seven, and Uchiko. And then there's the five widows, the three queens, and the bajillion other wives he has now that he's conquered so many primacies. She paused. Heavenly seven? Lucky seven? He sometimes refers to us as his core escort, but I'm not sure I like that either. Eve let out a breath of relief. So, we'll join you. No, Tessa said quickly and forcefully. I won't let you. Not until Hannah stops torturing me. Hannah, take her there, Eve said quietly. Then it was licks, kisses, and some gentle sucking, and finally, finally, Tessa found herself lost in an orgasm, one of the best of her life. She'd been on edge so long that the climax shattered her a bit. She made new sounds of her own. Tessa sat in the hot tub on the balcony. It was a little after midnight. Leaning back in the hot water, she watched a shooting star streak across the cold sky. The air smelled of the miles of salt around them as well as I-80 far in the distance. She was naked, sleepy, and sexed out for the moment. It had been nonstop. All those new bodies and unique souls satisfied her like nothing else, except maybe battle. Looking back, she'd taken to fighting so quickly. She remembered rescuing Arya from Edgar Vale. She'd leapt out of the window to stab a psycho dragon skin in his chest. Then she'd fallen. A normal human wouldn't have done that. Then again, she'd never been human. Was she polyamorous because of her ancestors? It made sense. She'd leapt headfirst into Stephen's escort and hadn't looked back. And when Stephen brought in new women, she didn't mind a bit. Just more love and laughter and more customers for her morning coffee fests. Yes, Mouse had been difficult and was still difficult at times. And the Wayne twins, yeah, they could be total mean girls. 
Yet Tessa was falling in love with all of them and the world they'd created together at the Infinity Ranch. Eve padded out from the silent house. She'd been sleeping when Tessa had slipped out of the house to soak in the hot tub. All the lovemaking had Tessa wired and awake, and she loved how she was feeling. The older woman wore a flannel housecoat, which she dropped. She walked into the hot tub naked and sat across from Tessa. Couldn't sleep? Tessa asked. I don't sleep well, Eve cast her eyes down. Memories. Not good ones, I'm afraid. Cleet was a monster to us, but he's gone now. The silence that followed was telling. Tessa didn't need magic to know what had happened. You killed him. Was it just you or did the others help? All of us together, Eve whispered. You're the first outsider we've told. Agatha Stipe, our best magician, cast the spells we needed to hide the truth, even from you and Sabina. And Stephen. He has powerful divination magic. Is that not so? Yes, it's true. The three of us are probably the best precogs on Earth. We knew something strange was going on, but we couldn't confirm it with magic. Eve didn't respond. The pain on her face was evident. Tessa moved to the center of the hot tub. She crouched and held Eve's hand. Look, you must have been in a horrible situation. I've talked to other dragon soul females who weren't lucky enough to have sister wives willing to end the abuse. They had to take it for years, for decades sometimes. She thought of Uchiko and her sad story. For some, even centuries. The murder was quick. We poisoned him with elf tears. He went to sleep and died in his dreams. Her voice faded. The years since were harder. If any dragon lord suspected our treachery, they would have killed us to send a message. It wouldn't have been quick, and it wouldn't have been pleasant. Living with the fear year after year was awful. Then we heard of Stephen and what he wants to do. At first we couldn't believe his motives were pure. Then, when we heard how powerful he was, we didn't dare approach him. We've had one master, and we didn't want another. You changed things. Me? Tessa asked, shocked to her core. What about me? I'm just the kitchen help. I make really good coffee, she laughed. Oh, I get it. You want in on the Dracaris action because of my vanilla lattes. I understand. Stephen isn't a whiz in the kitchen, but the boy can mop. Instead of laughing, Eve covered her eyes. Her lips trembled with emotion when she talked. Hearing you laugh, making your jokes, it's such a relief. You are so different from what we imagined. You can even make fun of Stephen and his mopping skill. Your respect and love for him shows despite the humor. Thank the stars in heaven and all good things. Stephen's a good thing, Eve, really good. Wait until you meet him. Tessa rose to feel the night's chill air on her wet skin. She then sank down on the seat next to Eve. But my jokes and lattes aren't what made you change your mind. No, the woman said quietly. She gazed into Tessa's eyes. We talked with Javier Jones at first, then the Wayne twins, but we still weren't sure. Imogene Summers from the PNW Primacy assured us Stephen was different, but we still couldn't believe it. Then Agatha caught something in a vision, something about you being Merlin's daughter. She has a book of dragon soul tales, some historically accurate, others merely legend she got from Cleet. He studied his ancestry a lot and took good records. It seems the old human tales are true, at least in some ways. There was an Arthur, a Merlin, and the Knights of the Round Table, and they were dragons. Yes, the Dragon Knights of the Ever-Seeing Eye. Tessa tilted her head. So me being Merlin's daughter meant something to you? It meant everything, Eve said. You are powerful, and you are a woman, and you will keep us safe if we join the Grand Dracarys Primacy, which stretches across the world. The sun never sets on his empire. I guess that's true. Tessa took Eve's hand. I will keep you safe, but not from Stephen, only from his wide and varied collection of enemies, past, 
present, and future. Eve leveled her gaze. We are not helpless. We can fight your present enemies, and as for the past, I will check with Agatha, but I think she wouldn't mind if you borrowed some books to study. Tessa felt giddy at the idea of more books to read. Who had she turned into? Weird, but getting a new book felt almost like getting a new lover. Such a change. We'd love to check the book out, Tessa paused. But Eve, there's something else you need to know about me. There was a dragon slayer a thousand years ago that was so powerful, she drove all the dragon lords into hiding. I'm her daughter as well, and I can feel that part of me, Eve, this awful thing. Sometimes it scares me. No, all of the time it scares me. Eve lifted Tessa's hand and kissed it. We get to decide who we are. We decided not to be slaves to Cleet Soraya anymore and to live as free dragon souls. You are your own woman. Be who you want to be. Tessa smiled. I love that. Be who I want to be. And I want to be Merlin's daughter. When I first found out, I was so proud. Me, this nobody from Denver, Colorado, and suddenly I'm fucking royalty. It was nice. Me and Stephen were quite the pair, a princess and a prince. So I noticed there is no ring. Why hasn't he married you yet? Eve asked. The question turned Tessa's mouth dry. Aria Mouse and the others, especially Zoe, had been talking about that recently. They wanted to put on the ring that would bind them to Stephen forever. For Tessa, though, that meant something completely different— She'd grown up human and had vowed never to get married. No one would ever own her. Eve saw that the question had totally and completely freaked the shit out of Tessa. Never mind. Really, it's none of my business, and I love the fact that your prime hasn't forced you into the ritual. It's powerful. He knows it is, Tessa said in a quiet voice. That's why we're going slow with that. You should have seen me when I heard he had these dragon soul seduction powers. I lost it. I walked halfway down I-25 before I'd let him talk to me. Once he did, I knew his heart was in the right place. He's not in this for the money, power, or pussy. He wants so much more than all that. Hmm, Eve thought for a minute. Sex with a man. Son was right. It's been a long time. Tessa laughed. Don't worry. It's like riding a bike, but with more penises involved. Insert tab A into slot B. You'll remember. She loved Eve, but she was also so quick to love. Maybe Merlin had been like that as well. Eve glanced up. Sabina came wandering out, eyes glowing green. She'd gained weight since completing the dragon skin rituals, and it suited her. She had lovely breasts and those hips. Such curves made women so wonderful to look at it, to touch, to hold tight. Tessa felt the tingles start again. Ugh, her sex drive wouldn't shift out of fifth gear. She felt like she was hurtling down a highway of lust and she just missed the last exit for a hundred miles. Ay, caramba, girl, Sabina said. Then she switched to her new telepathy. Don't you ever get enough? The Latina magician slipped into the waters and sighed. Hola, Eve. You throw a nice party. Eve smiled. So that's what we're calling it now? Tessa had been practicing talking to Sabina using their minds. She cast a divination spell, then forced her vision to center on Sabina. She kept her focus sharp and sent her thoughts. I thought I might have gotten enough lovin' tonight, but then you came out and you look so good. Are you receiving this transmission? See, Houston, no problemo with that. I think we can trust Eve and her eight. Maybe we call them Eve's eight. Totally, and they are so not hateful. I don't understand, but that is fine. This is probably rude to do in front of Eve, like passing notes in class. But Tessa, you should know, there was an attack at the Infinity Ranch. An image filled Tessa's head. Sorry, Eve but we have to get home right away. Chapter 3 
Stephen leapt from his desk. A shadowy figure burst into the room, running impossibly fast. He saw the blurred orange too late to avoid the strike. The intruder's staff, tips glowing, caught him across the chest. He was thrown back against a bookcase, stunned for a minute. Oh shit, this bitch again? Chazzy shouted. Didn't you shoot her, Prue? Yeah, I did. I certainly hate having to shoot the same person twice. It doesn't reflect well on my aim, nor our training. Both twins exploded out of their robes to become hulking pink homo draconi. Their sweet bubblegum smell filled the room. They reached for the runner, clutching at her, but she avoided their claws easily. She leapt and raced against the wall. Stephen cast a defensio spell. There was no way he was going to let the speedster steal any of his father's spell books. He set the force field in front of his desk. He hurled impetum stars, spinning black stars of energy. They struck the wall, sizzling and sparking off the stone. The twins were so big, filling the room, he had to adjust his aim. And the intruder knew it. She skidded under their bodies and slid to the back wall like a runner stealing second. She was going for their artifacts. Don't you have a gun, Chaz? Prue lashed out her tail and it smashed through an end table and lamp. The intruder was unhurt. Ain't got one, Prue. Chazzy lunged forward, her talons raised. The speedster leapt onto her scaled back, ran across it, and seized the angel knife. Why ain't you got one? Where would I put it? My cooter? That shit's too cold. And besides, I'm a lady. Prue slithered across her sister and flung herself at the intruder. The slim figure brought her staff down on the Wayne twin. In a flash of orange, Prue was knocked unconscious. Chazzy screamed and breathed fire. Time seemed to slow as the gout of flames left her mouth. The intruder was by the wall with the angel knife in one hand and the staff in the other. The shelves would be toasted, but Samael's lash and Carlo Bart's rings wouldn't be hurt. As for the hell string and the bone arrow, Stephen wasn't sure they'd weather the dragon fire undamaged. But if they could capture the interloper, losing them might be worth it. The speedster was too fast. She slid under the exhalant attack, whirled around Stephen's shield, and headed toward the steps and her escape. Stephen reached out with his mind and found her animus, a swirling vortex of orange energy. It was huge. Whoever the intruder was, she was ancient, and it was definitely a her. Stephen pulled at the sphere, taking her energy. It would slow her down. She had to be using magic to increase her speed, probably serpent grace, but this was off the charts. No, he felt the enchantment in the woman's very bones. How was that even possible? It didn't matter. Taking away her animus forced the speedster to stop. She appeared before them, crouching, naked, with no breasts to speak of, but with huge, strong thighs. She had dusky skin, long, inky black hair, and a beautiful face. Sloped nose, full lips, and dark eyes with full lashes. She had the look of an indigenous woman from Central or South America. A name came to Stephen. Umbra. Saavedra had mentioned that Roy Wright had a super-powered wife that they thought had been a casualty of the Battle of the Thousand Steps Beach. That wasn't the case, obviously. With Roy Wright dead, Umbra should have come to him so they could talk, but she'd gone rogue. Was she working alone or with someone else? And why did she want the angel knife? She wasn't completely naked. On her hands were rings, familiar-looking rings, one flashed and then turned into black smoke. Her animus core flared and she rushed down the steps. Stephen triggered Serpent Grace and went after her, chasing her down the steps, going fast. He crashed into the wall, sped down, and entered the great room. The door hung off its hinges. Zoe was there, in her bare form, blocking the intruder's exit. Mouse had come tearing out of her room, the slayer blade flickering with green fire. Aria, in sweatpants and an old Alicia Chennai t-shirt, was hot on her heels. Umbra raised her staff. She was going to knock Zoe away, and with her speed, that swing just might kill the bear girl. He reached for her animus, but couldn't find it. Encanto, Stephen shouted. If he couldn't drain the source, he would try to dispel the magic powering the intruder. Again, Umbra lost her speed, which was odd. Serpent Grace wasn't a magical ability, per se, but part of the Pugna branch of the skill tree. A dispel magic charm shouldn't have stopped her, but it did. Strange. Umbra turned to give him a very unfriendly glare. Another ring on her finger turned into dark vapor. 
Zoe shambled forward, her great jaws open to expose her five-inch-long canines. If she got her fangs into the intruder, that would slow her down like nothing else. It wasn't meant to be. Umbra powered up again, ran forward, leapt, and bounded off Zoe and out the door. Gone. Into the night. Zoe shifted. Who was that? Chazzy helped her sister down the steps and into the room. That was Umbra, Prue said. She's like a zillion years old and a pain in my ass. She hit your head, sweetie, Chazzy corrected. Your ass is on the other end, and you say you're the smart one. Even though Stephen healed her, Prue insisted on an ice pack for her head and a cup of hot chocolate. She said she was feeling low and needed some TLC. Those twins, they were simply not used to fighting. They preferred backroom deals and gun ranges where the targets never fired back. Stephen got Prue set up in front of the fire while Zoe fixed her up something to drink. Aria paced, frowning. Her t-shirt was frayed, old, and from the 90s, from Alicia Chennai's Made in India tour. Mouse had tried to stay awake, but she'd curled up in a chair and had fallen back asleep with her head resting against the pommel of her sword. It was probably the cutest thing Stephen had ever seen in his entire life. Mouse was great. Prue and Chazzy, of course, were in high fucking gear. Chazzy. Umbra alive. Who could have known? Prue. I certainly didn't. Word on the street was, she was dead and not part of the sinful 70. Is that what we're calling Roy Wright's wives? Uh-huh. Tessa approved it, bless her heart. Sinful is right. What's the name of their lead gal? It was a stripper name, I know that. Candy Tricks. And if that isn't too on the nose, I certainly don't know what would be. Maybe Jasmine Cinnamon Candy? Those tricks are not for kids. Zoe returned from the kitchen to pass out mugs from a tray. Stephen sniffed his drink. It wasn't hot chocolate. Prue took a break from holding the ice pack on her skull to sip from her mug. It's not hot chocolate, Chaz. Not hot chocolate. The Morphling had one job, one fucking job. Stephen fired her a warning look and cut her off mid-complaint. Zoe looked hurt. Hot chocolate is so unhealthy, so I made you something better. Ginger, almond milk, and coconut oil. Isn't it delicious? Chazzy patted her sister's leg. She left and returned with a bottle of Crown Royale. Zoe? You are just the sweetest thing, worrying about our diabetes, which we can't get because we're ancient magical creatures. Yeah, I think my sister misspoke with her original order anyway, so be happy, Prue, with a little of the happy juice. She tipped the bottle into Prue's mug and then into her own. Cheers. Zoe sat on a little couch, cupped her mug, and lowered her head. She let her hair cover her face. Anyone else want any? Chazzy asked. Stephen caught the twins' eyes and nodded toward Zoe. She rolled her eyes, stood, and went to the bear girl. She touched the morphling's shoulder. Z, really, thank you. It was a sweet gesture. Prue doesn't mean to be mean. She's just hurt and shook up. We aren't as tough as you are. Zoe glanced up. Really? Chazzy smiled. It was probably fake, but that girl could sell it. Really? We're kind of fragile. We're not really frontline kind of wives. At that word, Zoe shifted her eyes to Stephen, then to Prue, and then to Chazzy. The bear girl smiled. Wives, I like the sound of that. And you're right, I should have made you hot chocolate. I forget most people have this aversion to eating healthy. Aria let out a frustrated growl. Our beverages are not the issue here. We have a crisis. Losing the angel knife is one thing, but a more serious situation is before us. Our security has been breached. Our enemies have the location of the Infinity Ranch, and they have intel on our inventory of magic items. Chazzy returned to her sister on the couch. Prue moaned, leaned her head back, and relaxed into her ice pack. She'd sip her doctored-up drink now and then. Stephen kind of liked the spicy drink, though it needed a buttload of sugar. He didn't want to hurt Zoe's feelings, so he drank it. Aria was right. They did have a situation. Yes, no one should know where we are. We changed vendors so that the construction guys are inside the Dragon Soul community. They wouldn't risk spilling our secret location. 
Also, we have the hurricane circles, and Liam put up guards against anyone divining our location. I don't think magic is involved. Aria bent and threw a log into the fire. She stood. It must be Bud. He must have talked to the wrong people at the wrong time. Or perhaps one of our allies has turned against us. Javier Jones, Saavedra, Imogene Summers, they all know about the Infinity Ranch. But not about the knife, Stephen said. We don't talk about it much. And the knife is what? Chazzy asked. You told me once, but I wasn't paying attention. It sounded really magical and boring and just like, who cares? Prue lowered her ice pack. Chastity pride, our stock in trade is information. Every little scrap is another bullet in our arsenal. Even the most uninteresting factoid might mean the difference between life and death. Then tell me, Prudence Pride, enough with lectures. It's late and Stephen is going to need a little banging before he can sleep. I know I will, so snap to it. All eyes went to Prue. Well, it was from the Rahab fight. Either the big R made it or he found it. Anyway, Nikki Angel had been one of Cassius Pine's wives, but she got herself killed, or so it would seem. The dagger was used to bring her back to life. From what I understand, she was the funny widow, or that's what Skylar Black said to me during one of our conversations when I actually listened. Zombie dragon? Chazzy asked. Prue nodded. Zombie dragon. It cast a rainbow-colored light and was linked somehow to the big R. Once he bit the dust, the magic faded, and Nikki Angel, at least her corpse, was no more. The end. They brought the dagger back here and stuck it up on the wall. Now, it seems to me, whoever took it wants to bring someone back to life. Arya cut in before the twins could start their back and forth. Yes, that is what I'm thinking. So we need to do three things. Find out who Umbra might be working with, who she wants to bring back to life, and how she found the location of the Infinity Ranch. I want Bud here, tomorrow afternoon at the latest. If he gives me any trouble, I will not be a happy person. Mouse woke up to sleepily murmur, And if Arya isn't happy, no one is happy. You bitches are loud and crazy. She fell back asleep. Stephen felt Tessa's voice hit him hard. Oh my gosh, Stephen, I can't believe someone found us. I saw the fight, or at least Sabina showed me it a little. We're on our way home. We're both full of animus, and oh boy, do we have news for you. He squinted against the noise. Tessa wasn't as delicate and subtle as Sabina. He was even worse. Zoe was kneeling before him in an instant, her back furry, her shoulders big, her hands becoming claws. Her panic had forced her into a partial change. Stephen, are you okay? What's wrong? No, it's okay. Tessa contacted me. Hold on. He cast the divination spell. Picturing Tessa, he sent her a message back, trying to whisper. We're all okay. Prue is a little shaken up, but we're fine. What? You're so faint. Can you speak up? Tessa sent. Stephen repeated the message, only a little louder. Must have been too loud. Ouch. Okay, I'm putting on my winter clothes for some dragon flight. Be home soon. Don't send back. I think my brain is bleeding. Did Cleet hurt Tessa and Sabina? Aria asked, worry in her voice. Stephen shook his head. No, nothing like that. Give me a second. I want to use this divination spell to see if I can find any trace of Umbra or who she's working for. With his vision blurring from the black mist in front of his eyes, he turned his mind inward to look through the dirty window showing him the past, the present, and the future. He saw Umbra putting on the rings, rings that were very similar to the ones Carlo Bart Baxter used, and though Baxter had been gifted with magic, it had been the mysterious Spider Finger who had given him the power. Enchantrix. Umbra shifted to fly through the night, but no, those weren't the Rocky Mountains, those were the Andes, and it was a thousand years ago in Cuzco at the beginning of the Incan Empire. Fires bloomed on the dark sides of mountains. He could sense her thoughts. Umbra wasn't young, but old. Very old. She was heading north because she didn't want to remain stuck in some backwater primacy, and there were dragon lords in what would become the United States of America, and they were doing amazing things. He caught a glimpse of Umbra in a cement room 
and she was talking with someone seated at a table. His left hand was out on the table, and instead of only two joints on his pinky finger, the man had three. Then nothing, and it was like someone had snuffed out a flickering candle. Whoever had engineered the daring burglary didn't want anyone knowing who Umbra was working for, or what she intended to do with the angel knife. Stephen's eyes adjusted and he blinked. He was back in the great room, the fire crackling with Zoe at his feet, the Wayne twins to his left, and Mouse sleeping in her chair to his right. Arya stood by the fire. Anything? Spiderfinger, Stephen whispered. Chapter 4 Morty Flint looked out over the rooftops of Chicago. All that life, all those humans, all their combined animus. He was a big man with a big belly who liked to eat. Getting fat wasn't so bad. He continued to train, and when he shifted into his true form, the extra weight helped him fight. Centripetal force could be very effective, and after 3,000 years, he had enough experience to use everything to his advantage— his Chicago Airy topped the Intercontinental Hotel on the Magnificent Mile. The secret penthouse commanded views of both the city and the darkness of Lake Michigan. A long bar ran the length of the room. Morty had cut his teeth working deals in Holy Roman Empire taverns during the Middle Ages. He enjoyed the liquor, the wood, the glass, and having a comfortable place to lean. He rarely sat on the collection of black leather couches, sofas, settees, and armchairs— the place didn't have walls, only windows. Rooms were below, and those had walls. Thick ones. Mr. Flint, the dragon lords are here. If you would like, I will send them in. The voice was a crone's husky grumble. Zuzana Wojcik stood at the door. He'd met her after her children were grown, a woman of sixty. That was nearly two hundred years ago. A remarkable woman, she'd immigrated from Poland by herself, ending up in Minnesota, near a small town named Foley. She'd been human, a magician, but she'd wanted to become a dragon skin. The rituals had worked, and she stayed near him now, though she'd become so elderly. She was his most trusted advisor. She knew his true name, Mordred, and she knew all about his grand mistake. The grand mistake that had cost him and everyone around him so dearly. Most of all, it had cost him his son, the assassin known as Bruno Illich. But before he'd become a eunuch, he'd had another name. Sir Brunor the Brave. No more. No more. Zuzana gave him her service. He gave her dragon-skin powers and graced her with extra centuries of life. Not a bad exchange. More than she deserved, really. Send them in, Zuzana, Morty muttered, and make sure each one has a bracelet. His younger and more powerful vassals stood out in the hallway to make sure each of the primes complied with the request. Two of his wives, Needles and Clutch, and his fierce warling, Court Kalo, could take care of the dragon lords if they proved unwilling. The powerful primes shuffled in. Louis Lelou of the French Swamplands Primacy came first. Alonzo Max Sterling of the Miami Dixie Primacy, which comprised Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, came next. Victor Nutgrass of the Carolina Primacy was followed by Ugly Ellis Dodge, who owned the Appalachia Primacy. Finally, bringing up the rear, chosen Ben Tozier ambled in, walking stiffly. Morty lifted his arm to show his own steel bracelet. Don't worry, gentlemen, I too can't shift. Let's keep this civil. We have a lot to talk about. A lot has happened since the Chicago Conclave in the fall. Did Javier Jones give you that? Ugly Ellis Dodge asked. He had long hair, a thin beard, and a scar running across his face. His hands were mostly knuckles. Then again, he seemed like only an odd collection of elbows, knees, and one single great Adam's apple protruding from his throat like a cancer. Ugly Ellis... The name fit. He squinted. Word has it that Javier perfected the magic, or that's how I heard it anyway. No, Roy Wright did, before his untimely demise. 
Morty walked slowly and carefully to stand behind the bar. He didn't want to spook anyone. Victor Nutgrass had bright white hair and golden skin. He was a handsome man, looked to be about 50, although no one was sure of his real age. He'd combined North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia, including the District of Columbia, to form a great territory. He had close contact with the humans. He was a strong, quiet man. He waited for others to talk. But Victor was downright chatty compared to Chosen Ben, who kept to himself. He'd lived too long with the humans in his primacy and had acquired their New Englander taciturn nature. Chosen Ben wouldn't be joining Morty, but the others might. Louis Lelou had a pencil-thin mustache and greasy black hair. He was the smallest of the primes, but the most powerful. Morty knew that from experience. He spoke with a Creole accent. His native French had been corrupted by the humans as well. Louis wasn't going to wait for anyone to talk. Zut alors, Monsieur Flint, it is fucked, I tell you, fucked, that you joined that little piece of shit, Dracars. Maybe you know about the Americos Chambers. Roy Wright exiled the upstart child for a time. We could, too. Morty smiled patiently. Alonzo Max Sterling nodded. He was a giant of a man with thinning blonde hair and a ruddy complexion. He had a belly of his own. I like that idea. Hell, if we could get rid of the kid, I wouldn't even want his territories. I'm just sick to death of worrying about him. And the rest of you. He laughed. Alonzo liked to laugh, and he did it easily. Until it was time to fight. We'll get to that, Morty said. But to clarify something immediately, I didn't join Stephen Dracaris. I gave him two primacies he'd have gotten on his own anyway. I made no deals. We have an uneasy alliance. Zuzana stood near the door. Morty gave her a glance, and she nodded. Ugly Ellis's laughter sounded like chopped wood. Bullshit! The way I hear it, y'all are thick as thieves. Fucking Candler. Fucking Helga. They couldn't hack the game. Nope, they couldn't. So you gave the kid their wives. You gave him land, taxes, warlings, and other dragon kind. Shit, Morty. Why? We'll get to that. Who wants a drink? They all did. Except for Chosen Ben, of course. No, Ben wouldn't be joining them, and he made it clear by refusing to drink with them. Some dragon lords you simply couldn't reach. Not with logic, not with heart, and not with combat. Ugly Ellis slurped a Bud Light. Yeah, that's fine beer there. This is what it is, Louis shot back. He was sipping on a tumbler of rare cognac brought over from France fifty years prior. Fifty years, a sip of time, nothing really. Fuck you, Frenchie, the Appalachian Prime shot back. And that is why we are in danger of losing everything, Victor said quietly. He had a highball, but he didn't drink it. He held it in a hand with manicured nails. Give the man from the Carolinas a prize. That's right. Morty had a tall pint of beer he'd brewed himself and a shot glass full of his own whiskey. Give a man 3,000 years of life and there are many things he'd rather make on his own than buy from the humans. He leaned on the bar and made eye contact with each of the men. Roy and I tried to use the Americos chambers and we came close, but no cigar. Speaking of which, I have a humidor full of my own tobacco if anyone wants a smoke. Ugly Ellis raised a hairy, knuckled paw. You can bet your ass I want one, Mort. Morty joined him in lighting Churchill's great big cigars from his own plantation in Cuba. Morty owned the Caribbean as well, but he didn't tell anyone that. He had puppet primes there, taking a page from Rahab's and Panga Komang's books. Why rule when others could do it for him and gave him tribute? The same was true for most of the Canadian primacies as well. It was best that Morty's true power remain a secret. Otherwise, not one of the primes would agree to an alliance. He would reveal just enough to win them and not a whit more. Morty breathed out smoke and waited. It was Victor who asked, How do you know so much about the Americos Chambers? Javier Jones has been studying them for decades, and if he'd known about the Master Chamber, he would have used it against us. Did you build them? Not me, but I knew the dragons who did. Two dragons, Arthur and Merlin, and one Alferos, the late Mathal. They created the defense chambers. 
All are dead, and I'm still around. Victor finally took a sip of his drink. Morty had impressed him. The legendary dragon knights fighting to make the world a better place. It seems the Dracaris heir would have fit well among them. Louis spit on the floor. Never. The dragon knights were powerful, righteous, and had more honor than this child will ever have. That's enough, Morty said sharply. And don't spit on my floor. Louis laughed. Next you will tell us that you were one of the Americos brothers. Morty smiled at what was essentially a myth he'd helped create. Knew them too. He took a deep breath, drank a little, smoked a little, and then got down to it. Three powerful primes should be able to take down Dracarys, if they are smart and if they stay focused. But we have eight. I see six here, Victor said with an easy smile. Or are you using the new math the humans are always working on? Morty's puppet primes, Lawrence Candler and Tiano Helga, came in, escorted by Zuzana. Candler had food on his fat face. He was a lost cause, but as cannon fodder, he could be useful. Helga, with his pinched face, was pissed off, and he would turn against Morty eventually. Might as well throw him at the Dracarys problem. Maybe he'd land a lucky blow and things could return to normal. Doubtful, but Morty had learned that hope was a powerful thing. Victor counted them up. Yes. Eight, I see. Seven, Chosen Ben said. I told you, Morty, I don't want any part of this. Are you going to be joining the infant? Louis hissed. I'm going to wait and see, the New England Prime answered. And I think that is the correct course of action. If he can fight and beat the Zotharic, I say we let him. He can't, Morty said quietly. I'm going to let you gentlemen in on a secret. I was one of the Dragon Knights. I was knighted by Arthur himself, and I held his sword, Excalibur, before the Lady of the Lake came to collect it. I was Sir Mordred in another life. I was trained to fight the Zotharic. I wasn't there when they invaded during the time of Hammurabi, but I was there when Arthur, Merlin, and Mathal prepared the defense chambers, the ever-seeing eyes, for when they attacked again. They trained me to deal with the shadows of teeth and talon, yet I never believed we could win. Mathal back then had a clear mind, and he was scared of them. Scared shitless, as they say nowadays. The memories made him think of the grand mistake. He felt shame. He showed the dragon lords nothing. That is a great pile of merde, Louis sighed. You are telling us stories, Monsieur Flynn. I do not believe them. Ugly Ellis raised his beer. Finally, me and the swamp rat can agree on something. Come on, Mort. Fuck you if you think we're fools. Everyone lapsed into quiet. Candler and Helga knocked on the table and Morty served them up big steins of his beer and slid shooters of his whiskey over to them. He knew they would only want his finest. It's true, Candler said. He's shown us some things. Can't argue with it. Helga nodded. And why the fuck would he lie about something like that? Victor stood quietly. Again, he sipped his highball. I'm inclined to agree with them. Are you the last of the Dragon Knights, Mr. Flint? Or are there others? Morty liked that. Mr. Flint, not Morty, not Mort. Every prime in the room cast a glance at the charismatic Dragon Lord, and Victor stood comfortably in their gazes, used to the attention. Morty had heard a rumor that the Carolina Prime had the U.S. President in his pocket. He hadn't really believed it until that very moment. There are three of us still alive, Morty said, then corrected himself. No, I keep forgetting Bedivere's death. Just two remain, me and someone in this very room, but we are keeping that a secret. That was the final piece that would draw them all in, and it was a secret Morty meant to keep until the very last minute. The dragon lords took a minute to stare at each other, trying to figure who the last dragon knight might be. Morty chuckled. Bedivere used to laugh that we were the three Americos brothers, but we were so much more than that. Chosen Ben's face was closed. He might have been scared, but he showed nothing. I don't want to know your secrets. The more I know, the more danger I'm in. Morty, I'm going to take off. You come after me, and I'll join the kid. Stay out of my primacy. 
and don't invite me to any more of these bullshit secret meetings. I won't come. He walked to the door, lifted his wrist, and waited for Susanna to free him. Morty nodded at her. Encanto, she murmured, and the bracelet fell off to clatter onto the floor. Chosen Ben turned. I want your witch to wipe my mind. I don't want to remember a thing about any of you. So when you think I'm turning secrets over to the Dracarys boy, you can think again. Can you manage that? Morty pointed at Ben. You might be an ass, Ben, but you are a smart ass. I'll do it myself. Defensio! The New England Prime's eyes went cloudy. Susanna let him out. Morty didn't take all the dragon's memories. He could have, but he only removed the meeting. Chosen Ben would know he'd gone to Chicago, and he'd remember he'd chosen to leave, but he'd know nothing else. Louis sneered. And that imbecile will die for leaving. Not right away, but he will die. Morty didn't respond. He knew the outcome. Having one dragon lord leave would only solidify the loyalty of the others. In their heart of hearts, both humans and dragons liked to take sides. Victor drained his glass and set it on the bar. I'd like another one, Mr. Flint, and I will keep your secret. I expect everyone in this room will. Now tell us your plan. You must be the other fucking knight, Ugly Ellis laughed. You're all smooth and shit. Fine, nutgrass, fine, I don't care. There are seven of us, we have thousands of vassals. So, Morty, what's your plan? The Great Lakes Prime smiled. Stephen is going after the Holy Grail. He is trying to get control of his new territories. Remember what he said during the Conclave in the fall? He said that he was no longer weak, and that he was too strong for us to deal with. I agreed with him then. I don't agree with him now. He will never be weaker than he is at the moment, distracted, swollen with pride, thinking I'm his ally. The time to attack is now. We strike his eastern border. We end him. A little bird... Morty paused. Let's make that a little spider told me where his secret area in Wyoming is. And the spider is also letting me track Stephen. If we can't pin him down in Wyoming, we'll hit him in Kansas or Nebraska, where his forces are the weakest. We'll kill him before he finds the Holy Grail. For I spoke to Mathal of that a long time ago on the shores of the lake outside. He motioned to the northern wall of windows. If Stephen wins the Holy Grail, he will be unstoppable. And what is the Holy Grail? Victor asked. The death of us all, Morty said quietly. Another beat of silence. I will join you, Victor Nutgrass said. The little swamp rat nodded. We, oui, I will bring my gree gree and add them to the cause. And I got my inferno dogs, Ugly Ellis growled. They don't cast spells, they kick fucking ass. Alonzo Max Sterling let out a hearty laugh. I don't have any fancy names for my people, but I have wives, warlings, morphlings, and magicians. I'd rather lose them in war than give them in peace. I'm with you. Morty nodded. They didn't need to know more. They would strike at the Dracarys child, invade his primacy, and the war would start. However, Morty knew the outcome. Let these other primes die especially Candler and Helga. Morty's real goal was the Holy Grail itself. After centuries of waiting for Merlin's daughter and the lost son to appear, Morty's patience had finally paid off. Dracarys would find the Holy Grail and Morty would take it from him. With such power, he would take the Americas, and then the world. Let other, more foolish dragons fight the Zotharic. Morty wanted no part of that. No, not Morty. He was Mordred again. While the six other primes plotted and planned, he stood behind the bar wondering at how easy it was to shed the persona of Morty Flint, and how good it felt to be a dragon knight again. This time, however, there would be no more mistakes, grand or otherwise. This time, he meant to win it all, and no one, human or dragon, would stand in his way. Chapter 5 Stephen and William Bud Novak walked around the construction site to the west of the Infinity Ranch. The day was going to be warm. 
Spring on the Great Plains was always such a crapshoot. Sagebrush perfumed the air. The central tower of the Infinity Ranch rose seven stories above the Northern Garden and the two little bungalows there, one for Liam and one for Sabina. To the west was the Widow House, connected to the main ranch by a walkway that led through the outdoor living room, which was protected by windbreaks. The walls were Tessa's design. The vertical waves of concrete had the names of the battles they'd fought up until this point. They still needed to add a couple, but Tessa was on it. It was the last week of March, and Stephen's 21st birthday was only six days away. Last year at this time, Bud had been a snide, fashionable fuckhead, a dickhead bully that Stephen ignored most of the time since he was working three jobs and going to school full time. Little things didn't mean much when you were caught in the grind, and Bud had been a little thing. Now, Bud was on track to be one of the richest men under 30 in America, thanks to the money funneling into his father's law firm, Novak, Boaz, and Jessup. It had been Boaz, Jessup, and Novak until it was clear that Stephen was going to be the only client they could handle, and so the Novaks got top billing. Bud was still working on his law degree in his free time, Stephen admired that. Bud wore a trim European blue suit, sans tie, and expensive black shoes. His hair was gelled into place. He'd driven up the minute Aria called him in the wee hours of the morning. Denise Price and Finney Iota came with him to get girl time with Stephen's escort. They were kind of isolated in Denver, and not being part of a dragon family sometimes wore on them, and if they weren't happy, Bud couldn't be. It was the nature of the male-female relationship. So the new house is just for the Wayne twins? Bud asked. It is, Stephen said, exhaling. They wanted five rooms and three bathrooms. I got them down to three rooms and two, but they want this big balcony thing. We're still in negotiations. Bud winced behind his dark sunglasses. Sounds hostile. So they aren't fitting in very well? Stephen ran a hand through his black hair. We're trying to change that. They are a handful. Tessa calls them the mean girls sometimes. That's not good. Bud sniffed at the sunshine. We should probably get inside for the big meeting. It's not going to be pretty for me, Cool Whip. Aria thinks I screwed the pooch on security and she's freaking out. And Aria can be... What's the word? Intimidating? Scary as hell? Intense beyond reason? Stephen couldn't help but smile. All three. Bud paused. It's like she's a hot-looking Thanos mixed with Darth Vader, mixed with an Indian Lara Croft doing porn, but not the nice kind. Stephen slapped the guy on the back. That's funny. Kind of, Bud sighed. Hey, Cool Whip, I want to thank you again for, uh, giving me Denise and Femi, he frowned. That's not right. I know you didn't give them to me, but you could have taken them on as wives yourself. Stephen thought of his many, many wives and shook his head. No, man, I have more than I can handle. Though handling them is fun. Bud laughed. Just the two have me tired out every night. You dragons sure have a high sex drive. But more than that, I love them, you know? I do. It's just... The lawyer paused. I'm not sure what they see in me. Sometimes I wake up and I can't sleep, thinking they don't really want me. It's not that I'm insecure, he laughed at himself. No, I'm really fucking insecure. Bud, without you, I could never keep all this under control. In the end, you're running most of this. I know your dad helps out, but I also know you have kept all the balls in the air, and you have a lot to juggle. Denise and Femi were drawn to you right away because you're a good guy, smart and capable. No, it was because of the Wayne twins, Bud said. They told me that Prue kind of freaked them out. Denise and Femi had their lives ripped away from them. I guess I offered them security. They do feel safe with me, but that's only because of you and how powerful you and your escort are. That's why we need to figure out how the Dragon Soul community found out about the Infinity Ranch. Stephen frowned and let out a breath. I just don't get it. We killed every one of Rehagen Malk's vassals. Cassius Pine is dead, and his widows are faithful to us. In the end, no one alive should know where we are. And yet, Umbra hits us out of the blue. It has the girls nervous. Not you? Bud asked. Stephen had to think for a minute. No, 
Have you seen what me and my escort can do? We have Tessa, who is becoming a force of nature, and we have Sabina, who can see into the future. As long as we're smart, we shouldn't have a problem. Bud laughed and shook his head. Damn, cool whip. You've come a long way. There is no way I'd mess with you now. Hearing that felt good. Stephen just wished other dragon lords felt the same way. The pair made their way into the house, and it was a beehive of activity. The kitchen was packed with women cooking, making coffee, doing dishes, chatting, and laughing. Even some singing was involved. Bud went in to help and to kiss Denise and Femi on their pretty faces, Denise so pale and Femi so dark. Aria was already at the big dining room table. She was shuffling through papers with her laptop open and reading glasses perched on the end of her nose. It gave her a sexy librarian quality, but it also gave her a prop to point with. And Aria with glasses on, well, if she were a principal at a bad middle school, it wouldn't be bad for long. She seemed unstoppable. The twins were on the sofa, heads near each other, chatting a mile a minute. Both wore tight jeans and tight pink blouses and were in full makeup and hairspray heaven. Their perfume hardly covered their bubblegum smell. Prue kept glancing at Denise and Femi in the kitchen, and Stephen knew why. She'd had lurid thoughts about them right away. Sabina slept near the twins on a chair, worn out. It had been orgy central over in his primacy, and Tessa was the mayor. Now the barista was in her element, with tons of friends, cooking breakfast, making delicious coffees, and laughing. Every now and then, Tessa shifted kind of funny and walked a bit funnier, as if she were sore in her tender spots. It seemed Eve Downfire hadn't gone easy on her. Stephen could hardly believe it. He had another primacy, and this one they got through fucking and not fighting. If only they could take more territory that way. Nine new wives, Eve's eight, or that's what Tessa and Sabina called them. His eyes went to the dining room table. They didn't have enough seats. They'd have to pull up folding chairs. They were eleven in all. Twelve. In the corner, arms crossed, black mask covering her face, stood Uchiko. Stephen hadn't seen her. She raised a hand. He threw her a kiss, which made the human side of her face blush. Did Uchiko drive up with you, bud? Stephen asked. Bud left the kitchen to answer him. I don't think so. She is a ninja, though, and sneaky as fuck. His BMW 540i sat in the driveway. With the weather being good, he hadn't driven his BMW X7, the biggest SUV the German company had ever made. Go big or go home, that was Bud. Stephen glanced back, and the corner was empty. Uchiko was around, but she wasn't going to do any of the chatting in the kitchen. No, she'd heard about the attack and had come up to check on him. She'd found a passion for motorcycles. Her helmet gave her complete anonymity, and she enjoyed the freedom. Uchiko. He hoped she'd ninja her way into his bed later on. Their sex was great, but more than that, each time they made love, each time he told her he loved her, her confidence grew. He saw how he could manipulate her animus to adjust her, but he was worried about her body more. That required flesh forge. Stephen went to the window and looked out over his land. The skeleton of Wayne Manor rose from the brush. The name was all Tessa's doing. He took a moment to pull up the path of the mirror-souled dragon. Flesh Forge was still a partial mystery, though he'd seen Bruno Illich use it to turn his left arm into a shield and his right arm into a spike, so it was very much like transformatio magic that allowed him to shift into his partial form and his true form. It was how Zoe could become a wolf or a bear. Speaking of which, the big girl yelled in the kitchen, I am not. She was getting louder, more assertive, and more independent. Her charge during the Battle of the Thousand Steps Beach had become legendary. So Flesh Forge was the next ability he needed to learn. Tessa would join him, of course. At this point, she was matching him spell for spell. His eyes went to the toxicity exhalant, which wasn't one of his strengths, but he didn't want to neglect what could be a powerful new addition to their arsenal. The cloud of poisonous gas could be deadly to both friend and foe. He wondered how Rahab had been able to spit acid. That was what he was more interested in. Could he learn both flesh forge and acid toxicity? He was going to try. Though he wouldn't be learning them at the Infinity Ranch. They had another road trip in front of them. 
He'd have some time to meditate as well as talk with Arya. They could even do a call with Liam Strider and get his opinions. It was ironic that they still called him the Yellow Ronin, as he was one of Stephen's most important vassals. He and Skylar Black were running the two primacies in Australia and keeping them safe and protected along with the five widows and the three queens. Stephen planned on talking to Bud about how well their legal nets were working. They were trying to keep the remaining two dragon lords on that far-off continent entangled in soul-damaging paperwork and crippling legal fees. The women in the kitchen broke out into a round of journeys don't stop believing. Stephen was pulled away from his reverie. Time for some breakfast. And some planning. Chapter 6 Mouse made her way to him. Come on, my prime. Let's start eating. Zoe's healthy pancakes are actually really good, and she's going to make a skyscraper of them. She pulled him down to kiss her. He held her tight, muscled body to him. She was so little, yet so full of power. Mouse nipped at his lips. Easy there, cowboy. Don't get me all riled up. We have a long morning meeting that I have to sleep through. Arya moved her computer and papers, and they all sat down. Stephen sat at the head with the Texas twins next to him on his right along with Sabina. On his left were Arya, Tessa, Mouse, and Zoe. Bud sat with Femi, Denise down at the other end. Uchiko wouldn't eat with them, not yet. She'd be on guard, walking the perimeter. Zoe would dash up, go to the kitchen, flip her pancakes, and then sit back down. The table was piled with bacon, sausages from the Boulder Sausage Company, fluffy scrambled eggs, and stacks of pancakes of all kinds, blueberry, apple cinnamon, and thick ones with seeds inside them. Those were the healthy ones. Tessa hefted one. These weigh like eight pounds each. What's in them? We ground gold bricks into flour. Mouse poured syrup onto the one she grabbed. We're that rich. Seriously, though... Buckwheat or some shit, I don't know, but they taste really good. Stephen didn't disagree, but he preferred the blueberry pancakes. He loved the tart bite of the hot blueberries falling apart in his mouth. And, of course, bacon. Lots of bacon, along with sausage, all washed down with Tessa's bitter black coffee. They laughed, joked, ate, and then cleared the table to get ready for their meeting. Zoe turned on the faucet to start on the dishes, Stephen went over to her and took the big bear girl in his arms. She melted against him. Zoe smelled so good, spicy, musky, lovely. She held him to her. With a house of seven women, there was a ton of talking, but not with Zoe. She was simpler. Their embrace said everything for the moment. Then Stephen saved the bear girl from a ton of work. No, you guys cooked. Chazzy, Prue, and I will clean up. What? Chazzy called out. Did I hear that right? Us? Cleaning? Doing dishes? Prue sat at the table next to her sister. He's lost it. Us? Doing dishes? When was the last time you washed something that wasn't your own bits? Does cleaning our M60E6 or our Desert Eagles count? Chazzy asked. Prue thought for a moment. I would say it certainly does. Hey, Stevie, we clean guns, not dishes. And don't you have servants for that? Maybe hire some warlings for some light cleaning? Or maybe cater every meal? Wait, shouldn't we have servants? Zoe didn't respond to them, but spoke to Stephen. Seriously, I can handle the dishes. Mouse and Tessa will help, and we have an enormous dishwasher. Aria had her laptop and papers back at the table. Come, Stephen, we have business, and you shouldn't be doing dishes. You are our prime, and such menial labor is beneath you. No, it's not, he insisted. I am never going to become some guy who can't clean up after himself, no matter how rich or powerful I become. It's good for people to work. Chazzy, Prue, will have our meeting, but then you'll help me. Chazzy crinkled her nose. Ew. Prue rolled her eyes. I certainly didn't sign up for shit work like this, but oh well, at least the sex is good. They refilled coffees and sat back down. Bud thumbed through information on his phone. Okay, so I had my IT people go through your internet security with a fine-tooth comb. We're good there. Your IP addresses are rerouted through Finland. That's not the problem. The construction people have all been vetted by Magnox Securities, and some of them are even morphlings. 
So it's not them. And believe me, it's no one at Novak, Boaz, and Jessup. We have NDAs for our NDAs. Did you guys sense anything using your magical powers? Everyone turned to look at Sabina. Her eyes glimmered with green light. You aren't lying, bud. I would know. It's not someone from your law firm. The last Dragon Knights know where we are. I am certain of it. And someone else? Someone in the shadows who has been watching us. Waiting for us. The Latina magician repeated the Elf Queen's words from the Bali Waterfall Temple, the starting point of their quest for the Holy Grail. To save the humans. That was the wish of the Dragon Slayer. To save Dragonkind. That was the wish of the Americos brothers. Good turned evil by sorrow. Good turned evil by fearful desire. Both full of hope for a better world. Daughter and son. Brother and sister. Husband and wife. And so I will show you the way as I did to Arthur Rex, lost to time, crippled by friendship, consumed by love. Stephen shivered. Sabina blinked as her eyes lost their glow and she was left with her colorless pupils. No, Manches, that wasn't me. Those words, they came to me, and I had to say them. It seems the answer to our mystery lies in the quest for the Holy Grail. They all sat in silence. For once, even the Wayne twins were quiet. Stephen spoke first. Sir Bruno was Mordred's son. He was definitely a dragon knight. I saw that in a vision during that final fight. And Roy Wright was actually Sir Bedivere. He was both a dragon knight as well as one of those Americos brothers. Tessa made a face. But how can that be? Americo Vespucci was born in like the 1400s, and that was 300 years after the fact. How could fucking Galadriel know to call them the Americos brothers? Arya spoke up. Perhaps she's watching us now, and that would explain how Umbra knew where we are. Perhaps she's the power behind the last of the Dragon Knights. That doesn't feel right, Stephen paused and gave Chazzy and Prue a look. Both were frowning, brows knit. It was Prue who nodded at him. Can we? Mouse let out a frustrated growl. Ugh, oh, this act again. Okay, girls, make it quick. I love this part, Tessa nearly shouted. Bud was mystified. What's going on here? Just watch, Stephen grinned. Chazzy turned on Prue. Girl, do you remember any of our official human high schooling? I remember three things. That one Alamo Heights high school cheer, go mules. I remember our history teacher was young and he'd get hard-ons in the middle of class and sit down quick in his desk to hide them. And I remember you were homecoming queen four years in a row. You think Mr. Bowman beat his meat every day after school? That's a certainty. Why are you asking me about our high schooling and not college? Because I damn sure know you don't remember a thing about Texas A&M, go Aggies. That was during your celebrated tequila phase. Prue blushed. I caramba, but this is not the time to bring that up. No, it's not. Point is, you and I are not going to figure this out from no book. Sweet tits over there, she pointed at Tessa, who thrust out her chest. Sweet Tessa, you mean? Chazzy smiled sweetly. Sorry, sweet Tessa, yes. She brought that book from Eve Downfire and the leftovers of Cleet's escort. Fuck Cleet Sarai, anyway. Glad he's dead. From all accounts, he was a bastard. Yes, he certainly was a bastard, and that's how we like our bastards, dead and gone. The twins knocked fists. An instant later, Chazzy said, Tessa can read up on the history. You and I will discuss current affairs. For one, the Shadow Hunter is out and about. Prue nodded. And let's not forget that she, and I do believe it's a she, took a pot shot at Tessa, and Stephen saved her life. Any chance sweet Tessa will go Dragon Slayer on us? Jury's out, but I'd take the bet she doesn't. I'll take that bet. Give me some odds and we can come to an understanding. Hey, Tessa protested. Chazzy held up a finger. One second, almost done. Umbra works for Sir Roy Bedivere Wright. He bites it, and now she's working for the next Americos brother, a.k.a. Dragon Knight, who is most likely Mordred, cause that does feel right. Current events, sis. We got the Sounders moving up from Texas across Oklahoma and into Missouri. And we have the Gree Gree going north as well. Louis Lalou is on the move from New Orleans. And what about Ugly Ellis Dodge and his Inferno dogs? Yeah, we know they are congregating in Illinois. For a full-on attack? Maybe marching here as we speak. So, yeah, it's war. Funny, Morty Flint has been quiet. Funny that we ain't seen hiding her hair of needles, clutch, or cork collat. 
All is quiet and good in the Great Lakes Primacy, or so that's what we've been led to believe. I fucking hate Juice Juice. Amen. He put holes in us. We owe him a couple bullets. Amen and twice as loud as that. Stephen saw his chance to jump in. Wait, we know who the Sounders are, but who are the Gree Gree and the Inferno Dogs? Denise and Feemy exchanged glances. Sounders? Denise asked. Zoe explained. They are a cult of morphlings led by Juice Juice, and the Wayne sisters are going to have to get in line behind me. I am going to kill him and eat his heart. Bud stood up. Wait, hold on. That was all my news. Okay, Chazzy and Prue, remind me never, ever to get in your crosshairs. So that's your trick? You talk things to death. And then they kick the corpse a few times just to make sure, Mouse grumbled. It's unbearable. Chazzy got spicy. And yet here we are, Melissa Craigor, at your table with your prime about to rule the motherfucking world. So be nice. I will if you will, Mouse shot back. Can I have a floor? Bud asked. Why? Prue asked. You're human. Shit, you should be doing the dishes. Bud blinked. I will. I don't care. You never did them back at the coffee clutch. Tessa grinned at the lawyer in training evilly. Stephen took charge. One person at a time. Bud, sit down. Hopefully Chazzy and Prue got a little of their excitability out of their system. They'll let you talk now. Stephen, baby, I still have a lot of excitability left in me, Chazzy said. All this planning has me a little hot under the collar. Later, he promised. Bud sat and went back to his phone. Okay, yeah, thanks. The Gree Gree are a coven of magicians, and yes, they report to Louis Lelou, who is not friendly to our cause. And the Inferno Dogs are ugly Ellis's warlings. He has a bunch of them. And word has it they are powerful and highly trained. Remember Leung Pope, who had all those troops? Well, there are twice as many Inferno Dogs, and they are twice as likely to be royal pains in our collective ass. An invasion force, Stephen murmured. Arya nodded. Yes, without a doubt. The last of the American Dragon Lords are on the move. I've heard news that Ugly Ellis and Louis have joined forces with Alonzo Max Sterling and Victor Nutgrass. Yeah, that's what we think as well, which only makes sense. However, we don't have Morty Flint after us, and Chosen Ben Tozier is dying to set up a meeting, Bud said. That was one of my agenda items. Chazzy and Prue covered most of the others. And yes, their back and forth was amazing. I think I might need a cold shower. Denise patted his shoulder. No, no, you don't. You have us, remember? Feemy tried to hide her excited smile. Stephen had hoped the other American primes would want to sue for peace, but that didn't seem like it was in the cards. He could summon Javier Jones, Abner Saavedra, and Imogene Summers, as well as their new ally, Eve Downfire, and they could protect his eastern border. And if Chosen Ben did want to join him, he could throw in some troops as well. But if he committed his forces to the east, that would open his flank up to Panga Komong, a mysterious dragon lord who secretly controlled every island primacy south of Taiwan. Before his death, Leong Pope had been frightened of that dragon lord sweeping in and taking the PNW. Now that the Infinity Ranch was compromised, the assassins would come. Bruno Illich was dead, but there were other underworld dragons who made their living by murder. The Shadow Archer was one. Stephen knew he was on every hit list imaginable. They had to leave. No, they had to disappear. An idea struck him. He chuckled a bit. We have to destroy the Infinity Ranch ourselves, and then we play dead for as long as possible. I don't want to get sidetracked by trying to gather more money, acquire more wives, or build more Ares. That was the game at the beginning, but now we have more important concerns. The Holy Grail holds the secret to our future. It's about time we get on with the quest. Tessa paled a bit and dropped her head. I'm not sure I want to. Chazzy and Prue didn't pay attention to her. Prue had latched on to Stephen's idea. No, wait. Tell us more about your plan. What do you mean we destroy the Infinity Ranch ourselves? When Tessa lifted her head, she was smiling again. Good. Chapter 7 Stephen and his escort were packed for the road trip. Kind of. 
The Wayne twins had insisted on packing almost every article of clothing they owned, and they filled their vehicle with enough guns, ammo, and pyrotechnics to invade Canada. In the end, they'd done the dishes with Stephen, and it had been fun listening to them plot while they worked. They were going to take all their big trucks, the Escalade named Jeeves, the Suburban named Poupon, and their Ford Bronco II from the 1980s, the Orange Crush. Uchiko had already taken off on her motorcycle to fly down I-80 going east. Stephen and his escort would follow her, but first, he and Tessa had some wicked magic to cast. They stood in front of the Infinity Ranch's tower. Both were full of magic as the sun inched lower to the horizon. The plan was to leave right away. Bud touched his Bluetooth collar and ended a call. Okay, I talked with Wyoming's governor. He'll handle the paperwork. For us humans, it'll be a gas leak and a brush fire. The fire department won't come out, but there will be a news story. He has it all worked out. For the Dragon Souls, Stephen Dracaris will be deceased. As executor of the will, I'll start the process of dividing up your lands. That is going to be a shitstorm, without a doubt, but it will look good to outsiders. I would suggest an umbrella, a tarp, and knee-high, shit-proof waders. Tessa wore jeans, big motorcycle boots, and a green Mexican serape that covered her Within Temptations Black Symphony t-shirt. The serape protected her from the chill spring wind, and it looked cool. One more thing, Bud added. The governor reminded me of something. There's a Washington, D.C. guy that wants a meeting with you, Robert Staines. I told him now is not a good time. Your death will freak him out, but oh well. Chazzy was dragging two more suitcases to the Escalade. She stopped to guffaw. Bob Staines, ha, huh, that guy. Carlo Bart Baxter had us talk to him. Nice enough human, I guess, if you like liars, sleazeballs, and secret agents. Yeah, that guy. Prue got a bored expression on her face. Shit, Staines. We can put him on the back burner and then turn the stove off. Stephen took a minute to ponder how the human government might see him. He was definitely a threat to national security, yet dragons worried him more than the U.S. military. Prue looked at their already packed SUV. Nope, Chaz, not gonna fit. You'll have to get it down to one suitcase. Chazzy was not happy. Do you have what you need to work from the Infinity Ranch? Stephen asked Bud. Bud held up his phone. It's all here, Tessa cut in. No, his real work is going to be in the bedroom. This is going to be hard on Denise and Femi. Hard on them? No, they'll need a hard on in them. Mouse stood next to her, naked, with the slayer blade in her fist. Aria, just as nude, stood next to her. Tessa laughed. Funny. But seriously, Bud, this spell is going to tie directly into their animus. She cast a glance at Denise and Femi, who stood above them in their true forms. Denise had white scales outlined in gold, while Femi was dark purple. So dark, in the setting sun, she looked black. Both radiated heat. Denise's dragon scent was honeysuckle, while Femi emanated a muskier scent with light lavender overtones. We understand. Denise said, and we're looking forward to helping. We kind of felt that we were just taking up space. Uh, can you handle pain? Tessa asked. In her hand were two nondescript Ikea lamps, their cords dangling. Feeney's laughter rolled out of her giant body. We are dragon souls. We were born into constant battle and certain pain. Stephen hoped she wasn't just being poetic. Okay, Tessa, you handle the Encanto. I'll do the Animus Chain. The rest of you, get ready to light the place up. Mouse shifted into a slender, amber-scaled dragon. I will take care of the fire if it gets out of control. Aria grew into a cinnamon-scented crimson beast. She lifted her wings and blew fire out of her nostrils. We are ready. Light it up, Stephen ordered. Aria took to the air and circled the ranch. She unleashed flames down onto the sage and grasses around the buildings, careful not to scorch the actual wood. She didn't use shadow flame, just the normal inferno exhalant. The fire swept across the landscape, sending smoke skyward. Bud stepped back. Holy shit, I can't believe I'm seeing this. Stephen closed his eyes and found the swirling cores of Denise and Femi. They spun in perfect orbs, and he was surprised at how much animus they had. 
Bud had done a great job keeping them powered up. Good thing he was young. Time to get my Loki on, Tessa said with an excited giggle. She set one of the Ikea lamps on the concrete walkway that led up to the house. One illusion coming up. Encanto. The lamp glowed with a blinding pink light. She altered the main building first. The wood blackened, the windows cracked, and the tower tumbled down. Or at least, that was what it seemed. Stephen chose Denise to power that first illusion. He eased his mind into her animus and siphoned it off into the lamp. The woman let out a hiss of pain. Arya swooshed overhead and unloaded a geyser of flame right onto the new frame of Wayne Manor. The two-by-fours blackened and burned. That was real destruction there. Damn it, Chazzy called out. Don't worry, sis, Prue soothed. We'll get our house after we find this grail thing. Denise shifted human and fell against Femi. The pale blonde woman's face twisted in pain. Mouse took off and followed Arya, using arctic wind to chill the flames so the entire plane didn't catch fire. Ready for round two? Stephen asked Tessa. His heart was pounding and he was breathing hard. He'd used half of his animus already. Tessa nodded, sending sweat leaking down the side of her face. Born ready, big man. Let's do it again, and this time with feeling. She set the second lamp onto the ground. Stephen reached in to Femi and found her animus. Encanto, Tessa shouted. The second lamp shined brightly. This time, she directed her magic to the outdoor living room and the widow houses. Again, the buildings fell in on top of one another, hissing and spitting, roof tiles and siding sliding down into fire, or what appeared to be fire. Defensio, the barista floated up in the air on a pink-tinged force field. Above him, she would take care of Sabina's and Liam's bungalows to the north. When Stephen tied Femi's animus to the second spell, she too turned human, fell to her hands and knees, and let out a cry of agony. Stephen felt bad, but they couldn't stop. Arya and Mouse landed to survey the illusion. The entire Infinity Ranch was in ruins, as if some great demon had chewed on every stone and then licked every structure with a destructive flame. Tessa floated down. Her shield spell winked off. She grinned. Not bad? She sobered and went to Femi and helped the naked woman stand. Are you okay? Femi nodded. Yes, it was a lot at first, but I can manage it. Already she was looking better, as was Denise. Bud walked up to the smoking front door. The air around it shimmered, and they heard the front door open and close. He came back out and stuck his head outside of the illusion. His face floated eerily. Inside, it's totally normal. This is amazing. Tessa put a hand on Stephen's shoulder. It would be easier on us if we could enchantrix, and I don't think we'd need the lamps. We're not there yet, but soon enough we'll be making badass Americos chambers ourselves. Stephen smiled wearily. Hey, I thought you were going to go with red for your magic. Why keep the pink? She shrugged. My dude, we've had so much going on and I've been so full of fuck me angst that I wanted some normal for a minute. And if I can't have rainbow colors, then I'll stick with pink. Bud walked out to hold Denise and Femi. I'll send out the news. There was a terrible fight here. No survivors. Enjoy the afterlife. How does it feel to be dead? Stephen asked Tessa. As long as you love me, Stephen, alive or dead, I'll always feel just fine. Her smile faltered. She'd tried to make a joke, but underneath it was the terrible truth. Their lives, once again, were in danger. Her cell phone chirped in her pocket. Tessa answered it, turned, and walked a few steps away. When she turned back, there were tears on her face. We need to go to Denver. My brother, Jared. We just need to go. Tessa drove down I-25. Stephen rode shotgun and Aria and Mouse were in the back of the orange crush. The old girl had seen a lot of mileage and had a lot of scars. The Wayne twins, ever the posh pains in the butt, insisted on the Escalade, and with all their baggage and gear, they only barely fit. That left Zoe and Sabina in the Poupon, a rusted suburban they'd bought cheap in Montana during the Rahab drama. It had been so sweet. 
Zoe had kissed Stephen long and hard and said, I can drive Sabina. See? I can be brave and alone. Besides, Sabina and I haven't spent a lot of time together. Mouse had hugged the bear girl and whispered encouraging words to her. The petite blonde could be a prickly bitch, without a doubt, but when it came to Zoe, she was all softness and warmth. Tessa loved both of them so much. It was good they were splitting up. Multiple targets heading in random directions would throw any enemy dragons off their scent. They all planned to meet up in Ogallala late that night, at the Marriott Fairfield Inn and Suites there. Tessa had to smile at the memories of the Traveler's Roost, the crappy motel that she, Stephen, and Arya had crashed at during the Rehagen Mulk drama. It had been a dive, and yet that was where Tessa had skipped over impetum spells and learned Encanto magic. They'd also had some hot sex. Nasty things in a nasty place. Uchiko would join them on her motorcycle. Arya had warned against simply flying down to Denver as dragons. There were ways to track a flying dragon soul. In simple human cars, they could blend into the traffic, and again, secrecy was key. On the way down, Stephen was about to make a call with his cell when Arya stopped him. They didn't know if their phones had been hacked or not. Instead, he'd contacted Javier Jones, Abner Saavedra, and Imogene Summers using his new telepathic ability. Those poor dragons were about to get a mindful of Stephen. Tessa didn't envy anyone on the other side of Stephen's telepathy. He was either too loud or too soft, and nothing in between. However, Stephen's allies needed to know Stephen was alive, his escort was safe, and they had a war to fight. It was time to gather their people and head east. Javier Jones had won over some Mexican and Central American primes, and they were gathering their forces. The new dragon lords and their vassals would shore up the western territories in case Panga Comong attacked. As for Saavedra, he'd recruited three more men into his willbreakers, and all seven were on their way along with Imogene Summers, some of her sister wives, and their powerful warlings. Meanwhile, Sabina was contacting Skylar Black and Liam Strider to let them in on the plan and tell them not to believe any rumors they heard of Stephen Dracaris's unfortunate demise. Officially, Stephen's will gave the vast Dracaris primacy over to Liam. Good thing they could trust him. A normal dragon soul might leap on the opportunity. Not Liam. He'd left behind the life of politics, battle, and sex when his escort had been murdered fifty years ago. Ironic. He'd wanted to be a ronin, and now he was the most powerful dragon lord on the planet. At least on paper. Tessa was glad her friends had work to do. She wasn't in the mood to chat. Jared had taken a turn for the worse, but he was out of the hospital and back home in the Cherry Creek compound, where he and the rest of Tessa's family, along with Stephen's mother, lived. It was protected by the Onari Guard, and soon it would have similar magic to the illusion spell they'd cast on the Infinity Ranch. However, Tessa didn't want to think about anyone having sex in the compound to keep their animus levels up. They needed a battery of some kind to run it. Another option was to move Bud and his babes into one of the houses, to keep it powered up. Bud's babes, that was how they referred to Denise and Femi, though it wasn't quite fair to the women. They were so much more than that. A battery running Animus was powerful mojo, beyond what an Encanto spell could do. For that kind of sorcery, they needed Enchantrix. But first, Fleshforge was on their list. Mouse had gotten chatty, taking Tessa's place, since she was so worried about her brother. Mouse wore a cute little green paisley skirt with a black sweater and black leggings. So, guys, this is just like old times. Remember the four of us, no twins, with Liam Strider living the easy life, driving around in the Orange Crush, kicking ass? This is so awesome. That made Tessa smile, finally. The twins aren't so bad. They did do the dishes, Stephen pointed out. And our life was never easy. Rehagen Mulk would have killed us if Mathal hadn't been there. Hey, Mouse said sharply. I'm happy, and I'm not drunk. You remember it how you want to, and I'll remember it how I want to. Arya patted her arm. Didn't you fight Stephen because you didn't believe in him? Mouse colored. Maybe. It was a test. He passed. And I rode him like he was Disneyland. It was so awesome. He's so awesome. I'm just so happy. She sighed. 
Corn nuts tonight? Donuts in the morning? Even the thought of their normal junk food couldn't touch Tessa's worry, and she kept the radio off. All she wanted was to get to Cherry Creek and hold her brother. When traffic got snarled near between the Village Inn at I-25 and 120th and the Village Inn at 84th, Tessa's face hurt from clenching her jaws. Crawling through North Glen nearly killed her. Luckily, it was after rush hour, and so they breezed down I-25 and took the Spear exit. They parked at a 7-Eleven. The night was clear, but the wind was cold. Tessa put on her flight gear, a heavy parka with an even heavier helmet that had goggles and a face mask. She needed to figure out how to magic herself dark armor against the cold, and she needed to learn a type of serpent grace. Both were prerequisites for stellar flight. There was no way she was going to stay on Earth once Stephen could fly into space. She wanted to race him to the moon. She was Merlin's daughter, damn it. And the Dragon Slayers. She couldn't think about that too much. Behind the convenience store, Arya and Mouse stripped, put their clothes in bags, and took to the air. Stephen went last. Tessa felt warmer and safer once she climbed on top of him. The familiar smell of his smoky orange blossom scent felt like coming home, and she pressed her face against his scales. He took a running leap and flew off into the night. He cast the Defensio spell to keep them hidden from humans. With her left hand, Tessa clung to one of his spines, and she gripped his wing with her right. It wasn't really necessary, though. He'd gotten good at flying with her on his back, and she could have let go and enjoyed the ride. All the dragons practiced carrying around the human. Now that Sabina was a dragon skin, Tessa was the last one. It was easier for Stephen to carry her, since he was the biggest, thirty feet long, with huge wings that scooped up the wind and kept them aloft. Flying never got old. Denver sparkled under them, around them, into the distance. Landing on the center circle of the compound, Tessa surveyed the three houses. Lights shined in the windows, and things seemed normal enough. Tessa was thankful for that, but she was still on edge. Stephen, Aria, and Mouse shifted and put their clothes back on. Haru fell out of the door and waddled up to them. He could pass for human since his face and hands were normal. Underneath his clothes he had wings, a tail, and clawed feet, and a huge belly. His expressive brown eyes were filled with worry. Konnichiwa, Stephen Dono. I am so glad you are here. The boy, he is not well. The door to Jared's house opened. Jared himself rolled out of his house in his wheelchair. Lay off it, Haru, I'm fine. Tessa ran to her brother. She threw off her gloves, flung off her heavy parka, and then held her brother. For the first time in two hours, she could breathe. Her brother was alive. Chapter 8 Inside the big house, Jared sat in his wheelchair, a little pale but clearly happy. Wow, I should go to the hospital more often. I get to see you, Stephen, Aria, and even Mouse. His smile made him seem bigger than his withered body trapped in the massive wheelchair. Not funny, kiddo. Tessa knelt by his chair, holding his hand. Tessa and her friends were in the living room, along with Tessa's mother and sister. Abigail was two years older than Tessa, traditionally pretty with long brown hair, bangs, and clothes from Kohl's, beige slacks, a green top, and cute matching shoes. Her mom had a chubby round face, and yes, she was thick around the middle, but her smiling patience and eagerness to help made her sparkly and beautiful. She'd cut her hair short and was letting it go gray. Can I get you something to drink? Mom asked. You better say yes, Jared said, or you'll get in trouble. That's why I went to the hospital. My eyes kind of went funny and they think it was dehydration. After an IV of fancy salt water and various spices, I could see again. So drink up, everybody. Mouse grinned. Well, now we better do what the man says. I don't want my eyes to go funny. Sit, 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 Mrs. Ross demanded in a light tone. I'll call Florence. She'd never forgive me if her son visited and she didn't get to see him. Stephen nodded, but his face was serious, so full of worry. For Jared, over their current circumstances, everything. Tessa wanted to kiss a smile onto his face. Things were going to be okay. Jared was going to be okay. 
That was the important thing. Stephen, Aurea, and Mouse sat on the sofa, but Tessa didn't want to leave her brother. Abigail rubbed her back and left to help their mother get drinks for everyone. What do you mean your eyes went funny? Tessa asked. Jared shrugged as if there had never been an issue at all. Basically, I couldn't see, I guess, which made playing Fortnite really hard. Can't hardly frag ass if you can't see. Language, Tessa feigned shock. Aria furrowed her brow. This isn't English. A fortnight is two weeks, and frag isn't a word. Is he referencing the games of video? Jared laughed. I am totally stealing that. I play the games of video and violence. Yes. Mouse made a big play of rolling her eyes at him. Whatever, kid. We were so worried, Jared, and your sister totally almost lost it. She was no fun. I couldn't even improve her mood with corn nuts. It was Jared's turn to feign shock. He put his hand to his cheek. No, corn nuts didn't help? The shame. He relaxed. You guys, I'm fine. This was not a big deal. Tessa stood. You are an unreliable narrator. I'm going to check the brain trust in the house. You're the brawn, obviously. She left them and walked into the kitchen. Abigail hugged her and then Mom did. Tessa held them close. Oh, you guys, that was so scary. So was he really dehydrated? Was that why he lost his vision? Abigail pulled back. She couldn't talk. Tears shined in her eyes. Mom steeled herself. The IV helped, but his condition is getting worse. He gets weak sometimes and so tired. Just the other day, he didn't want his friends to come over. He just didn't have the energy. His vision might be going. We don't know yet. Tessa didn't know what to say, but she knew what to do. She was going to figure out how to cure her brother with magic. The doorbell rang, and a second later the door slammed. Florence Whip let out an excited squeal. Stephen, it's so good to see you, and Aria, and, 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 I'm sorry, dear, I can't remember your name. It's not Moose, is it? Tessa snorted. She'd have to tease Mouse about that later. Florence gasped. Stephen has so many friends, I can't keep up. Abigail blinked away her tears and chuckled. Friends, does she have any idea of your arrangement? She does, Tessa affirmed. She's just trying to be tactful. She glanced at her own mother, uncertain for a second. At her heart, Mom was fairly conservative, but raising Tessa, she'd had to become more flexible or lose her daughter. Flo and I have talked ad nauseum about the arrangement, Mom said. You all seem happy, and what more could we want? I'm not sure how marriage is going to work, but I would imagine we'll get grandchildren at some point. A lot of grandchildren. That will be fun. And a lot of work. Are you and Phil planning a big family? Tessa asked her sister. Abigail looked about as surprised as Tessa felt. Uh, first things first. We're still looking at a date for the big marriage thing. We missed the ball on June, but we're thinking end of August, maybe? Or September? Tessa let out a breath. Yeah, let's have Abigail do the M word in babies. I'm still, uh, kind of, well, she had to stop talking. Marriage, babies, family. She was on a quest for the Holy Grail, and that was enough for her. Also, something inside of her was changing, and she wasn't sure if it was for the better or for the worse. Her powers were increasing. She had started smelling like cherries, which was oddly disconcerting, though it meant less cash on perfume, and there was something else. She'd started to miss the fighting. It had been six weeks, and she was jonesing for the adrenaline and the animus hit when she took a life. That was rather unsettling. Mom saved the day. Tessa, sweetie, we love you. We respect your life decisions. We had to, Abigail said with a little laughter. Or you'd have lived in your car forever. You're not wrong, Tessa replied, glad to have an escape route out of the conversation. Marriage, babies, whatever. Mom finished off the drinks, adding sparkling water to their freshly squeezed lemonade. They took the drinks out to the rest of the house. Haru had come in, and he'd brought pizza rolls. He was like the best, most fun-loving uncle of all time. He was caring, protective, funny, everything. Tessa felt so much better with him around. While they all chatted, she closed her eyes and used Animus Chain to feel magical cores around her. Stephen's black sphere, 
Arya's red sizzle, and Mouse's amber swirl all spun correctly. Haru, though, had a light blue core, and it was off kilter, sputtering. The food, though, added to his mystical energy, and she watched it increase as he ate pizza roll after pizza roll. He loved to eat, that was clear. Stephen had talked to her about adjusting the energy of Uchiko and the rest of the Onari guard. She could see how that might be possible, then if they could link the change to the bodies of the failed dragon skins, they might be able to make the change permanent. Mom's animus was dim, a tiny little light purple spark, but that meant she did have some Alfarian blood in her. Abigail's core was a bit brighter, and it was a rosy pink color, deep and pretty. Lastly, she saw into the heart of her brother. Jared's animus burned the brightest, a dark, dark red. That didn't surprise her a bit. Of course, he would have such a strong core. He was so brave, so full of good-natured cheer, powerful in his own way. If only his body hadn't betrayed him. Tessa let out a breath and let her mind go further. The energy mixed with the cells of his body, and it was a dance of energy and matter, animus and flesh, and that was the secret of Flesh Forge. She could see the connection. She also saw how, with some practice, Jared could improve the spin of his animus, collected from the love of his family, the food he ate, the air, the grass, the sphere of life the earth provided. Liam Strider said that animus filled the entire world. Every blade of grass, every creature, worm, dog, and cat, exuded the mystical energy. And in the emptiness of space and the unlikelihood of life, planets like Earth were rare, wonderful, and full of power. Her concentration was broken when Stephen's mom asked him why he was so confident. Tessa switched her attention to Florence. Her body was filled with energy, but where her animus core should have been was just a little bump. She was fully alive and vibrant, but in the end, she was the most human person in the room. Mouse jostled Stephen, spilling his drink a little. Stephen is full of confidence, we're all running around with self-doubt, and he's Mr. Hold My Beer Cool. Stephen wrinkled his nose and shook his head. I'm not that confident. Remember, I couldn't... That was a sentence he'd better not finish. At this stage, their families didn't know about the secret society of dragon souls around them. For Florence and the Rosses, Stephen was a self-made billionaire who was in a polyamorous relationship with a bunch of women. That was it. Haru and his brothers and sisters were simply gardeners, housekeepers, and security. Stephen had hired them with his money, money which he got from the stock market and risky cryptocurrency bets that paid off. Then he'd use the money to buy property that more than financed their lifestyle. That was the story, at least. For now. Stephen cleared his throat. There were some things I had trouble with. You guys have seen me struggle— Mom, you know, you saw me at my middle school geekiest. Florence's hair was white and wild, frizzed out and crazy. Her eyes were blue and full of love. But Stephen, you were always so serious and so focused, even when you were a geek. Do you know what I remember? Stephen squinted against the coming embarrassment. Yeah, your mom could tell any number of really cringy stories about you. We were going to be late on our mortgage, Florence said. It was Joe's debts. They finally caught up with us, and we couldn't get out from under them. But you saved us. Stephen's eyes dropped as the memory came to him. I was in the eighth grade, and it wasn't just a single payment. It was our last chance to save the house. Dad, uh, Joe Whip, was gone. It was just you and me. Florence smiled warmly at her son. You went around to every neighbor we had, asking what you could do for them. You worked day and night. You'd get up early and come home late, and when our neighbors ran out of stuff for you to do, you posted the work-wanted signs, you walked miles, and knocked on door after door. Where did you get the confidence for that? They all waited for Stephen to respond. He kept opening his mouth and closing it. Finally, he said, Look, it wasn't confidence. We had to get money, and I could work, so I did. He laughed. I'm really good at lowering my head and doing what needs to be done. If I do everything I can to get the job done, then it's not a matter of confidence. It's a matter of pig-headedness. I'm not confident. I'm just stupid with stubbornness. Back then, either I'd get the money or I wouldn't, but sitting around with self-doubt wasn't an option. Mom, you taught me how to work. 
Thank you for that. Florence shook her head. Yes, we are workers, but the things you had to do were... It was kind of horrid. Like what? Tessa asked, curious. Stephen paused for a minute. Normal stuff like mowing lawns, raking leaves, but I did have to go through a box of old, good housekeeping magazines to find brownie recipes, thirty years worth. Then there was the guy's toilet. He hadn't cleaned it since his wife died. Pretty gross. The same guy had me empty rat traps he'd set in 2010. That was fun. Nothing like rotting rats. He was a total hoarder. He didn't want to throw away a big sofa bed, so he had me use a hacksaw to cut it apart. That's how I spent the night, chopping up a sleeper couch for twenty dollars. I wasn't too smart, but it was money, and he had a world of stuff for me to do. Another woman had me clip her toenails. She, uh, couldn't reach them. That took five minutes, and it was another twenty. Mouse started laughing and couldn't stop, and the more she tried to control the giggles, the more they came. She laughed so much, everyone started laughing along with her, especially Haru, who was always looking for an excuse to chuckle. What? What is it? Stephen asked. Mouse was nearly on the floor. She wiped away her tears and tried to explain herself. Here you are, this amazing guy, one of the richest men in America, and you're clipping some fat old lady's toenails, stupid with stubbornness. Yeah, that's you. You see a brick wall and you won't necessarily see the best way around it, but you'll get through it by will alone. It never occurs to you to stop. That's so you, Stephen. He got serious. And it's Jared. He's as tough as me, if not tougher. And it's Tessa, and it's you, Mouse. We know what you'll do to win. And it's Aria. Once she starts something, she won't stop. She took such a chance on me. And Mom, it's you as well. We're all stubborn. Not sure that's confidence. I have you all beat, Tessa's mom said. I had to raise Tessa Ann Ross, and let me tell you, that was never, ever easy. Abigail beamed. I was the easy one. Tessa gave her sister a smile. No, I was the easy one. All the boys said so. You were the good one. There's a difference. And then the doubts came. Was Tessa bad? No. Eve Downfire had said Tessa could decide who she wanted to be. She scanned the faces of the people in the room. With friends and family like the ones she had, she could be anything and do anything. Stephen had proved that. She let out a sigh. If they were going to find the Holy Grail, they had to be better and stronger than ever before. Chapter 9 Stephen drove them away from the 7-Eleven and back onto I-25. They grabbed I-76 going north. It was a little after ten o'clock when they left the lights on the last fringes of Denver. The fields around them were dark, but their headlights flashed on the dry grasses and cottonwoods, still skeletal from winter. Barbed wire fences marked farmlands. Lights twinkled in little houses in the distance. Stephen loved being back on the highway. Road trips were kind of their thing. Mouse rode shotgun with Tessa and Aria in the back along with their stuff. The barista had her phone out for light, reading the legends of the Dragon Knights she'd gotten from Eve and Agatha of the former Deseret Primacy. So far she'd remained quiet, as the thick book had gotten her attention. They would reach Ogallala around 1 a.m. Of course Zoe would be awake, waiting for them. They had kept their cell phones quiet, but Sabina reached out with her mind to get an update. The twins, Sabina and Zoe, had reached Nebraska and were in their rooms. No issues. They checked in separately to keep a low profile. However, every man on staff was abuzz with how gorgeous the four women were. Keeping the Wayne twins hidden wasn't going to last long. Maybe they could engineer an illusion to cover the sisters until after they found the Holy Grail. No sign of Uchiko, but Stephen knew she was somewhere near the hotel, watching over them all. Before they left the Cherry Creek compound, Tessa had grabbed some old silver dollars she had. She'd enchanted one and given it to Haru to hold on to. She'd hooked his animus into the coin and then set up a signaling system. If any magical creature, dragon soul, magician, warling, or morphling, managed to get past the walls and the security, Tessa would know. And then she planned on casting Portal to get there and put a hurt on anything or anyone that threatened their family. 
Stephen liked that a lot, but the spell put a strain on Tessa since her animus was low and they had to fix that, and soon. He saw a familiar dirt road coming up and knew the perfect place. He turned off the highway and drove out into the empty fields to a place where they'd been before. He recognized the black ring of scorched rocks. Split pine logs lay next to the fire pit along with two full pallets. Teenagers came here to party and make out. Farms were nearby, but they seemed abandoned. What is the meaning of this? Arya asked in a stern voice. We need to get to our people in Nebraska, and I long to stay in the Traveler's Roost again. Tessa laughed. I don't believe that for a minute. Arya, don't you remember this place? You should. When we slept here before, you were awake the entire night. I slept like a baby in the back with you and Stephen, all tight and cozy. Mouse turned to Stephen. I think I know why you're stopping. Her voice came out thick and husky. It is good, Arya said. Tessa and Stephen have been casting very powerful magic. If we are attacked and you both don't have animus, we might not survive. We should have sex. For safety reasons, she added with a small smirk on her face. They all got out. The stars were bright in the sky, but it was chill. Arya fixed that. She took off her red dress and let it fall to the ground. After shifting into her homo draconis form, she took the pallets and pulled them apart easily with her claws. She shredded the wood and tossed it into the fire pit. A bit of inferno exhalant soon gave them a good warm fire to fight away the cold. Meanwhile, Tessa got blankets out of the back of the car and laid them down on the ground. She cast aside her serape, so she only wore her t-shirt, jeans, and boots. Stephen felt the buzz of his libido, watching Tessa work. It got even more intense when Arya shifted human. She stood next to the fire, her perfect breasts rising from her muscled stomach while her hips flared out around the triangle of hair between her legs. She raised her hands to cup her breasts and then slid those hands down her stomach until her right hand touched her sex. Her eyes were bright. I like you watching me, Stephen. Mouse stood awkwardly to the side. Uh, yeah, I'll go for a walk or something. Or wait in the car. You don't have to, Arya said. You are invited to stay with us. I'm sure in your history with Primes, you aren't a stranger to a situation like this. The petite blonde frowned. No, not a stranger, but I'm not gay. And I don't know, I don't want to be pressured. I was pressured before. Her brow furrowed as she twisted her hands together. Tessa went to her but didn't touch her. Look, Mouse, we respect what you want. I feel bad, though. Most of the time when we have sex with Stephen, you have to wait. How about you go first? Arya and I can take the walk. Stephen knew enough not to say a word. Tessa was brilliant when it came to making people comfortable with their sexuality. Mouse thought for a long moment. No, you don't have to go. I love you guys, and you're right. This won't be new. And for the love of biscuits, I listen to you fuck all the time. There are times I want to join you, but I'm never sure of myself. I trust you, Inaria. Hell, I trust you more than I have anyone in my entire life. She smiled. And to be honest, I'm feeling a little kinky tonight. Maybe watch me with Stephen? Just watch? We can do that. Aria slid up behind Tessa and reached up to cup her big breasts underneath her Black Symphony t-shirt. They were about five feet from Stephen and Mouse, on the same side of the fire, standing at the edge of a blanket. Can we play while we watch? Aria asked. Yes, Mouse said breathlessly. Stephen took her hand. Are you sure about this? No pressure. Instead of answering, she kissed him, hard, wet, with lots of tongue. She sucked on his lower lip before breaking the kiss. I didn't come here to fuck a snake. I came here to fuck you. I know what I'm doing. I love them and I love you. So let's give these horny bitches a show. Let's make them drip. Her words made his jeans tighten uncomfortably. Mouse lost her top and cast aside her bra. Her nipples stood out proudly in the cold. She still had her skirt and tights on, but her shoes were gone. She got on her knees in front of him and unzipped his pants. She pulled them down to his knees, fully exposing him. The air warmed by the fire felt good on his exposed skin. Aria had pulled Tessa's shirt above the barista's bare breasts. 
The Indian woman cupped a breast with one hand while her other hand was down Tessa's pants. Tessa worked her hips. The fire made Arya's skin seem darker while it glowed off Tessa's pale flesh. Mouse bent and inhaled. I love the way he smells. Don't you, Tessa? Yes, the barista said sharply. Are you going to suck on him? I am, the petite blonde purred. He's ready, but I don't care. I like the way he tastes too much not to give him a little lick. She licked the sensitive head of his shaft. Then she engulfed him in her mouth. He had to close his eyes for a second. The feelings were so intense. When he opened them, Tessa had her jeans and panties pushed down to the boot on her left foot. Her right boot was off. Her toenails were painted black. Strange thing to notice at that moment, but Stephen wasn't thinking too clearly. He stripped off his shirt and then locked eyes with Tessa, who was writhing under Arya's sure hands. He nearly lost it when Mouse gripped him hard and sucked him harder. Not yet, boy, Mouse admonished. We have to show them the main event. You know what I like to do? He did. He got down on his back, not bothering to mess with his pants. No time. Their need was too great. Mouse stripped off her tights and skirt to stand naked on the blanket. The fire cast shadows across her small, muscled body. Aria and Tessa got a little closer, only a couple of feet away from Stephen's head. Tessa was on her hands and knees, her breasts dangling. She still had her shirt on, bunched around her neck, with her pants snagged around her remaining boot. Aria smiled at Stephen below and Mouse above. The petite blonde went and straddled him. Her eyes were on Tessa, who had her ass in the air, with Aria behind her, doing wonderful things to the barista with her fingers. Watching the two women, Mouse slowly slid herself down on top of him. He was completely inside her, and Mouse was giving them a show. She pulled on one of her nipples. I like it on top. That's how I like it. I like to pound myself on him until I come. That was what she did, working herself up and down on Stephen's shaft until she cried out, Kiss him, Tessa. Kiss him while Aria licks you. Tessa shuffled over. Her lips found his. Stephen reached to feel one of her big tits in his hand. Mouse was going at it, rising and falling, rising and falling, and still she didn't forget her performance. I like this. I like you both getting turned on by us. Let's get him there, Tessa. Let's make him feel good. Tessa moved forward until Stephen could suck on her nipple while she sucked on his. One stroke, two strokes, three strokes, and Mouse grunted. Yes, yes, he likes that. I can feel it. It's working. Oh, it's working. For him and for me. The animus around them was so powerful, Stephen could hardly believe it. It was Tessa. She'd become a dynamo of mystical energy, giving, receiving, spreading it through them all. Mouse sank herself down completely and gave herself over to her orgasm. Stephen couldn't hold back. Her energy poured into him as he poured himself into her, and yes, he was stronger, refreshed, refueled. Mouse eased off him, and Tessa's mouth curved into a smirk. She kept her eyes on Mouse, crawling forward and dipping her head, sucking on him while he sucked on her. Aria helped with her fingers, easing them in and out of Tessa's sex. It was the barista's turn next. Her skin glowed from her orgasm as the animus filled her. It was so hot, he never got soft. So he was ready when Aria spun, chest on the blanket, her shapely ass in the air. They were all sweating now, from the roaring fire, from the sex, from the life in and around them. When they did feel the cold air, it felt like a blessing. Stephen took Aria from behind. Tessa came around and offered herself to Aria, who was more than willing to share more pleasure with the barista. Mouse came up to him to kiss his neck, whisper into his ear, and touch his chest. Before long, both he and Aria were given more animus. The fire crackled and popped sparks up into the sky. He didn't much smell the smoke, but he smelled his three wives, their perfumes, their skin, their musk. It was beyond delicious and put another fire in him. Tessa was the last to feel his thrusts, and he kissed her mouth while Aria kissed her, and Mouse rubbed his back and goaded him on. 
He didn't need much encouragement. He never did get his pants off. Pulling them up, he noticed a Coca-Cola lying half buried in the dirt around them. The familiar red and white pattern triggered the ghost of a memory, but the full recollection didn't come to him right away. What was it? Why did that can mean anything? It was just litter. Aria threw more wood on the fire and stretched. Yes, that is what we all needed. And thank you, Mouse. Maybe we can do this again sometime. The petite blonde laughed. Maybe. Not sure my heart can take it. I haven't done the group thing in a long time, and as you know, I swore I'd never do it again. But this felt different with you, with Stephen, and of course, Tessa, who could make friends with the devil himself. Only if he was nice, the barista said with a laugh. I don't do mean people. Then, ever the sensitive one, she noticed Stephen's preoccupation with the can. Stephen, are you okay? Her voice seemed to come from far away. Yeah, maybe. I need to cast a divination spell. Give me a minute. Mouse collected her tights and skirt, but she wasn't putting them on. Go ahead, my prime. You have plenty of animus, mister three times in a row. Magica divinatio, Stephen called out into the night. Black mist poured out of his eyes for a minute. The harsh daylight pained his eyes. It took a second for them to adjust. The sun burned his skin. He stood on cracked asphalt. It might have started out as a six-lane highway, but it had been eaten away down to four. The rest of it was thick yellow weeds. He was on the alternate earth, Gaia Beta, and yes, there had been a soda can, but it was for something called Noza Cola, three Zs. He was in the vision he'd had during the Carlo Bart Baxter fight. His father stood there in the black suit, the hot wind blowing the salt and pepper hair from his face. His beard split into a smile. Almost time. It's the wolf door. But once you commit, you can't go back. The door must stay shut, lest the demons find our reality. Stephen should have had a world of questions, but he couldn't think of a single one. Can you feel it, son? Stefan Dracaris asked. Do you know what's missing? Stephen closed his eyes and reached out with his mind. The yellow weeds around him were devoid of animus. They were as dead as Denver in the distance. The Rocky Mountains were equally destroyed, the evergreens mere bones, having lost all their copper-colored needles. Everything had been destroyed at its most basic level. Chapter 10 Stephen, lost in his vision, couldn't believe the devastation. Then again, why else would the Alferos have fled and hid? There was a reason Rahab had been so frightened of the Zotharic that he'd murdered his own brother, Icharam. The wind changed and the stink hit Stephen. He grimaced. In the air, in the distance, insane gibbering floated over the blasted landscape. Smoke drifted from the top of the half-eaten Wells Fargo building, where his secret area was. Dragons were there. Stephen could feel them. Their animus was the only energy around for miles. His father's face froze as his suit became smoke to drift away in the breeze. In seconds, his body was gone, but his voice drifted in the wind. This is what the Zotharic do to worlds. You must bring weapons. You must bring allies. You must embrace your destiny. Stephen tried to call out, but the stink made him want to close his mouth. Darkness had fallen over the landscape. Clouds blocked out the sun. No, those weren't clouds. They were flying monsters. Then the black, the stink, the wasteland was gone. He was someplace else. A gas station on a highway, a sap brothers, eclipsed by a blinding blizzard, the winds as furious as the snow. Was it in the past, the present, or the future? This earth or another earth, there was no way to tell, but the place seemed important. Another gas station, this one awash in rain, the shell sign bright yellow and gleaming red. A man walked barefoot away from the pumps and headed down the street toward a cafe, a place called Tweed's, which supposedly had the best cherry pie in all of Washington State. Or that was what the sign claimed. The barefoot man was a dragon soul, and on his neck was a complex dragon tattoo in faded green ink. 
Stephen had seen that before, in the jungles of Bali, on a statue. Later, he'd seen it again on Uchiko's teacher, someone called Nawashi, which simply meant gardener. Stephen couldn't see his features, but oddly enough, he could smell him. Cardamom, cloves, nutmeg. The man took a left and walked to a freeway entrance. There, he put out a weathered, veined hand and stuck out his thumb. He was a dragon. He could fly. So why was he hitchhiking? And who was he, really? Stephen didn't know, but he had to tell Uchiko that her former teacher was in the United States and making his way east. The vision faded and Stephen blinked. He was back with Tessa, Aria, and Mouse around the fire, which had burned low. Tessa and Aria were both dressed. Mouse, in her true form, all fifteen feet of her, stood over them. I think I should put out the fire and we should get going. Yes, Aria said quickly. I do not want to spend another night in the orange crush. I have a bed waiting for me in a nice hotel. I happen to be a dragon soul princess, after all. I am accustomed to certain comforts. Tessa laughed. And I am a barista, and I like to cuddle. But we'll do it your way, Aria. Besides, we need to get back to our people. Zoe must be really jonesing for Stephen by now. Stephen motioned to Mouse, who breathed cold down onto the flames, icing them over. He thought of the blizzard he'd seen, outside the gas station. It was in their future, he knew it. They piled back into the orange crush and took off down I-76. So late at night, there was very little traffic. Tessa sat next to him while Aria and Mouse snoozed in the back seat. Read anything interesting? he asked. Not sure yet, Tessa replied. This is all in really archaic dragon script, so it's hard to understand much, and it's kind of boring. It has that whole dude begat dude begat dude stuff. This guy did this, and that guy did that. What about you? Did your vision give you anything interesting? Stephen grinned. Battle world this, mysterious dragon soul that, and I think we're going to be hit by a blizzard, and there's a gas station that seems important, a Sap Brothers. I'm thinking it's going to be another fight. Tessa shut off her phone and closed the book. I miss fighting. It's terrible to say that, I know, but I can't help it. Getting the animus from Dragon Souls is addicting. That's the Dragon Slayer talking. Lucky me. They sat in silence for a moment, then Tessa spoke. Okay, maybe the book did help me a bit. We humans kind of got Arthur Pendragon somewhat right. Arthur was a dragon, and I think he might be related to someone named Ator Dro. He was one of Ichiram's sons, and he buddied around with someone named Min Lear, who was distantly related to Mathal, though the Alferos weren't much interested in winning any Father of the Year awards. And they didn't exactly have escorts. That came later. The Alferos just wanted to bang us humans. Otter Dro and Min Lear were heroes, though. This was all well before the Egyptians, like way before. Otter Dro and Min Lear were the first ones to search for the Holy Grail. What do you think the Holy Grail is? Stephen asked. Do you think it's really going to be a cup important to Christianity? Or do you think it's something else? Tessa reached out and took Stephen's hand. I'm not sure. The human legends come close but they're always just a bit off from the truth. I'm hoping once we swim to the bottom of that lake you saw in your vision, we'll know more. The Elf Queen must have included clues there. We just won't know until we get there. They lapsed into silence. Arya, though, leaned forward. My father told me stories of Arthur Dro, a hero who went all over the world with his magician, Min Lea. In one story, Arthur Dro killed a vicious dragon soul who was eating humans, in another, he helped a dragon soul widow find food. He had a magic helmet, a cloak, and an orb which gave him unlimited power. Min Lea was his trusted friend and a great magician. They were the best of friends. Like us, Tessa touched his hair. He leaned into her caress. Like us. When they got into Ogallala, Zoe was there in the lobby. She threw her arms around Stephen and held him close for several long moments while Arya checked in. Then Zoe pulled Mouse into a bone-crushing hug. The bear girl finally let her go. I missed you guys so much. Sabina was great, though. She told me stories while we drove and we played divination games. I'd think up something from my past and she'd guess it. She's sleeping. And the twins. Those girls? Zoe shook her head, rolled her eyes, and sighed. 
They said something about staying in a Fairfield Inn being beneath them, since they only stay in Category 5 places or higher. I have no idea what that means, and it's best not to ask. Stephen had to laugh at how chatty Zoe was. Mouse still looked half asleep, but she was awake enough to give Zoe a hug. They then carried their stuff into their rooms. Mouse wanted her own, and Aria and Tessa stayed together, which left Stephen with Zoe. He was tired from driving in, but when he held her close and kissed her, he felt fresh passion fill him, and she was more than ready. Again, his dragon soul libido was there to save the day. He left her satisfied, and both fell fast asleep. Names swirled in his head. Icharam, Ator Dro, Arthur Pendragon. All three were warriors with a vision of a better world. Mathal, Minlir, Merlin. Magicians. All were scholars, powerful but troubled. What about Rahab's offspring? Stephen didn't know. He woke when the telephone next to the bed rang. It was Chazzy. Good morning, sleepyhead. This is your favorite Wayne girl. Sorry, Prue, but you know it's true. So, my prime, it's snowing like hell, but I can't stay another night in this hotel. Oh, and say hello to Uchiko. A muffled sound came over the phone before he heard. Konnichiwa, Stephen Dono. I stayed the night with chastity and prudence. They were very kind to me. That surprised Stephen. What now? Chazzy came back on the line. Yeah, we saw Uchiko outside and invited her in. See, we are team players, best wives ever. By the way, you are going to marry us, right? Did we talk about the wedding vows? Sabina has some ideas. Prue said something, but Stephen couldn't hear it. Anyway, come to breakfast. If they don't have a waffle maker, I'm out of your primacy. See, this is why you have to marry us. We're fickle. What's that, Prue? Yeah, good point. I'm fickle, while Prue loves you forever. Anywho, come on down. Stephen planned to do just that, until Zoe grinned up at him. She was naked, warm, and cuddly, and her bright blue-green eyes were so cheery. Her wild, frizzy hair smelled like honey. How could he say no to her? He couldn't, though, after he finished, she kissed him and murmured, If you marry the Waynes, you have to marry me, and Aria, and Sabina, and Mouse. Right then, that seemed like the best idea ever. However, he noticed Zoe didn't mention Tessa. Mordred was having deep dish pizza at La Tavolo Rotonda when the call came in. Victor Nutgrass had stayed over while the others had left to begin the invasion. However, an attack didn't seem necessary at this stage of the game, or so it seemed. La Tavola Rotonda was down on the mezzanine level with good views of Michigan Street and Lake Michigan. Wood, brass, soft lights, candles, and laughter. It was a good restaurant, good enough for the likes of Morty Flint and his cronies. For Mordred, it was too loud and too happy, and he suffered through meals there because it was expected of him. He had a role to play, and as long as people thought he was inviting, friendly even, they might never suspect who really was. It was fine. Yet the theater didn't exactly agree with him. He and Victor were in a private booth in the back with a view of the dark lake. The Carolina Prime ate half a piece of pizza before pushing it away. He leaned in close to Mordred. I confirmed with Robert Staines, the United States military have satellite images of the Dracarys area in Cheyenne and it's been destroyed. Novak, Boaz, and Jessup are already in the process of transferring the primacy over to the Yellow Ronin, who is now the most powerful dragon lord on the planet. It seems someone else murdered our problem. Mordred had heard differently. He'd called Spiderfinger. He'd only ever seen the mysterious dragon soul in person once, in the concrete basement back room underneath a southy brothel. Spiderfinger had kept his right hand hidden. He'd put his left hand on a half-burned folding table underneath a lamp so the light could shine down on his pinky, which had the extra joint. Spiderfinger offered up information in return for favors. Mordred had agreed. The secretive entity gave Mordred his cell phone for emergency calls only. Mordred had called about Stephen Dracarys' untimely death. Their conversation had been short. Spiderfinger had answered. He's not dead. You should probably take care of that. He'll be at a gas station in Nebraska. I'll text you the information. Click. 
Mordred wasn't used to people hanging up on him. He didn't like it, and he didn't like that Spiderfinger seemed to be changing his story. He'd had Zuzana try her divination magic, but of course, she hadn't gotten much. Nothing on Stephen Dracaris, and only a little flash of something in Denver, but that could be anything. She had seen Panga Kamong in Washington, walking in the rain. Victor's people had seen the same thing. Why would Panga Kamong be visiting? Why was he alone? And why did they keep seeing him in his human form? Mordred didn't know, but Ponga had always been odd. Mordred had never met a dragon so divided and dangerous except for Mathal during those tragic last days. We have three tanks for this attack, Victor said. They're decommissioned M1 Abrams, but they work. I have a good source on getting military equipment. Stains? Mordred asked. Victor nodded. He's the president's special liaison to the Dragon Soul community, but he's been willing to do some extra things for me, for a price. He has a certain moral flexibility. Yes, I know. Mordred caught Susanna's eyes, and she came over. She slid into the booth. She didn't stop sliding until she was right next to Victor. She put an arm around him and toyed with the man's hair. Zuzana had dressed up for the occasion in a black gown she'd had since the 1920s. She'd piled her gray hair on top of her head. Makeup covered her face, but not well. It didn't suit her. More theater. Victor gave Mordred an uncertain smile. No offense, Morty, but she's a bit too old for me. And that makes her very deadly, Mordred said casually. Zuzana slid a needle into Victor's carotid artery. Elf tears, my friend. You won't be waking up. I'll be taking over the Carolina primacy early. Victor's eyes muddied. But we... No. He fell forward. Zuzana eased him back. They'd take and butcher Victor and then dump his body into flames. Mordred would contact Victor's legal team. He would tell his allies the deceased Carolina Prime had fallen prey to some mysterious force, perhaps the same one that had destroyed Stephen Dracaris. It was dangerous times. Maybe it was the Shadow Archer, since Panga had failed to capture her in Indonesia, or perhaps it was Panga himself, since he was on American soil, or could it be the return of the Dragon Slayer? The Dragon Lords might believe that, but in reality, the Dragon Slayer was dead. Mordred had been there to make sure of it a thousand years ago. Zuzana whispered to him, Our people are in position. Juice Juice has his sounders. The Gree Gree are with them as well as the Inferno dogs. And the other primes? Mordred asked. Yes, they are there. But will Stephen Dracaris and his escort be at this gas station? Zuzana asked. There is a bad storm there. The weather will not stop them, Mordred murmured. Spiderfinger hasn't been wrong yet. I would imagine very few will survive the fight. Perhaps only your special friend will live through the battle. Other than you, your friend is the last of the Dragon Knights, the last Americos brother. Zuzana gave him a little smile. Both thought the title was ridiculous. Her knowledge of Mordred and his dealings was both comforting and disturbing. At times he pondered killing her, and yet her presence could be so soothing. More than that, she could worm her way into places others couldn't. For example, Victor never thought he'd meet his end at the hands of an old woman. She was the perfect spy, willing to do anything for him. Zuzana paused and then said, You did the right thing with Victor. He was never going to get his hands dirty. You have his government contacts. You have his people. No one will suspect you murdered him. Just in case you are having second thoughts. I only have one regret, Mordred said quietly. When you have a single great sin, other sins lose their importance. The grand mistake. He should have killed Merlin first. Chapter 11 Tessa kept her serape over the pistols on her hips as she and Sabina walked up to the Sap Brothers' convenience store outside of Elm Creek, Nebraska. Jeeves and the Poupon sat parked away from the pumps, beyond the edge of the parking lot's asphalt. The twins were taking their time, so Tessa and the Latina magician went on without them. Meanwhile, Stephen and the others were in the Orange Crush, parked elsewhere, waiting. 
Tessa squinted against the cold fist of snow. The restaurant connected to the convenience store was closed. Actually, she was surprised anything was open. It was Snowmageddon outside. They had crept down I-80 in four-wheel drive for hours just to get to this gas station in the middle of nowhere. Driving through snow wasn't fun. Being on a quest for the Holy Grail, definitely fun. Maine was still a long way away, and they had at least one fight in their future. Tessa saw it, as did Sabina and Stephen. Tessa was thrilled. She couldn't stop trembling. She wanted a battle and the dragon soul animus it would give her. Ugh, oh, vampire much, Tessa? she asked herself. The bell dinged as she led Sabina inside. The clerk was a big boy, early twenties with a wispy beard and a cornhusker's ball cap on his blonde head. Acne was currently vacationing on his face, and he looked bored out of his skull. The name Jimmy was stitched on his shirt. The Wayne twins followed them through the door and immediately went to the sunglass spinner. Those two would use any excuse to shop, even if there was nothing worth having. They each carried army surplus duffel bags and had big assault rifles slung over their shoulders. In their pink snowsuits, they looked like James Bond villains. They certainly had the temperament to match. Prue put some monstrous rhinestone spectacles on Chazzy's face. There, those make you look like hot buttered popcorn ready to eat. Right, Jimmy? Uh, yeah, he blinked, gaping. Even in their snowsuits, you couldn't miss the Wayne twins' curves. Dark mascara outlined eyes the color of cedar and leaves. Light hazel so striking Tessa couldn't blame the clerk for staring. And their concealer only added to their freckles somehow. The red hair was definitely the attention grabber. Poor Jimmy never had a chance. Chazzy tilted her head. Oh, Jimmy, aren't you just the sweetest thing? How about we try the sexy librarian look for my sister? She gave Prue black, horn-rimmed glasses. Prue put them on and pierced the clerk with an unwavering gaze. Your books are late and you have fines, Jimmy. And shame on you for checking out those dirty books. The guy turned pink and might have been on the verge of hyperventilating. Sabina unhooked her arm and shuffled down the center aisle. Sabina stood in a white coat that didn't cover her shapely butt, which was currently tantalizing the world in thick wool tights. With her back to the clerk, she cast a divinatio spell. Her glowing green eyes reflected off the floor. The Latina magician reached out and unhooked a package of fried pork skins. She thought for a minute and put them back, then grabbed them again then put them back, sighing. Tessa laughed. Can't decide, Sabina? I can, but I promised Zoe I would eat better. No, manches. I love chicharrones. Why does everything that tastes good have to be so bad for you? Dick don't, Chazzy called out. Prue had ideas on that. Please, for one, I'm not sure I'd call the taste good. For second, we both know that little piece of meat is the most dangerous thing in the world. Little? Who've you been sleeping with, girl? Not Stephen. Lie, only Stephen. It's only ever going to be Stephen. Tessa heard the love in Prue's voice and it warmed her heart. They did have it bad for their prime, who was just the right size as far as she was concerned. She walked up to the counter. Hey, Jimmy. Sucks not to be in charge, huh? Did the manager make you come in? Jimmy's eyes went to the twins, then to Sabina, then back to Tessa, and then to the counter, where suddenly his stand of lighters seemed very important. The owner did. I told him no one would be coming in. I mean, you aren't no one, but you're the first customers I've seen. They're bound to close the highway on account of the blizzard. So there hasn't been anyone lurking about? Tessa asked. He shook his head. Ed, this trucker generally shows in any kind of weather and he didn't pull in, so you know it ain't good. Tessa could feel for poor Jimmy. You wake up thinking you'll have a snow day, and then the boss insists it's not so bad, and there you have it, standing around doing nothing. Fucking management, Tessa said, nodding. Oh, it's not so bad for the guy, Chazzy said. I bet you ten dollars he was looking at porn on his phone not five seconds before we came in. For ten bucks? Prue asked. I'll take that bet. The pair came over to flank Tessa. Okay, Jimmy, you have to tell us true, Prudence said. Were you looking at porn? Me and my sister have a bet. You wouldn't let us down by lying, would you? Jimmy lost it. You guys, I can't talk about that. I mean, I can't. You shouldn't ask a guy that. He was basically blubbering. 
Chazzy put out a hand. Prue dug into her pockets to get the money. How about double or nothing, Chazzy? Bet you Jimmy was five seconds away from going into the back room and rubbing one out. Am I wrong? The clerk went from bright pink to ivory pale. Tessa put a stop to the torture. No, that's all Jimmy's business. Don't be mean, twins. But I do have a real question. This is going to sound strange, Jimmy. But do you have gaps in your memory from today? He shook his head and gave them a little smile. No, just looking at porn. They laughed at that. Then Sabina turned, eyes glowing green. The tanks are here. Black fish tanks? Chazzy asked, wincing. Tessa knew exactly what tanks the Latina was talking about. What's wrong with her eyes? Jimmy whimpered. The blind woman kept on talking. Magicians, warlings, the sounders, they have us surrounded. They are creeping in with their guns. This is the first battle in the final war. What war? Jimmy squeaked. The Wayne twins unslung their rifles and racked their bolts. Tessa swept back her serape and pulled one of the cold peacekeepers. For a second, Tessa luxuriated in the Tarantino-ish glory of drawing steel surrounded by Slim Jims, donuts, e-cigarettes, and hot dog carousels full of yesterday's mystery meat stuffed into a tube. It was natural-born killers meets Deadwood or Dodge City, and she loved it. Jimmy went pale. Cash, register, it's yours. Porn on my phone. Tessa could feel her dragon slayer blood warming to the fight. Jimmy, buddy, you're not going to remember anything when we're done. You be good and get down behind the counter. Yes, ma'am, he stammered and got down on the floor. Sabina stretched out her hands. Magica Defensio. There was a crump as the first tank shell hit her shield spell. The noise was deafening. The stink of dusted concrete, smashed neon, melted plastic, and cordite lit up their senses. Shell fragments smashed through the window, cutting through a display of monster energy drinks. Jimmy was on the floor screaming. Poor guy. That was why they had parked their vehicles away from the gas station. They knew this was their next battleground. Stephen, Zoe, and Mouse were waiting in the snow, hidden away, to strike their enemy from behind if Tessa left anything for them to hit. The Latina magician had cast two shield spells, both against physical damage. Those shells packed a wallop, but she kept them safe. Adrenaline hit Tessa. She loved it. Loved it so much. She snapped open the action of her colt, checked her ammo, and she had a half-and-half -half mix of ice, fire, and lightning rounds spacing her normal bullets. Three tanks. Perfect. Chazzy and Prue shredded their snowsuits and stood as huge pink homo draconi with their assault rifles in their claws. Chazzy opened fire, her pinkified magic rounds striking the soldiers coming up. Tessa had given the 762 NATO rounds a shot of special sauce, and they went through Kevlar like it was paper. Prue scooped up a perforated monster drink and sucked out the fluid from a hole. When Chazzy emptied her clip, she threw the can away. Then she started up the rocking and rolling. Another clap of a tank firing, then another. Sabina deflected both shells away with her force fields, which glowed green in the falling snow, swirled by the wind. She didn't much need to see the actual shells because she intuitively knew where they were. The windows blew in, followed by fire. Those were impetum spells. Chazzy grunted in pain at her burns while Prue cast a shield spell to protect against magic. The smart twin turned on Jimmy. Sweetie Pie, this would be a good time to use the emergency shutoff valve. You have one, right? Them assholes are throwing fireballs. They have no regard for our safety. The clerk whimpered and started clicking on something. Or was that his teeth chattering from fear? Reloading, Prue, Chazzy said. She bent and scooped a fresh clip out of the duffel bag. Then she was up, firing. See, sister? Prue grabbed another energy drink. This is why we need impetum magic. Save us on our reload. Tell me I'm wrong. You're not, sister. Chazzy shot off half a clip through the window. Lightning sizzled up and down the front of the ruined storefront, but Prue's force field took care of it. Her spell color was more of a pastel pink, while Tessa's was more rose-colored. Bullets punched through walls. The freezer section glass shattered inward. Soda, energy drinks, and chocolate milk became fountains of high-fructose corn syrup and carbonation. Even the Starbucks bottles were not safe from the barrage. Tessa yelled, drawing the second peacekeeper and unloading it on the soldiers. Damn it. Not the Frappuccinos. Was there no end to the evil of these dragon souls? 
More explosions from the tanks, three of them firing. Boom, boom, boom. The blasts were deafening. The stink, awful. But Sabina kept them safe. I'm going to go over there to take care of those fucking tanks. Tessa spit, reloading. Cover me and watch your ass. Shit's going to be coming in from the rear. Not a third input girl myself. Chazzy gunned down another couple warlings dashing for them through the snow. Prue, what's your stance on your back door? Prue made a face. I don't like it, until I do. Usually tequila is involved. A homo draconis rushed them. Prue growled, opened her mouth, and cut him down with a lightning exhalant. Explosions from the back. Prue turned to gun down a werewolf running down the hall at them from the restrooms and showers. The wolf tumbled over and turned human to slide across the floor, leaving a bloody streak. The corpse was very muscled and very dead. A bear howled and rushed forward. Prue turned his big skull into pulp. Tessa knew she'd done a good job on those bullets. They were ending their enemies without much fuss. The barista turned spellslinger, holstered her second pistol, and walked out with shield magic floating around her left hand, protection against physical attacks. She cast a second spell to stop magic attacks and kept that in front of her. She couldn't let anyone flank her. And she had an encanto spell ready. The icy wind still cut through the shields, but she was too full of piss and adrenaline to even really notice. She went forward, bullets and spell fire dancing across her force fields. She walked through the pumps to face the three tanks, one on her right, another in the center, and the last on her left. Warlings sped toward her, but they went down, one after another. Throwing stars cut into their hamstrings and peppered their backs. Uchiko, in a white hood and flowing white robes, ghosted back into the storm her work done for the moment. Tessa gave the disgraced dragon-skin ninja a silent cheer. Then she reached out with a colt and fired her arctic wind bullet into the tank on her right. Yeah, it was already snowing, but her enchanted bullet held glacial amounts of freeze. The enchanted round struck the turret and the ice flash froze the front part of the metal, including the barrel. The operator triggered the tank's gun, but when the round hit the iced-up barrel it was like someone had stuffed an M-80 into a turtle. The turret lifted off the hull, debris went flying, and the whole tank shuddered as the tracks shattered. The barrel was gone. Greasy black smoke barfed out of the ruined tank. Animus filled Tessa from the kills, and the whirling energy was tasty, but it wasn't Dragon Soul Animus. An encanto spell knocked out Tessa's shields, but she was ready. She crouched, cast two more spells to replace them, and then reached out with her mind. A magician hid behind the middle tank. Tessa yanked the Animus out of him using Animus Chain. A whirling fired on her from her right. She shot him in the face with the second, relatively normal bullet. She gasped. More Animus. Good to the last drop. She aimed her Inferno bullet at the middle tank. The war machine whirred as it tried to lower its cannon to fire on her, but it never had the chance. Her bullet didn't penetrate. It superheated the entire front face of the hull, sagging it inward, turning the front part of the turret into molten metal. Snow hissed and spat off the hell she'd created. The barrel bent and broke off with a clank. Everyone inside the vehicle had found themselves in an oven set to broil. The magician raced out, firing at her with dual forty-fives, and she shot him in the chest, blowing a fist-sized chunk out his back. Bullets and spells sparked off her shields, almost distracting her from the last tank as it reversed hard and got her in its sights. The main gun thundered. Tessa angled her shield and the high-velocity round bounced off and hit an old Camaro with a lot of gray primer struggling to cover the rust. Jimmy's car. Damn. The round went through the thing and knocked it end over end over end. When it finally settled onto its trembling wheels, most of the car was gone. Tessa swiveled and hit the last tank with an electro-arc bullet. Lightning danced over the metal, frying the circuit boards. The operators would have been fine. The lightning flowed around the hull into the ground, but a box of ammunition cooked off and shredded them. Yeah, more whirling energy filled her to the brim. Frost-coated werebores thundered out of the blizzard toward her. The sounders were trying to take her down since the whirlings and magicians couldn't get to her. From behind her... Five serpentine shapes, wings outstretched, came floating down, and they breathed out a variety of exhalants at her. Sabina's green force fields caught the dragon breath. Inferno, Electroarc, Arctic wind, even some shadow flame. Tessa felt the power in the dragons, and she wanted their animus. 
wanted it more than anything in her entire life. Mystical energy coursed through her from all the kills. She was so powered up, she decided to try something new. Mithal had used telekinesis during the Battle of Cheyenne, and Tessa had been studying up on the advanced magic. Telekinesis was simply a highly focused shield spell. Instead of using her last bullet, Tessa cast a defensio spell, but focused the new energy around the tank that she'd hit with lightning. She lifted it. The whole tank gleamed with the pink of her magic. She flicked her fingers and sent the war machine into the werebores. The metal crushed three of them. Tessa wasn't done. She picked the tank back up and flung it into the air. It struck a long, dark purple dragon. Direct hit. All that steel in motion, coupled with the dragon's speed, was a deadly combination. It was like hitting a pigeon with an anvil. Both the tank and the purple beast went crashing back into the earth in a roll of metal, flesh, and scales. The storm consumed the wreckage, and she lost sight of the carnage. Kind of disappointing. The dragon soul's animus filled her. That special energy was so unique, so powerful, and she felt a taste of the power beyond reason she'd felt after killing Sir Bedivere and Sir Brunor during her last battle. An enormous black bear rushed out of the blizzard to claw Tessa, but it never had the chance. A long chain hooked the morphling around his thick, ursine neck. A second later, Uchiko cut the thing's throat with a sickle. A second after that... The ninja disappeared into the storm. A gray dragon with yellow on its tail flashed over. He tried to pull the strength out of her using shadow strength, but she encantoed that shit away. She drew her left revolver and imbued the gun with ion claws. The whole pistol became a gleaming sun in her left hand. She took aim and blew a wing off the gray dragon. It fell out of the sky and hit the canopy over the pumps, going through it in a shower of sparks and sharp metal. It landed in a ball of hurt in front of her. She fired the last bullet in her right pistol into its brain. Another dragon soul's magic filled her core. She missed killing primes. They had an extra something to their animus. Power? Sex? Lordshipness? Tessa didn't know, but she liked it a lot. Maybe a little too much. She holstered her right revolver and tossed her left gun up into the air. She caught it with her right hand, and it still gleamed like the sword of an archangel. The biggest of the dragons, some huge, dark, brown beast, flew over her, and instead of hitting her, he opened his mouth and aimed at the main building of the Sap Brothers. The air went silent, the wind eclipsed, the world in pain, as the air shimmered around the brown dragon soul. There was that moment of quiet, and then the otherworldly whomp and another moment of absolute stillness, and then the blinding laser light of chromatic fury tore through the convenience store, cutting it in half down the center. Another dragon, this one a golden yellow color, flew over and hit the building from the other side with chromatic fury and cut the place into quarters. Chip bags burst into flames as racks melted. Both ceiling sections and floor tiles turned to ash. Smoke poured from the ruins to be snatched away by the blizzard. The stink of the ruined road food mingled with a definite tobacco scent. There went the cigarettes and cigars on the back wall. Nothing moved inside. Jimmy had lost his car, but he also might have just lost his life. As for the twins and Sabina, Tess thought about casting a divination spell to check on them, but then she saw two pink homo draconi leap out of the wreckage, wings flapping hard. Each of the dragon women held an assault rifle. Sabina joined them as a long green dragon. The Latina magician's shield spells deflected an explosion of flames from a set of females that had flown in on the tails of the two big dragon lords, and then the gunfire from the machine guns started to do their work. Yes, her friends were alive, and Tessa found herself grinning. Using her telekinesis, Tessa floated above the gas station. She had five bullets left in her ion gun, and she was going to collect a trophy with each and every round. Chapter 12 Stephen kissed Zoe and left her with Mouse as he and Arya took to the wind. He'd left Samael's lash inside the orange crush. The sword's presence would only give his true identity away. Besides, even without it, he had an arsenal of claws, teeth, and magical powers. He and Arya had been waiting in their true forms for the enemy dragons to attack. The blizzard had coated him with a layer of ice, painting his scales white. 
Long icicles fell off his beard as he rose. The wind was brutal, blasting snow. He let a vicious gust fill his wings. He went racing through the sky and onto the back of a white female dragon. He tore into her back while biting into a wing. He stabbed his back feet into her flesh and then ripped the animus out of her. She went limp, but he didn't just drop her. He set her down gently on the ground. He hissed into her ear. We need to stop fighting one another. Stephen Dracarys might be dead, but his vision lives on. Tell your sister wives, and remember how I spared you. Before the white dragon could speak, Stephen was back in the air. Mouse was in her homo draconis form riding on Zoe, with her green sword wreathed in flames. When a whirling went for her, Uchiko appeared out of nowhere to slice him to ribbons with her sickle chain. Zoe and Mouse were the bait, and Uchiko was the spring-loaded ninja trap. Clever. A slender blue female dragon soared down, her talons outstretched. Stephen took her strength using shadow strength. She plummeted and Stephen caught her and laid her on the ground. He used animus chain to suck her soul into his and then, again, told her that things were changing. Two more dragons raced down to rake their claws into his back. Before they could, a scarlet flash of scales, wings, and a tail landed on one. Aria ripped out the poor female's neck with her fangs. She then shifted human, riding on the dead dragon for a second. She sparked the two animus daggers, holding lightning in her hands. She leapt onto the other female. One knife went into the back of the luckless female, the other severed her spine. Aria then transformed back into a dragon, holding the knives between her claws. She caught a gust of wind and went flying off. Thanks, Aria. Stephen lumbered away from the carnage and worked his wings until he was back in the air. Tessa floated like a goddess in the air, with a single pistol shining like a fusion reactor in her fist. When she fired, trails of apocalyptic light blazed through the storm-strewn sky, and when her bullets struck, they went right through their targets, leaving gaping holes. Sabina, in her dragon form, circled Tessa. The green dragon skin cast force fields to keep the barista safe. Between the two of them, they had driven off most of the dragons. As for Chazzy and Prue, they joined Zoe, Mouse, and Uchiko on the ground to send the remaining troops fleeing. Three big males remained, hitting Tessa and Sabina with spells, lightning, fire, and arctic wind far colder than the blizzard winds and blinding snow. The dark brown was the biggest, his scales the color of a wet redwood, but the other two, a bright yellow and a ruddy maroon with black streaks running across his body, were just as vicious. The maroon dragon had a big belly, but that didn't slow him. Tessa paused to reload her big peacekeepers. The big brown dragon latched onto Sabina and threw her from the sky. It then clawed at Tessa. Her pink force field held. She raised her gun. She fired into the dark brown, but her back was open to both the yellow beast and the fat maroon one. Stephen flung himself onto maroon. He caught the dragon lord's wings and breathed fire down on the head of the beast. The dragon let out a shriek. At the same time, yellow whirled and grabbed Stephen. The big brown hit them all and they went careening down through the whistling wind to smash down on the ruins of the Sap Brothers. Not much was left. The place had been ripped apart. The maroon's head was blackened, his beard gone, one eye sealed closed with burnt skin. He staggered off, fleeing, his great belly swaying. Stephen had lost track of Tessa in the mess of bodies. She would have to take care of herself. Stephen triggered Serpent Grace just as Big Yellow reared, mouth open, fire leaking from his maw. Stephen lashed Big Yellow across the face with his tail. Blood flowed. The dragon joined Fat Maroon Dragon in his escape. The pair streaked past a black and orange dragon in the distance. This prime was smaller than the others, only slightly bigger than a female. However, he had a full, thick black beard that tumbled down the orange scales of his chest. Stephen felt the Dragon Lord's presence. This was, without doubt, the most powerful prime on the field of battle. A big, spiked tail struck Stephen as he tried to tap the animus of the tiger-colored dragon. Stephen blinked. That had hit him out of nowhere. While he was stunned, Big Brown reached in and ripped Stephen's energy from his cells using shadow strength. The enemy dragon laughed. Do you give up? I'd just love for you to surrender. Again, Stephen tried to reach out with Animus Chain to get at the Tiger Dragon, but the mysterious Dragon Lord was quicker. Stephen's own energy was stripped from him. 
The Tiger Dragon had access to the Alfarian skill tree. Tiger Dragon had stripped Stephen's muscles of energy and taken his animus as well. I'd also like a name, Big Brown snickered. It's hard to tell your true color. The dragon took Stephen in his claws and threw him across the wrecked convenience store. Gunfire erupted from somewhere. Chazzy's laughter floated through the storm, but everything else was white, blowing snow. Stephen nearly shifted human, but he couldn't risk being exposed. No, as long as he kept his true form, his mask of ice and snow hid his true color. The blizzard died down for a second. A lone figure was revealed about twenty feet away. Both of her hands gleamed with infinite light. You don't need to know his name, Tessa said. And who are you? Big Brown asked. I'm a dragon slayer, and you're fucked. Stephen lifted himself up and he felt energy fill him. Tessa was channeling some of her animus into him, and she had so much, he could feel her power and glee. Still, the tiger dragon stood, watching. What was he waiting for? Stephen didn't know, but he leapt to his feet and hurled impetum spells at the black and orange beast. Stephen's spinning black stars of energy turned to wisps as they hit the tiger dragon's shields. A blink later and the powerful dragon was gone. Stephen ducked Big Brown's next attack. He rolled away, shifted into his homo draconis form, and flung out his hands. He tried to pull the strength out of Big Brown, but the dragon soul countered with an encanto spell. With his muscles still weak, Stephen was forced to use other weapons in his arsenal. He breathed fire on the enemy dragon, only to have his flames quenched by the brown's arctic wind. Suddenly, leaving Samael's lash behind didn't seem like such a good idea. Without pausing, Stephen reached into the core of Big Brown and clamped down on the orb of redwood-colored light. He gritted his teeth and squeezed. Big Brown let out a yelp. No, stop! Stephen growled. You will surrender. Now! I can't! Big Brown growled in agony. The dragons I'm working with! The dragon knights! They'll kill me! Tessa lifted a revolver. They won't. Because you're already dead. Tessa, no! Stephen growled. Too late. Light flared from her revolver and punched a hole in the chest of Big Brown. Tessa let out a cry of exultation as she collected the animus of the Dragon Lord. Her whole body flashed a bright light, too bright for Stephen to see what color it was. And then she slowly faded, 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 until it was just Tessa standing there in her serape, with her peacekeepers dangling from her hands. Stephen shifted into his dragon form and breathed fire from his nostrils. Why did you do that, Tessa? I had him. We have got to stop killing dragons. We need every single soldier we can get for our fight against the Zotharic. Tessa lifted her face up to him. She had to shout to be heard above the whistling wind. Not dragon lords. When they attack us, they choose to die. I saw how you spared the females. I wish I could do that, but I can't. I simply can't. Stephen couldn't use words, not with the wind, and so he cast a divination spell. Sabina was alive, all of his escort was, and he saw them for an instant gathered together at Jeeves and the Poupon in the parking lot. Stephen then focused his mind on the barista. Tessa, what is going on with you? Her voice appeared in his head. It's the animus from the dragons, Stephen. It fuels me like nothing else, and we can't stop fighting now. Maybe once we find the Holy Grail we can, but not yet. And really, I'm telling you, if someone attacks us, I won't show them any mercy. Not ever. It's kill or be killed. But you like it. I love it. Tessa's eyes stared up at him, and in those eyes there was fury, strength, and lust. He could almost taste her power. Stephen sent her a memory of her crying in a Montana parking lot. She'd so wanted allies. When Cassius Pine had turned out to be a murderous bastard, she'd been crushed. Tessa turned from him. That was shitty, Stephen. Using my own memories in an argument? What a total chick move. And dude, really, we found allies. You can't ask me not to fight as hard as I can to save us. You can't. You're right, Stephen said. I can't. If our lives are in danger, you need to kill every single unfriendly you can. Yet if we have an opening to recruit someone, we need to start giving them a chance. We need to evaluate and reevaluate every situation. He showed her the final moments of the battle from his point of view. It was perfect communication. She had to see that Stephen could have made Big Brown give them the names of the Dragon Knights he was working with. 
Tessa switched it around, and he could feel her anger at the Dragon Lord for nearly killing the Waynes and Sabina inside the convenience store. In her mind, the minute that dragon had used chromatic fury, he'd signed his own death warrant. Yet underneath her anger, Stephen felt her lust for dragon soul animus. The divination magic faded. Stephen shifted human and fell against Tessa, who caught him. She held him, and though it was cold as hell, he paused and felt her body as well as her energy. How could he be mad at her? They'd won, and it was because of Tessa. He'd kept track of his escort using Divinatio before he joined the fight. The barista had taken out the tanks by herself, though Uchiko had provided backup and Sabina's shield use had been brilliant. She whispered into his ear, Stephen, you can trust me. I'll always fight for you. I can control this. And yet, when their minds had been linked, he'd felt the depth of her bloodlust. He wasn't sure she could fight it. It was troubling. This was Tessa. This was his crush, and yet it felt like she was becoming a stranger. He decided to lighten the mood and celebrate. They'd fought another battle and they'd won, though several of the dragons had escaped, including the tiger-colored prime. Who's Jimmy? Stephen asked. You were kind of worried about him. Tessa's sigh turned into chuckles. Jimmy? Oh man, he's alive, the Wayne twins made sure of that, but he's gonna be pissed. Not only did he have to work in this fucking blizzard, but I accidentally blew up his car with a tank bullet thingy. Oopsies. Tessa paused. Hey, let me give you a little mojo. Then you can true form it up and keep me warm. She chained her animus into his and he felt new power fill him. Then it was easy to turn back into a huge black dragon. He snorted some flame while blocking her from the wind. Much better. She put out her hands. Ah, there you go. Get some marshmallows and we can make s'mores. He was glad she was joking. It felt like old times. Sabina's voice filled both their minds. Come to the cars. This was only a small attack team from a much larger legion. Kansas is being overrun as we speak. Stephen knew they had a lot to talk about and a lot of decisions to make. Could he really continue on their quest for the Holy Grail when his primacy was being invaded? Chapter 13 Stephen felt better once he got into dry clothes and they blasted the Orange Crush's heater. Jimmy was with them. He wasn't so much pissed that his Camaro had been tanked as he was flabbergasted to be surrounded by dragons and magicians. And then there was Zoe, who transformed from a bear into a girl right before his eyes. The morphling action was one thing, but her subsequent nudity made him audibly gulp. They dropped him off at his parents' little snowed-in house before getting back on I-80. The Wayne twins insisted on wiping his mind themselves, and they tucked $30,000 into his backpack with a note that said he'd done an excellent job in protecting the Sap brothers, and an anonymous donor appreciated all his help. Stephen was impressed. The Wayne twins were actually being kind. Wow. Outside of Kearney, the snow became too thick to go on. That's when they were pushed off the highway and I-80 was officially closed. The whole town had shut its doors. Every hotel was full. They could have found a church or a nice human to crash with, but in the end, Stephen had a better idea. They broke into the Walmart. Stephen easily cut the locks with his ion claws. Meanwhile, Prue contacted Bud, who called Kearney's mayor, who contacted the owner of the store, who was given $30,000 to let them stay the night. They'd pay for anything they used and, of course, any damages. Bud was also in touch with the township of Elm Creek to explain the Sap Brothers' gas station explosion. That one was easy to explain. Gas leak from frozen pipes. One Jimmy James Stevens was painted as a hero, or so the story went. Without him, the damage might have extended to the town itself. Inside the Walmart, Stevens' escort fanned out from behind him. The lights were low, but the heat was on. The wind whistled outside, but it was warm, safe, and dry inside the store. The Wayne twins hung on to their duffel bags and guns. Chazzy tisked. When was the last time we were in a fucking Walmart, Prue? Prue nodded. Summer of 2008, we had to get coolers, ice, and Bud Light. Carlo Bart threw a late party and hadn't planned for shit. We also bought shotguns. And didn't we get toys for the kids? Yeah, we did, because we're awesome and such team players. 
Tessa dropped her satchel, which contained the Dracaris grimoires and the Topaz pen, along with the Dragon Knight's book she got from Eve Downfire. The barista stripped off her shirt. I'm going shopping. I'm going to buy a ton of clothes. She air-quoted the words. It's going to be so much fun. Who's with me? Zoe also started to take off her clothes. I will, Tessa. How cool is this? Mouse clutched the slayer blade to her chest. Huh, would you look at that? Tessa goes from bloodthirsty death machine to Miss Walmart 2019 in five seconds. Come with us, Mouse, Zoe pleaded. Mouse made a motion with her hand. Yes, yes, you go. I'll catch up. Stephen and the rest of his escort made their way back to the camping section. Might as well bed down on mats and grab sleeping bags. The Waynes picked the choicest supplies while Sabina unfolded a chair and sat down. Arya stood, arms crossed. Uchiko appeared out of nowhere. She'd left her white gi behind and wore pink sweatpants and a pink juicy jacket, totally bejeweled. Uggs covered her feet. Her half-dragon body looked remarkably at home in the normal clothes. The ninja bowed. Stephen Donnell, will you let me listen to your plans? The more the merrier, Prue said. She wore a big white parka and snow pants. She was taking no chances with the cold. Chazzy matched her sister. Yeah, Uchiko, we like you around, since you don't talk much. Aria wasn't about to touch an article of Walmart clothing. She wore a red turtleneck and black slacks from her luggage. We will talk briefly, and then we'll get some sleep. However, I do think we should have someone keep watch. Those dragons were waiting for us at the gas station. If they could find us there, they could attack us here. Sabina cast a divination spell. The brown dragon we killed was Alonzo Max Sterling, the dragon lord of the Miami Dixie Primacy. Prue made a face. Ugh, we own Florida. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It is a good thing. Aria didn't get the joke, and Stephen wasn't sure he did either. When Chazzy saw his confusion, she laughed and unfolded a chair for him. Google weird news of Florida at some point, then you can decide. Tilt the U.S. and all the crazy runs right into the southeast corner. Stephen didn't have any strong opinions. Another primacy meant more vassals, crazy or not. Sabina, there was a black and orange dragon at the Sap Brothers fight. Do you have any idea who he was? She shook her head. He is hidden. Damn. Stephen sat on a creaking folding chair. He cast Animus Chain on me, and he could have taken me out, but instead he left the fight along with Yellow and Maroon. Candler and Helga, Prue said. Candler certainly isn't getting any thinner, even in his true form. I bet those cowards ran back to Morty. Maybe not, Chazzy returned. Losing their promises might have galled them into an alliance with the other dragon lords, and to lose Denise and Femi, that's salt in the wound, she sighed. We're driving right by the Great Lakes Primacy. We could do a side trip to Chicago, maybe. Aria paced. No, if Kansas is under siege, we should stop the invasion force there. That is the next logical course of action. We do not want them taking Colorado. That would put Tessa's and Stephen's families in danger. A bad feeling filled Stephen's belly. Sabina ripped open a little bag of cinnamon almonds and picked a few out to crunch on them. Prue and Chazzy were sharing a can of peaches. The two were strangely quiet. Okay, you two, do your thing, he said. The twins looked surprised. What do you mean? Aria snapped her fingers. Yes, 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 I would like to hear what you think. Kinda tired, Chazzy said. Prue had a faraway look in her eyes. Jimmy was cute in an overweight, acne sort of way. Poor guy should stop beating off so much and find himself a nice human to bang. Humans. They don't get sex like us dragons do, Chazzy murmured. She then shook herself. Okay, you're right, Prue. How many dragon lords are left in the U.S. now that Alonzo is dead? Prue motioned with her fork. We got Candler and Helga in the wind, two there. Louis Lelou had some of his gris gris at the Sap Brothers, you know he did. There was a lot of impetum magic hitting us. I didn't see Ugly Ella's dodge, but I recognized a few of his inferno dogs. That explains all those warlings. That's four. And Victor Nutgrass, he procured the tanks. 
And of course, our buddy Morty Flint. We never did show him our titties. Nobody deserves to see our treasures except for Stephen, Chazzy said. And me, Sabina said softly. She continued to crunch on her almonds. Stephen suddenly felt hungry. Hit me with some jerky. Chazzy tossed him a package. You get Prue's boobies, me amiga, but not mine. Ah, lesbian love. Ain't it beautiful? Easy on us, sister, Prue said quietly. So that's six dragon lords left for us to deal with. I don't think any foreigners were there. Stephen thought of a dragon he'd seen hitchhiking, the one with the tattoo on his neck. He still hadn't told Uchiko that her old teacher was making his way east. They lapsed into silence. The only sound was Sabina chewing. Chazzy gave the Latina a sharp look. Girlfriend likes her almonds. I do, Sabina smiled, unashamed. Aria threw up her hands. Enough. Stephen, the Holy Grail can wait another few months. He's been hidden for millennia. There is no rush there. We have more important problems. Stephen chewed down the jerky. He cracked open a bottle of water and washed it down. Eve Downfire asked who Tessa wanted to be. I've been asking myself the same question. Who do I want to be? He let that sink in. Then he said, I'm not in this for primacies. I don't want to be a dragon lord in the end. I want to free this world, dragons and humans alike, from the Zotharic. Nobody better use the word savior, not around me. Don't worry, Prue said, giving him a long look. There was love there. I was thinking more of Messiah. No, not that either. I'm just heads down working on the next thing that might help us. We need the Holy Grail, and it should be in that lake in Maine between the Cross of Rock and the Cold Ocean. The real question is if our allies can hold Kansas. Sounders, Chazzy said abruptly. Damn it. But in all that snow, I couldn't tell if Juice Juice was there or not. But all those morphlings we shot down in the convenience store were Juice's bears, boars, and wolves. No one replied. Aria and Stephen locked eyes. The Indian woman's face softened. We will follow your lead. Yet we know so little about the Holy Grail. She's certainly not wrong, Prue said. That tiger boy was probably a dragon knight since he could do animus chain. What if the last of the Dragon Knights get the Holy Grail before we do? Stephen didn't think that was a possibility. From what the Elf Queen said, the Holy Grail has to be found by Merlin's daughter and the Lost Son. But I don't know for sure. He stood. I don't want to turn back. We have to trust that Javier, Saavedra, Imogene, and Eve Downfire can hold our eastern border. We'll continue east tomorrow morning. The highway should be open by that time. He checked for Uchiko, but she was gone. Chazzy yawned, then Prue, then Sabina. The hat shit is contagious, Chazzy stretched. I'll grab us some pillows. This Walmart has every little thing we need. As the brains of this operation, I volunteer other people to take watch. Prue and I need to sleep. Tessa and I can set up wards, Stephen said. I'll need some animus, but that shouldn't be a problem. He was worried about the fighting in Kansas, but he had to follow his gut. Every part of him wanted to continue the quest. He left the women to wind his way up to the front. The wind whistled loudly and snowflakes beat at the front doors. He found Uchiko at the cash registers. She was tracing a claw around the very human technology. When she saw him, she stiffened. It's okay, Uchiko. It's only me. She half smiled with the human part of her face. You will never just be an only, Stephen. She paused. The humans who work here probably think their lives are so tedious. Yet, I would trade everything to have their simple existence. I'm still haunted. Stephen drew near. By what? Peach cobbler. Uchiko grinned, then looked away. I would make it for Mathal during our time taking care of him in Montana. It was excellent. When I smelled the peaches Chazzy and Prue were eating, I couldn't stay. Your peach cobbler is outstanding. Stephen took her in his arms. Then he told her about his vision about the tattooed dragon soul. She melted in his arms. Seeing Niwashi again would be difficult. He made me, and I failed him. He knows my shame more than anyone. 
In the end, you finished the task he gave you, Uchiko. Rahab is dead. We couldn't have gotten to him without you and the Onori guard. Uchiko let out a single sob, but she took hold of her strength. Are you any closer to finding a cure for me and my friends? I am, Stephen said. Flesh Forge is the last spell we need, I think. We hope that working with you will tell us more about the dragon skin rituals. That is my hope as well, she leaned back. Kiss me, then take me. You need the animus, and I need your touch, and your love. You have both, Stephen said. Always. She unzipped her juicy jacket and let it slip off her shoulders. One breast was perfect on her chest, while the other was smooth scales. He cupped her soft mound. They kissed until Uchiko couldn't wait. She swept down her pants and offered herself to him. He took her from behind while she gripped the cashier's counter. He had to smile. Most likely, they weren't the first people to have sex in the Walmart. Humans didn't see sex like dragons, but they were still horny apes. The animus felt good when he finally erupted inside her. Uchiko agreed to take the first watch while Steven went to find Tessa, Mouse, and Zoe. All three were sleeping in the little camp the twins had created for them in the camping section. The Wayne twins had set up beds for everyone, which was very thoughtful. Maybe his stern talk had gotten to them. Doubtful, but a boy could dream. Chapter 14 Tessa was wide awake. She lay in her sleeping bag and listened to Stephen and the other women sleep. Out of all of them, only Arya snored, though she insisted she didn't. In spite of her protests, there had been many a night when Tessa had to lightly push the Indian woman to get her to stop sawing logs. On some nights, it required a shove. Arya, though, wasn't the problem. Tessa's mind simply wouldn't shut off. She didn't want to wake up anyone, so she tried masturbating quietly, but even after an orgasm, her brain continued to chirp at her. Well, she might as well get up and relieve Uchiko. Tessa walked up to the front. Trying on all the different clothes with Zoe and Mouse had been fun, and it was easy to forget her mistake with the brown dragon. He had a name, Alonzo Max Sterling, but then again, he was simply another dragon lord who'd fallen. It had been a mistake to kill him, and yet, she had a hard time feeling bad about it. He had attacked them. If their positions had been reversed, Sterling would have killed them all if given the chance. Then she went through the other side of the argument. What if Big Brown had turned on his allies? They could have learned the names of the Dragon Knights still alive in the U.S. Yeah, but his animus had felt so good when it hit her. At the front, the ninja was nowhere to be seen. Of course not. She knew how to hide in the shadows. Uchiko? Tessa called out quietly. Movement, and then she appeared. Yes, Tessa, is there anything wrong? I can't sleep. Why don't you get some sack time and I'll watch the doors? Thank you, the quiet woman said. I will rest, and thank you for trying to help me. Tessa embraced the ninja before she could retreat. It's my pleasure. Hugging Uchiko was like trying to pet a pissed-off cat. The ninja left after a stiff, awkward moment. The barista had to laugh a little. Then she found cigarettes locked in a glass case. Could she use magic to open it? She wasn't sure. She touched the lock on the glass doors and whispered, Encanto. After enchanting the mechanism, she was able to open the case. She grabbed a pack of Lamac lights and a lighter and went to the front. No use getting the owner all upset about smoking inside the store. It was around four in the morning, and the blizzard was gone, the sky clearing. Stars shined on several feet of snow. Their vehicles were pretty much buried. In the distance, the plows were hard at work, clearing the streets. Tessa shook out a cigarette and lit it. She hadn't smoked in a while, although she loved it. Damn things, they were completely addictive. She'd done a fair job of managing her addiction, but she found it hard to quit completely. Maybe she could control her dragon-slaying desires in a similar way. She hoped so, yet she'd lost control during the fight. Tessa stood near the cracked door and held the cigarette outside. Ha! Huh. It was like she was a teenager again, smoking out of the window of her room, trying to hide it from her mom. 
How stupid. It had never worked, and the minute you used air freshener, you were busted. Nevertheless, when the demon nicotine called, you answered. Surprise, surprise, Mouse crept up. She was in a long flannel nightgown, totally homemaker material, with fuzzy Elmo slippers on her feet. She didn't look like the fearless warrior she was, but then again, Mouse didn't like to fight. That didn't mean she wasn't wickedly good at it, and she'd be quick to remind anyone of that. The blonde's eyes were sleepy, and if there was one thing Mouse loved, it was sleep. She stuck out a hand. You got up and I got worried. I know, I know, being me is such a pain. I'm a mean skank until I'm not. Hit me with a cancer stick, baby. Tessa offered the slim woman a smoke. Mouse lit up. Oh, yeah. I forgot one of the perks of being magical creature. We don't get cancer. You can, Tessa, being human and all. You shouldn't do it. If we lost you? Her voice faded away. We can't lose you. Not until after we find the Holy Grail? Tessa stared off into the early morning. No, T. Not ever. Mouse moved close to exhale out the door. It's not just your magic. You glue us together. The things you can do. And not the sex, but who you are. I get jealous of you all the time. Me? Why? Mouse held her smoke and shivered. Ugh, it's fucking cold. And yet here you are, being polite and not smoking up Mr. Owner's business. See? You are so fucking... Kind. She crinkled her nose. No, that's not right. You're more than kind. You draw people to you and you make them feel welcome and at home. Even the Texas Chainsaw bitches. Machine gun twins, Tessa raised her eyebrows. Even them. And they don't much want to belong. Mouse inhaled smoke and breathed it out. Hey, look, I'm a dragon. Tessa breathed out a little laugh. Chazzy and Prue need to belong. They know that. Stephen isn't going to tolerate much drama. Mouse nodded. Yeah, he's too busy trying to take over the world. Save the world, you mean? Tessa thought of Jared and what they might do to cure him. If they were successful, though, word would spread. It would jeopardize the great dragon soul secret that had been kept from the humans for 50,000 years. It'll be better once Stephen marries us, Mouse said. Tessa went silent. Her heart beat faster, and it wasn't from the nicotine. That scares you, doesn't it? Mouse asked gently. Tessa so wanted to say it didn't. The words weren't there, though. All she could do was stand there and smoke. Does it scare you? The barista finally asked the blonde. Mouse showed the barista her left hand. No, I was married before, chained body and soul to Rehagen Malk. I know what it entails, and yet with Stephen I want the connection. It's weird for me, because I know the power of it. There's this link that goes beyond what you'll ever feel. It's a safe feeling. And yeah, it can be scary, but where would we be without him? That was the truth of it, Tessa knew. Without Stephen, she'd still be at the coffee clutch, working and living with a roommate, making love to men and women without a care in the world, until on sleepless nights, she'd wonder what it all meant. Is it because you won't be able to sleep with other guys? Mouse asked. Tessa thought long and hard. No. Not to say I haven't thought about that, but with Stephen's uncountable number of wives, getting new people to sleep with will never be a problem. I like men, don't get me wrong, but that's not where I go. Mouse was quiet. Then she rolled her eyes. This is the part of the conversation where you tell me where you go. For the love of biscuits, don't make me be nosy. Tessa searched her feelings. Why was she reticent about the whole marriage thing? She wasn't sure. She simply bristled at the idea of being owned. Zoe wanted that. It was a part of her, but not Tessa. Mouse saw the truth. You don't know. That's cool. I think Stephen is a little shy about the matter as well. If it were up to him, he wouldn't do it at all, even though it will make us stronger, and we need to be strong. Wouldn't you agree? Tessa had smoked her Lamac down to the filter. Instead of flicking it outside like a bad smoker, 
She put it on a little ledge to throw away later. She lit another. I have a poly friend that says marriage is all boredom and commitment and staying when you want to leave. She thinks it's a trap. I'm not sure I believe that. I'm not sure what I believe. Mouse squinted. Boredom. Tessa, T, my girl, have you been bored in the past year? Do you think you'll be bored in the next ten years? We're going off-world eventually. We're going to be going on these goddamn adventures for the foreseeable future. With Stephen, there is no boring. And you said it yourself. Getting a little strange will never be a problem. And not to pressure you, but it's going to be weird if we all marry him and you don't. Tessa laughed. No pressure there. Is divorce a thing among dragons? She then caught herself. She'd been there when they'd magicked the ring off Mouse's finger, ending her relationship with Rehagen Mulk. Yes, I can get out of it at any time. I can be free. I've been free and I've been trapped, and I had a choice whether to join you or walk away, and I chose to be with you guys. Mouse's eyes filled with tears and she waved a hand in front of her face. I've never been happier. Freedom sounds great, but there's nothing like home. Marriage and family create homes. Tessa opened her mouth to protest. Mouse stopped her. Yes, I know what your poly friend would say. People can create families of polyamorous lovers that are as good or better than traditional marriages. Don't go there. This is about us. Be honest with yourself. Can you imagine your life without us? Mouse took Tessa's hand. Don't answer that. I'm going to hug you, then I'm going back to bed. For me, and this is only for me, I can't imagine us without you. What was that derpy thing that Zoe said on Christmas Eve? Tessa remembered instantly. I can be, but I'm glad we're a we. Mouse hugged the barista. I don't think we can be a we without you. She left Tessa standing there with a whole lot to think about. Well, sleep was officially off the agenda. She decided to grab the Dragon Knight book and do more reading. If anything would put her to sleep, it would be the list of begats of Dragon Soul lineage all the way back to Rahab, Mathal, and Icharam. She made the decision to skip ahead. She was glad she did. Chapter 15 Mordred touched the wall, triggering the Enchantrix spell he'd put on the roof of his Gallo Island Airy. The ceiling shuddered and then disappeared, letting him see the night sky. The rain had stopped. The air was heavy with a wet chill that was nothing new for the Dragon Knight. He'd grown up in Cumberland on the Irish Sea. That damp cold never could penetrate his skin. And he wore his American coat, a long duster made from oilcloth lined with seal fur. The entire top floor of the Galu Island's former lifeboat station had been converted into a single rambling room. It was his study, his laboratory, at times his bedroom. Tables, chairs, bookcases, and counters all held his books, his experiments, his texts, and his magic items. Fires burned on either side of the room. From the outside, the manor looked like a tumble of decaying bricks, a dilapidated structure ready to break apart at any minute. Inside were luxuries and comfort. It was a good enough metaphor for Mordred himself. Onlookers saw an affable dragon lord, not very ambitious, but strong. Inside, it was a different matter altogether. The island lay six miles west of New York mainland and five miles southwest of Canada. Mordred liked his privacy, as he wasn't forced to put on his party smile for the people. Umbra sat on his bed next to the fireplace on the far side of the room. She waited for him with a quilt wrapped around her. Half covered, her dark skin tempted him to postpone his business. Her staff stood against the wall. Mordred was very familiar with her face, that strong ink and blood showing, although she'd left Cuzco right at the beginning of the Empire. She'd worked for Mordred, Lancelot, and Bedivere for a long time, the three dragon knights didn't mind sharing her, just as she didn't mind being shared. Yes, it was against the norms of dragon soul culture, but Mordred had transcended such petty ideas as marriage, family, and rules. He hadn't cared, and neither had Bedivere nor Lancelot. 
Umbra had swept over Bedivere at first. Then she sought out Mordred. A knock sounded through the room. That would be Zuzana with his allies. Yes, bring them in. Mordred gripped the angel knife in his right hand, hidden in his coat. Umbra on the bed was on high alert. She knew what was coming. The old woman shuffled in behind Candler and Helga. The latter was unharmed, but the former had a layer of pink burns covering his head and face. The cura spells had fixed most of the damage, but those burns had marked the fat man. Stephen Dracaris's dragon fire might have destroyed the man's looks, but it had left his appetite intact. Pizza grease marked Candler's lips. Powdered sugar dotted his dark suit. Helga scowled. It's suicide, Morty. Fucking suicide. Uh, sorry. Not Morty. Mordred. Anyway, that woman, that witch, that bitch, she took out three tanks by herself and then fucking flew up to fight us in the air. I ain't never seen anything like it. Then some big white dickhead of a dragon hurt Candler something awful. We tried to fight them, but they're too strong. Is Dracarys alive? Mordred was used to pretending he knew far less than he did. We don't know, Candler said. It wasn't a black male, but white, but that might have been the snow. We couldn't see as much as we wanted. Tessa Ross is alive, though, and the Wayne twins are as well. Helga took over. It seems a lot of his wives survived whatever happened in Wyoming. But no sign of Stephen, Mordred said to close that conversation. He knew the rest. Then he was in contact with Bob Staines, who had U.S. satellites on the region, tracking the three vehicles. As long as they continued east, Mordred could relax for a bit. If they turned south to take on Ugly Ellis, his inferno dogs, the Gree Gree and the Sounders, then Mordred might have to rethink his tactics. We're sorry, Candler said. We tried, but we figured it was better to run than die there. I mean, it was only his women. Only his women. Mordred repeated. How little did these fools know? It wasn't the women, it was that one witch, Helga complained. Do you two still want to help me? Morty asked. Or has the game gotten too rough for you? Now don't get me wrong, I appreciate your willingness to go along with my plans, but I don't want you to feel obligated. Helga glanced at Candler. Well, we don't want to go Ronin, if that's what you mean. Yeah, we retreated, but we want to keep on helping you. Candler nodded his pink burned head. The fat on his neck wobbled. Yeah, but I was thinking maybe you could help me with the burns. He motioned to his head. Mordred walked up. He kept his hands in his pockets. Candler was clueless. He looked eager to be healed. Helga, though, kept his eyes on the dragon knight. Mordred removed his left hand and touched the fat man's scalp. The dragon knight closed his eyes, felt the cells and scar tissue, and then felt the animus spinning in Candler's core. Matter and energy, two sides of the same coin. He adjusted the skin, bringing it back, but didn't stop. He grew the hair until Candler was whole again and in need of a haircut. Candler grinned. Thanks, my prime. Mordred touched the fat man's face. Yes, yes. It's the least I can do. Helga glanced at Zuzana, who stood to the right by the fireplace, motionless. If you can fix the burns, why don't you help out that old lady? You could make her young again, couldn't you? Time is our ultimate enemy, Mordred said. Her cells decay, and yet I do what I can to take away her pains. She is only human. Why keep her around anyway? Helga asked. Mordred turned on him and told him a fairy tale. I trust, Zuzana. I will mourn her when she finally dies. I will enjoy her while she's here, but I don't want to talk about her. I want to talk about Merlin. I've been thinking about him often these days. The drama of the past is replaying itself in the present. Merlin? Like the magician? Helga walked over and sat down in an easy chair at the center of the room. Cold cuts, cheeses, wine, and whiskey lay on a coffee table. Helga grabbed the whiskey and drank a big swallow directly from the bottle. That means he was human. Very, Mordred motioned for Candler to sit. Yet Merlin went beyond what humans could do. When I met him, he was already ten thousand years old, and Guinevere must have been half that. 
To think, a human, extending her life that much. I thought Guinevere was Arthur's bitch, Helga spat. Hardly. Like in so much, the humans got it wrong. Mordred stood with his hands on his hips, thinking. Guinevere was only one of her names. When you live long enough, you collect different names. As you know, I myself currently have several, as did Merlin. He loved Guinevere for five thousand years, and both might have lived forever, if not for some very unfortunate circumstances. I assure you, both are long dead. I survived, but I will never have that much power. Merlin was the single greatest sorcerer the world has ever seen. Both Zuzana and Umbra were silent. They'd heard this story before. Zuzana told him she wanted to live as long as Guinevere, and he told her he simply didn't have the magic. Her time was running out. Perhaps with the grail, Mordred might be able to change that. It was a very nice and very unlikely dream. Candler grabbed meats and cheeses and stacked them on his thigh. The grease would stain his slacks, but it was obvious he didn't care. He started the act of shoveling the food into his mouth. Helga drank. Mordred retrieved a cigar. Do you two care for a smoke? No, we're good, Helga answered for them both. Mordred clipped off the end and then breathed out a line of fire to light the stick. He sucked the smoke into his mouth and then let it drift away. He sat down with the two men. He relaxed back and looked up at the stars. Merlin learned the initial spells easily, every skill on every branch of the skill tree. Then he spent thousands of years perfecting them. Mithal was so proud of him. The two, along with Arthur, created the Americos Chambers, the ever-seeing eyes. Bedivere, Lancelot, and I used their magic to expel Dracarys for a bit. That didn't work, Candler said stupidly with his mouth full. Good try, though. Mordred leaned forward, gripping the cigar in his hand. The angel knife weighed down his pocket. He'd get to it, eventually. That plan failed, Mordred said, which brings us to plan B. What's plan B? Candler asked between mouthfuls of ham. Do we want to know? Helga asked a bit nervously. Mordred shrugged. Perhaps not. It involves the Holy Grail. No one could find it, not for a long time, and better dragon souls than me have tried. Otter Dro and Min Lear, Arthur and Merlin. The Grail would change everything. Merlin knew that. He came the closest. That human. Mordred spit out the words, that human. And what would Merlin have done if he'd found it? That had been the question he, Bedivere, and Lancelot had obsessed over, a human with that much power. They agreed they could not let that happen. They'd left Brunor, Mordred's son, out of their secret conversations. They thought it was safer. After Mordred's grand mistake, no one was safe. Candler leaned forward. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the governor of Kansas along with the senators have agreed to start the evacuation. They're calling it an apex tornado event. That doesn't mean anything, but the local news people are using the term. Sounds bad, doesn't it? It'll scare off the skittish people and the humans who stay will either be killed or will wipe their minds. Mordred hid his annoyance. It was obvious Candler hadn't been listening. However, Mordred did like creating stories for humans to hide dragon soul events. He himself had coined the phrase Great Chicago Fire for the conflagration in 1871. Kakar Kosanovich had tried to overthrow Mordred, and their battle destroyed half the city. Candler continued. It's only a matter of time before western Kansas will be empty of a lot of people. The storm in Nebraska is helping our cause— Mordred played his part by grinning and nodding. Good thing you were the prime there for such a long time. Those are good contacts, Helga sighed. Larry, you can't just spit out information at random times. Morty here, I mean Mordred, was right in the middle of the story. Mordred gave them a casual shrug. No, I'm just an old dragon who likes to hear myself talk. I could go on for hours. The bottom line is this. No one can find the Holy Grail. 
The Dracaris child had the best chance, but he is dead. His escort will join him presently. Once ugly Ellis unleashes hell on the west, they'll be pulled into the fight and they'll be killed. The opposite was what Mordred really wanted. Let Stephen and his escort wipe out the last of the U.S. Dragon Lords. It would be less work for Mordred once the Holy Grail was under his control. Mordred liked it when he could win either way, which was why he'd orchestrated the Kansas attack in the first place. He had several endgames in place, and each one culminated in his ultimate victory. What is the Holy Grail? Helga asked. A weapon. Standing, Mordred motioned to the door. If you don't mind, gentlemen, I have a bit more work to be done. Candler and Helga stood. Candler went over and stuck out a hand. Thanks, Morty, for understanding about us having to retreat. Tiano here thought you might be mad. Yeah, I did. Helga took a step toward the door, keeping some space between him and Mordred. Candler smiled. You handle it well, though, Morty? My name is Mordred. The dragon knight whipped the dagger out of his pocket and rammed it into the gut of the fat man. Bull fuck is this shit? Helga ripped out of his clothes. Ion claws tipped his hands as he turned into his partial form, but only for a second. Umbra, blurry with speed, struck his left knee with her staff, blowing the joint to bits. The ends of the stick glowed orange, and when she spun it, she left trails of light around her. Helga shuddered and went down onto his remaining leg. She then struck his head, nearly knocking his skull off his spine. He collapsed forward, head bashed in, neck nerves severed. Mordred pushed his face into Candler's. Blood dribbled from the fat man's lips. You might never have betrayed me, Larry, but Helga would have eventually. Besides, your animus will serve me far better than your incompetence. But we ate together. We were friends. The light was going out in Candler's eyes as his animus poured into the dagger. No, Mordred hissed. Never friends. You were never worthy. I had twelve friends at one time. Now I only have one. For the time being. Candler died with food on his lips. A fitting end. Umbra wrapped the angel knife in a black piece of silk and took it from Mordred. She laid it carefully on a table where two black candles gleamed. The third candle was out, but soon, soon its light would flicker as well. Zuzana came away from the fireplace. I will have our vassals clean up the mess. We can throw away the carpet. Yes. Yes, you can, Mordred agreed. The naked Umbra came up to him and slipped her small arms around him. If your business is done for the night, I wish to be your pleasure. Mordred laughed and crushed the slim woman to him. Of course, Umbra, of course. Can I watch? Zuzana asked. The answer was yes. The corpses could wait. Mordred pushed Umbra to the bed where she spread her legs. He threw his coat down and shoved his pants off, but didn't bother to take off his shirt or socks. The Incan woman knew what he liked, and he wouldn't last long. Then he could get back to work. So much to do. So many variables. The old woman watched from the shadows, her cold eyes twinkling like the frigid stars above. Chapter 16 That morning in Kearney, the Nebraska Department of Transportation opened the highway. Stephen and his escort raced away, heading east. While they traveled, they searched for the possible location of the lake Stephen had seen in his vision in the Bali Waterfall Temple. He and Sabina both cast Divinatio spells, and both were given the hint the Elf Queen had given him in the vision. The cross of rock to the west, the cold ocean to the east— in the land of the songbird, Captain Black. Tessa googled black-capped songbirds, and that gave them their best clue. The black-capped chickadee was Maine's state bird. Stephen had seen a lot of trees around the lake, so that made sense. Maine had two nicknames that mentioned either pine trees or lumber. Twenty-six hours from Kearney, Nebraska to Portland, Maine— they drove it straight through, pretending to be nine simple humans on the road in three cars. They took turns driving, sleeping, 
listening to music, eating road food, and taking in the scenery. When I-80 jogged around in the Chicago area to become I-90, Stephen considered reaching out to Morty Flint, but it didn't feel right. He didn't want any Dragon Lord treachery to get in his way. And now that they were on the move, he wanted to keep it that way. Stephen was amazed at how quickly they fell into the rhythm of it all. The jokes, the songs, the camaraderie. Uchiko had to ditch her motorcycle in Nebraska, but she bought a new one in Omaha. She buzzed ahead, or lingered behind, keeping all three vehicles in view. It was like a sheepdog shepherding them to stay together. In Portland, they asked around about a certain lake below a cross of rock. A gas station attendant suggested they go to the town of Barlow, which was off U.S. Route 1 between Waldeboro and Warren. There was a local historian named Callahan Glick who might help them find their lake. And he wasn't just a local guy. He also owned the local eatery, Glick's Diner, which had a few rustic cabins behind it. The waitress had to push four tables together, and they had to call in an additional cook and an additional waitress to bring them all the food. Stephen ate three seafood platters to himself, the fish as greasy as the fries. They were noisy, of course. Chazzy and Prue ate burgers and insisted that Maine beef couldn't hold a candle to Texas beef. Zoe sighed over the menu. Glicks didn't exactly cater to people who wanted to eat healthy— she ordered the cob salad, vinegar and oil dressing on the side. She also ordered a hamburger, minus the bun, extra tomatoes and lettuce. Uchiko mentioned she'd like a chicken sandwich and onion rings, but she'd wait outside. Stephen ordered something to go, and she ate, leaning up against her bike, a Harley Davidson Heritage Classic Softail, black. She'd bought new black leathers to go with it. Once Stephen sat back down, chewing on a long strip of fried cod, Cal Glick came over. He was a big, red-faced man with square glasses, huge frames, and a big black beard. That and his hair were streaked with gray. His white apron was stained and greasy. His phone was, too. When Stephen asked him about a lake under a cross of rock, he knew exactly where to send them. He put out his hand. There's North Pond, South Pond, and still farther south, there's Lyra Lake, under a small ridge. It's privately owned. Tessa blinked. That name meant something to her. Prue caught Stephen's eyes, and she raised her eyebrows. You wouldn't happen to know the owners, would you? Tessa asked. Glick grinned at her, and then he had to smile at all the women. Well, now, aren't you all something? You models? My sister certainly did some nude modeling, Prue said. Oh, that wasn't nothing. Chazzy dragged a fry through ketchup. Just a frat boy pretending to be an artist. It wasn't official or anything, but it was fun and I got paid, so yeah, professional model right here, so y'all better treat me with respect. Her eyes twinkled at her joke. I modeled in Mexico City, Sabina gestured to her face. My eyes had color back then. No modeling for Zoe and me, Mouse said. We were too busy being fabulous to care what we looked like. All eyes went to Aria. Yes, she exhaled. London, Paris, Milan, Mumbai, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, Sydney. Yes, you modeled, Tessa, did you not? Tessa colored. It was a, a video with friends for a little money. It was more... She winced. Amateur. Next question, please. Glick chuckled. I can guess what that means. He turned on Stephen. What about you, Junior? Stephen gestured to his escort. I've been told I have a cute butt. Does that count? He does have a cute butt, Zoe said a little too loudly. Glick's eyes went around the table again. You are all quite the party. As for the owner of the lake, he's a local rich guy. Chosen Ben Tozier, and I could probably find a number for him, though don't ask me for Stephen King's contact info. Where's Castle Rock? Tessa asked with a smile lighting her face. On Hulu, Glick said. We get that all the time, and no, there's no dairy and no Salem's lot neither. Guy brings in tourists, I'll give him that, he smiled widely. And hey, if y'all want to stay over and eat more of my good food, I got three cabins in back. I'd rent them to you cheap. Someone called out to him. 
Glick was called into the kitchen to mess with the fryer. When the owner was gone, Stephen sat back. He caught Arya's eye. We're not going to contact Chosen Ben. If we're quick, we're in and out before Ben knows we're here. In and out? Chazzy asked. Is that still on your mind? I thought one of us took care of you only a few hours ago. Lucky Jeeves has tinted windows, or we could have gotten arrested. Prue pinched her nose. Okay, Chaz, an in and out joke? You're certainly tired. We're all certainly tired. I'll let that one pass for now. You're sweet, Chazzy cooed. Aria brought them back on track. We can find a place to park the cars off the road, then we can fly in. I agree, while Ben is seeking an alliance, let's secure the Holy Grail. Then we can meet with him. We might need his vassals for the battle in Kansas. Sabina murmured. Javier is leading our forces. He is trying to keep the enemy Dragon Lords east of US-283, but there is a lot of ground to cover. But it's clear what ugly Ellis wants. He's cleared out the western part of the state. He knows there will be a great deal of fighting. Stephen sat, stewing. He should be there, and yet he couldn't fight every battle, no matter how much he wanted to. Skylar is flying in reinforcements from Australia, Liam and the Five Widows. We also have other Australian vassals that want to help. Along with the PNW Warlings, they might be able to hold central Kansas. Or, that's our hope, anyway. Javier has been reaching out to me. This isn't his first war. It's not Saavedra's, either. They just need to buy us some time. Tessa cleared a space in front of her, moving dirty dishes so she could put the Dragon Knight book down. So, reading about Otter Dro and Min Lear was getting wicked boring. It went into extreme detail about their children and blah blah blah. I skipped ahead. Get this. Merlin had a wife, Guinevere, and it was true love forever. Like five thousand years of forever. She paused. Wow. Five thousand years, married. How do you keep the spark alive? I could, Sabina said quietly. All it takes is a little imagination. Tessa went on. So, this Holy Grail, it's somehow tied to the Lyra, which is like liar, only with a short eye. Bira? So, it's not the musical instrument. And yeah, Lyra Lake. Coincidence? I think not. Anyway, the book refers to them as a people, as in the grand tradition of the Lyra come to Earth, to visit grace upon the Alfarian exiles, something like that. The Lyra and the Alfaros are tied to the Grail, Part of me wonders if the Lyra weren't space aliens bringing their dragon buddies weapons. Prue pursed her lips and thought. The Lyra is the eagle door on the St. Vrain Airy. Bam. This, Chazzy, is why we can't be gazing off into space and thinking about nail polish. Every little scrap of information might mean the difference between life and death. Chazzy rolled her eyes. Prue is right. My father made some notations in the grimoires. Tell us more about the Holy Grail. Stephen said to Tessa. She flipped through some pages and read. A gift for dragon souls, the death of shadows hidden away in fear, hidden away lest treachery retrieve it, hidden away until the day comes when the blood of the Alferos, poured from the chalice of time and space, will wash clean the unholy. She tapped her finger. That mention of chalice, that's where we came up with the Holy Grail. Humans took the Christian angle, but it definitely has something to do with our three bad boys, Rahab, Mathal, and Icharam. I hate asshole writers who use long sentences, Mouse said, grimacing. Zoe looked at her, then at Tessa. The blood of the Alferos? Maybe it could be some special powers, like another path. Maybe, Tessa said. Technically, we're the blood of the Alferos, Stephen murmured. We all have some dragon in us, even the more human among us. Tessa, Zoe, and Sabina nodded. The rest of his escort were full dragon souls. The barista squealed. This is so exciting. We're on the hunt for this rare lost artifact. Oh my gosh, I love this so much. Stephen liked how Tessa was back in the moment, enjoying the adventure. She'd been a little dark lately, but now she seemed her old self again. She sobered. Okay, but on a more serious note, Merlin was close to finding it, and it was only because of the Elf Queen. Remember her? She gave them the torch to light their way, and she led them to that lake. Guess what the book calls her? Prue had gotten out her fingernail file to smooth the nail. Easy one, T. The Lady of the Lake. 
It seems to me she was the Lyra, which means the Lyra are probably elves. Boom. And you're welcome. Tessa's eyes lit up. Yes, that makes sense, because in Stephen's vision, she said the darkness would come again, which was another Zotheric invasion. Sure, sure, sure. And she mentioned love, Stephen said. Arthur and Merlin would find the Holy Grail if they were worthy and if their love was strong. The two made a big joke of it. They were friends, that was clear. Keep going, Tessa, Arya said. We need to be off, but I think you were headed toward a definite climax. Ha, huh, Chazzy erupted. I ain't gonna make the joke, since sister here didn't like that last one. But, ha, huh, climax. Prue shook her head and continued to work on her nails. Yeah, Arya, but this climax isn't like the happy ones we all like. She cleared her throat. Remember Merlin's OTP? What the balls is that? Mouse asked. One true pairing, Zoe explained. That's what the human teens are calling it nowadays. And twenty-somethings, Tessa protested. Well, Merlin's bay, Guinevere, was killed by who, it's not clear. But the book said the murder took place in Camlan. If you remember your Arthurian myths, the Battle of Camlan was where Arthur died. We think it was like today's Cumbria, and that's the old Westmoreland and Cumberland. Oh, wait, that reminds me of the song. What song? Mouse asked and blew out some annoyed air. I know you wanted me to ask. Tessa smiled. The widow of Westmoreland's daughter? She searched their faces. No one had a clue what she was talking about. That was clear. The barista raised her eyebrows. Yeah, okay, sure, you guys have great music taste. Like Stephen here and his five-finger death punch covers, whatever. Anyway, someone murdered Guinevere. Merlin had been close to finding the grail, but that changed his priorities. He died soon after. Then Arthur. But the book gets totally vague at this point. It's all, some say the shadows consumed Guinevere, then Arthur, and it drove Merlin mad and he killed himself. Some say Morgana Le Fay slew all three. Then, of course, there's the classic theory where Arthur got caught screwing sweet Guinevere, our man Merlin found out, and then it was a Shakespearean bloodbath. Step aside, Lancelot, there's a new cheater in town. Basically, no one knows what happened. Any mention of the Dragon Slayer? Stephen asked carefully. Tessa swallowed and dropped her eyes. Yeah, she might have killed Guinevere as well. She definitely killed the Dragon Knights. The book gets very specific here. You want the list? Mouse interjected. No, God, no, please, no, just no. I'll look later, Prue said to the barista. Just give us the highlights. Deal. Here's the big three and one surprise. Tessa raised a hand and opened fingers as she recited the names. The Dragon Slayer killed Sir Gawain, Sir Percival, and Sir Galahad, who supposedly found the Grail. But nope, sorry. And then there's Sir Brunor, and we know he wasn't killed. I didn't recognize the names of these other knights, so yeah, not sure. However, the description of the Dragon Slayer is all the same. She was human, wore the mask of a woman, and wielded a flaming sword. That all checks out. What color flames? Mouse asked, and this time her voice wasn't sarcastic, but a wee bit worried. Tessa looked up. Green flames? Fuck that book. Chazzy said. No mention of Lancelot, and now they're stealing Mouse's sword for a little color. Kinda weird that I have the sword that killed so many dragons, Mouse murmured. No mention of either Bedivere or Mordred, Stephen said. Bedivere lived until Tessa put him down. Maybe Mordred did as well. He was the villain in the human stories. Arya knocked on the table. We do not have time for stories. Even as we speak, we have dragons fighting in Kansas. I think we will learn more in time. I am concerned about one thing, however. There is no mention of me. I am the thirteenth knight, am I not? A mischievous smile curved her lips. Come on, thirteen. Let's go see what's at the bottom of this lake, Stephen said. They rose, found a place to park their vehicles, and then took off in the spring sunshine. It was so much more humid than in Colorado, and Stephen had to adjust his wings. He carried Zoe, while Arya let Tessa ride on her back. Prue, still trying to be a team player, agreed to give Uchiko a lift. The trees below swayed in a warm breeze, miles of pine trees. 
The forests in Colorado weren't nearly as dense. A ridge rose in the distance, and beyond that was the iron gray of the ocean stretching to the horizon. The trees smelled good in the sunlight, their dust hanging around them as the sun burned away the mist. Stephen liked the weight of Zoe on his back. She held him lightly, trusting his skill. The South Pond to the north had an RV park and vacation homes, but Lyra Lake had none of that. It seemed as pristine as the day Arthur, Merlin, and the other dragon knights met the Lady of the Lake there, the Elf Queen, who seemed to have ties back to the Alpharos. They flew over the ridge and Stephen saw the cross of rock. This was the lake, all right. It seemed sinister, however. Why hadn't people built houses around it? And if Chosen Ben Tozier owned it, maybe he knew about its secrets. Maybe Chosen Ben wasn't as friendly as he first appeared. Chapter 17 Stephen drifted down with his escort of dragons and their riders until they landed on the eastern shore of Lyra Lake on a strip of open field among the tall pines. While the trees had grown taller, the cross of rock was still visible. And if you stopped and listened, the sound of the ocean could faintly be heard to the east. This was the right place, all right. Chazzy stuck a pink claw in the water, then shivered her wings. That shit is cold. I vote that Prue and I keep watch. Prue's grin was full of relief and sparkle. Oh, thank goodness. Chaz, you are a genius. Yes, us girls will stay up top. Aria turned into her partial form, clutching the belt holding her animus daggers. The scent of cinnamon swirled around her. Tessa sighed. I used to buy cinnamon toothpicks from a boy in middle school. I liked the boy, hated my life, and Aria's smell reminds me of that. Now I like my life and love my boy. She gave Stephen a happy grin. Stephen turned to his escort. Okay, so the Wayne twins are staying. Who else wants to go? Mouse was barefoot in her human form. She tested the water with a dainty foot. Oof, I'm little. Not a lot of body fat. That water just might kill me. On the other hand, there was Zoe, a huge bear, paddling out across the water. Her eyes showed her happiness. Doesn't seem to bother her, Tessa said. Sabina's dark forest green scales matched the pines. Her sage and lavender scent fit her so perfectly. Zoe is thick, with a capital C, thick body and thick fur, but I'll join you, mi amor. It's why I went through the rituals. Aria went and put a hand on the Latina dragon. We are happy to have you, but remember we can hold our breath a long time, yet we still need to breathe. While in our altered forms, the cold will be less intense. However, it can chill our extremities. Flex your hands and work your toes to keep the blood flowing. Sabina nodded her great head and curled her claws into fists. I will be fine. I'm tougher than these other girls. Obviously. She blew twin flames out of her nostrils. Her eyes gleamed from a divination spell. That was a dig at us. Mouse made a face. What do you think of that, twins? Chazzy giggled. I shouldn't like it that you and Tessa call us twins, but I do. Mouse, we've learned to let people do all the trash talking they want. It's easy when you are as awesome as we are. And we won't be the wet ones, Prue added. Chazzy blinked her big dragon eyes. See, I am not making the required wet joke. I am very serious and I'm a team player. Go along to get along, that's my motto. More fire from Sabina's nose as she laughed. She was practicing her inferno exhalant, but she hadn't gotten it right yet. Tessa had been quiet. She stood at the water's edge, her boots muddy. Defensio, a pink shield, covered her, hugging her clothes, not even an inch from her hair. Come on, guys, I won't have the animus or the air to last long. As she walked into the water, the skin-tight force field kept her dry. She dove into the water and swam down into the depths. Zoe followed her with a slap of her back paws and a spray of droplets. Sabina went next, slipping off the bank. Aria followed her. Stephen traipsed into Lyra Lake and sank into its frigid waters. It was cold on his scales, but his inner fire warmed him. Was this how space travel would feel? And Aria was right. They did need to breathe and there wasn't any oxygen in space. The lake was murky, muddy, and completely unpleasant. 
Down farther, the emeralds of Sabina's eyes cut through the brown swirl. The pink outline of Tessa's skin-tight shield spell was brighter. Arya activated her animus daggers and provided additional light. They had to pause to adjust the pressure on their ears, even Zoe, who had drifted close to Stephen. Fifty feet down, at the center of Lyra Lake, they found the ruins. Huge, twenty-foot-tall square monoliths, twelve of them, surrounded two ten-foot-tall statues. It was an echo of both the Americos chambers as well as the Dragon Knight Cave on the Oregon coast. Tessa swam about the two central statues, her pink light shining on their faces. Arya joined her, keeping her animus daggers raised. Zoe circled them on the outside of the monoliths, keeping watch while Stephen and Sabina floated over the strange underwater temple. One of the statues was familiar, the elf queen they'd seen before. The other was a homo draconis, tall and proud, with a nobility to him. Unlike the elf, who had been chiseled out of granite, the dragon man had been fashioned out of a polished black stone. Both statues had their hands out in front of them, as if they were gripping swords. Tessa used a bit of her waning energy to cast a divination spell. Hey, I have to be careful not to run out of air, and if my animus gets low, you might need to give me refill. You up for that? I am, he sent back. I think the statues want to hold Arya's daggers. Heck yes. It's a good thing we knew the torch could be split into two knife hilts, or we'd be scratching our butts here. Tessa motioned for Arya. The Indian woman knew what she had to do. She swam around to the statue that was more dragon than man, and set one of the daggers into his hands. The knife erupted with flames. The writhing orange fire boiled the water upward. Stephen swam over and felt the warm water cut through the chill and enjoyed it for a minute. Yet he kept his eyes peeled. Arya set the second dagger into the fist of the elf queen. Again, the knife flashed fire into existence. Bubbles rose in columns. Stephen was reminded of video footage he'd seen of underwater volcanoes. It had that same vicious reaction. Fire leapt from the top of one of the monoliths, then another, until all twelve columns had flames bubbling over them. It was beautiful, ghostly, to see that much light and bubbles and fire at the bottom of the lake. Stephen instinctively knew what was coming. Flames rippled to life at the top of each monolith. The lake erupted in bubbles rising above them. The ground underneath trembled as a circle of something rose from the mud. No, it was a pocket of air, rising to the surface. When the line of air rose to catch her, Tessa fell to the mud of the lake and sank up to her knees. Arya followed her. Both glanced around, eyes wide. The pocket of air rose to the level of the flaming daggers. The flames turned into crackling knives of electricity, spitting and crackling, lighting everything up like it was daylight. The water level rose until there was a perfect dome of oxygen surrounding the monoliths. The flames at the top of the monoliths winked off. Zoe swam low and came out of the wall of water to walk down on the ground, but she hadn't taken two steps before her huge body sank to her belly in the muck. Stephen turned into his partial form and swam down, between two monoliths. It was an odd feeling, reaching through the water and feeling air. He paused. This didn't feel right. Sabina didn't stop. She left the water and wiggled through the dome until she too was up to her green-scaled knees in the mud. The crackling of the lightning daggers made them all squint. Stephen pushed his way out of the water to drop down on a monolith to cling there. Wow. Talk about magic. This is crazy, Tessa gasped. And I bet you my boots are gone. If I try and pull them out of this mud, that'll be the end of them. The elf queen's statue moved. Her arms came loose from her body as the dagger spun electricity around her. Her stone eyes moved in her face and her lips parted. It was a ten-foot-tall rock woman, down to her gown, which shifted on her body like it had been carved to move. The Homo Draconis came alive next. He flicked his polished black stone tail. He roared, showing a mouthful of fangs. He too waved his dagger, sending blinding light flashing around the place. The two didn't sink into the mud, but floated over it. Who has come? Who comes, seeking each Aram's gift? The voice came from the Elf Queen while the Homo Draconis leapt to a monolith. He dug his claws into the stone, and Stephen saw he was a mirror image of that statue. It was odd, like looking into a mirror for a minute. Tessa answered the Elf Queen. Don't start with me. Yo, Galadriel, 
You didn't think too much of me in Bali, and that was just a prologue to this action. Aria waved her hands. I am the thirteenth Dragon Knight. I wield the Animus Daggers. I have come to find a weapon to fight the Zotharic. Foolishness, the Elf Queen hissed, for the shadows of teeth and talon cannot be fought. They can only be endured. If you are a knight, then prove yourself. The Obsidian Draconis leapt at Aria. Tessa cast a shield spell, but it flickered away. Sabina cast her impetum fireworks, but her green sparks also fizzled. Aria tried to turn into her true form to fight the huge statue, but she couldn't shift. She stayed stuck in her homo draconis state. If she couldn't move, she couldn't fight. Zoe provided the solution. The bear flung herself onto her side. Aria slithered up onto the bear's body. She dodged a vicious slash of the electric knives and then brought her tail to smash into the statue's face. She put a crack in the perfect obsidian face. Instead of falling to the mud, he flew to another monolith, gripping it. Aria did the same, across from him. When he flung himself up at her, she somersaulted over him and landed on his back. With one claw dug into his shoulder, she ripped the dagger from his hand, then rammed it into his back and through his chest. She flipped off him to land on another monolith. As for the stone Draconis, he smacked into the mud, stiffening, half-buried, and returned to being an inanimate object. The elf queen drifted into the center of the circle. You have some skill, and I see that you have been marked by the Dragon Knights. Thirteen, you are worthy. But is the lost son here? I'm here, Stephen shouted. I don't know if I'm worthy, but I'm not going to live in fear. Tessa raised an uncertain hand. Merlin's daughter is here. The Elf Queen reached out an empty hand. Arya's daggers were wrenched out of her grip. They flew to the statue who held both knives, bright energy crackling out of their hilts. The light reminded Stephen of chromatic fury. That light flickered off the monoliths, which changed right before his eyes. They went from simple stone to golden framed mirrors that reflected the light of the daggers. Stephen leapt off his mirror to land on the half-submerged statue Arya had stabbed through the heart. Each mirror showed him an impossible sight. At first, Stephen couldn't quite understand what he was seeing. Each of the twelve mirrors held a woman he knew. Arya, Sabina, and Zoe had all vanished from the underwater temple. Only Tessa remained, trapped in the mud. Zoe stood in a monolith, arms wrapped around herself, pale and shaking. Arya was on her left in another mirror in her partial form, growling and showing her fangs. Sabina stood serenely in another monolith, motionless. And it wasn't just the women he'd swum down with. Uchiko crouched low, becoming as small as possible. Where she was, there were no shadows, no place for her to hide. Chazzy and Prue were next to each other, frowning and trying to figure out their new prison. Mouse wasn't going to go gently into that dark night. No, she bashed into the mirror over and over with the Slayer Blade. She was clearly scared out of her mind. The five widows had also been pulled into the mirror monoliths. Skylar, Tegan, Pretty, Michaela, and Abby Free. There had been twelve dragon knights, and he had twelve wives. Somehow this elf queen had pulled his people out of reality and trapped them in the mirror. Tessa pulled her peacekeepers. Okay, bitch, you're dicking with our magic and transformation abilities, but I'm thinking you're not bulletproof. You're going to let our friends out, or I'm going to put a bunch of bullets in your stony butt. Chapter 18 the murky lake water swirled outside the Dome of Air. The Elf Queen turned her eyes on Tessa, trapped in the mud. Careful, Slayer. I know who you've been. I know who you are. And I know who you could be. The statue floated above them, the lightning knives crackling around her stone fists. Around them, the women in the mirrors watched. Stephen reached out with his mind using Animus Chain. Tessa's raging core flashed pink and then the darkest of reds. She hadn't needed to be afraid of using all her energy. She had plenty. The Elf Queen's statue glowed with magical energy from Enchantrix magic, and yet there was a shimmering aura of animus around the statue. The Elf Queen was in the Lake Temple in some very real way. This wasn't a recording. This was more like a phone call. Please, Stephen said. We won't use Icharam's gift for our own selfish desires, and I won't destroy this world in the war against the Zotharic. Please, trust us. 
Stephen didn't call it the Holy Grail. Instead, he used the Elf Queen's term. He had the idea that no one else on Earth knew that the Grail was actually a gift. And it was interesting that the Grail was actually a final treasure from the dragon who'd been murdered by his brothers. No wonder dragons had been searching for it for millennia. It was probably tens of thousands of years old, a weapon Icharam wanted to use against the Zotharic before his brothers betrayed him. Energy, unimaginable cosmic energy, buzzed around the Elf Queen as she lowered her gaze on him. Merlin said something similar, but when he came here, he came here alone. I told him to bring back his friends, and that was when his Guinevere was murdered, and he in turn became a murderer. Tessa gasped. What does that mean? What are you talking about? Who killed his wife? The elf queen ignored the interruption. I cannot trust your blood, Slayer, but the lost son has promise. You both have a choice. Choose one of your friends to die, and I will show you the way to each Aram's gift. Me, Tessa cried out. She turned to look at Stephen. Fear painted her face. Stephen wasn't going to let that happen. No deal. We won't sacrifice anyone. In the end, I'd rather fight the Zotharic without Icharam's gift than lose a single one of my wives. Wives? The Elf Queen scoffed. I see no rings, Dragon Lord, and I sense none of the Alfarian magic connecting you to them. They are not wives to you? Yeah, but I love them anyway, he insisted. Screw this, Encanto. Tessa dispelled the magic that had stopped them from shifting and casting spells. Freed, she called out, Divinatio! Fountains of pink exploded from her eyes. What are you doing? The elf queen demanded. You cannot hope to defeat me! The statue of the Homo Draconis rose from the mud, upending Stephen. He leapt back, worked his wings to keep him afloat, and then turned into a full dragon. He came down behind the monoliths, splaying his toes to keep from sinking. He had a lot of surface area to his feet. He fanned his huge wings back. Half of him was in the dome of air while the other half was in the water. The stone statue, dripping lake mud, leapt for him. Stephen bathed him in dragon fire, melting the stone, until an arm dropped away and his face had become a mask of cooling lava, the features gone. Defensio! Stephen threw a shield spell into the statue, cracking him further and driving him back. Tessa's eyes continued to glow. She wasn't firing her guns like she'd promised. She was delving deep into her divination spell. The elf queen lowered a knife and sent a spear of electricity at Stephen. It struck his body, the awful shock taking away all conscious thought. She aimed the second dagger and blasted him again. Being half-submerged was not helping his situation— Water conducted electricity. Defensio, he thundered again and blocked the lightning with his shield. He jumped over the monoliths, careful not to step on Tessa. He pulled the elf queen down with one hand while smacking away the animus daggers. They went spinning away to the lake bottom. The energy winked out. The mirrors glowed, giving them light, and yet the dome seemed to be shrinking. The Elf Queen had become a hunk of stone again, not animated, and yet he couldn't help but feel the real presence behind the statue. Stephen, Tessa said in a weepy voice, cast divination with me. I see him, I see Merlin, and he's crying. Divinatio. His consciousness left the underwater temple as he joined Tessa in her vision. The pair stood next to each other, in the rain of another land, green and wide, where hills fell to a wave-swept ocean. A small stone house lay in ruins, the rocks still smoldering. The stink of the smoke was stifling. A man wept over a woman who started unblinking up at a sky closed in by heavy gray clouds. The woman was dead. Stephen recognized Merlin's black beard, his gray robes, the slayer blade at his side. His staff lay next to him. They were seeing Merlin holding his dead Guinevere. Huge footprints lay in the heath, dragon claw marks. The place had been ravaged by dragon souls. Merlin raised his face. A scratch cut down his face and his robes were blackened and torn. Stephen pieced it together. He'd arrived at his humble little home after Guinevere had been killed. He'd caught the murderers. He'd fought them, but they had escaped his fury. Tessa took his hand. Why does Merlin have the Slayer Blade? Who killed his wife? For a second, Stephen thought Merlin might look up at them, 
but like in his other visions, Stephen was simply being shown the past. The grieving magician reached into the ground and took out a fistful of dirt. He put it on his dead wife's face and whispered, Encanto, a simple enough spell. The dirt turned into a white mask, a perfect replica of the fallen woman's face. Tessa choked and nearly fell. Merlin set it on his face and whispered another spell. His clothes mended themselves and turned black. When I slay them, when I slay all of the dragon souls, your face is the last thing they will ever see. Merlin was the dragon slayer. Tessa threw herself into Stephen's arms. She sobbed into his chest. The rain continued to pour down on the pair. A gentle hand touched Stephen's shoulder. He turned, and a tall, willowy woman with flawless skin stood there. The tips of her pointed ears rose from the golden tangles of her hair. Like them, the rain didn't touch her. A blue gown fell from her shoulders. Everything about her was beautiful, ethereal, perfect. So much so, she didn't seem human. No more theatrics, the elf queen said. I am Quinestri, and I see that you are worthy and that your love is strong. You really would forsake Icharam's gift if only to save your friends. Thirteen of them. And a thousand years ago there were thirteen. Merlin was the thirteenth. Where are you, Quinestri? Stephen asked. You're alive, I know you are but you're not really here, and your animus wasn't in the statue. Tessa stood awkwardly off to the side, tear tracks on her face, her eyes red and puffy. She wasn't making Tolkien jokes. That was worrisome. Quinestri dropped her hands. The rain stopped. The sun broke through. The stone house, Merlin, Guinevere's body, all were gone. Below them, a Coca-Cola truck rumbled past on an asphalt road, Modern-day houses were visible below them. I will not tell you where I am, Stephen Dracaris, for you are a true Dracaris. Did you ever stop to consider why your lineage is so powerful? Just lucky, I guess, Stephen grinned. Quinestri frowned. It's not luck. It's in your body. It's in your very soul. Tessa found a smile and a joke. Quinny here is at a 7-Eleven in Rockford, Illinois. She doesn't want to tell us because she's afraid we'll bogart all the blueberry slurpee. The look the elf queen had on her face was priceless. It was so Arya, not understanding a word. No, that is not true, the elf said carefully. Then she shook off the interruption. If you fail in your fight against the shadows of teeth and talon, I do not want them finding me and my world. I have kept my people safe through countless generations, and I will not risk them. I swore an oath to each Aram to guard his treasures, and I have kept that oath until now. She smiled at Tessa. You struggled against me. Your power is very strong, and your love for your man and his escort is admirable. I hope that love will not destroy you as it did your ancestor. Stephen was still having a hard time wrapping his head around what he had seen. Merlin, Driven insane with the loss of his wife, had become the dragon slayer. He'd murdered, he'd tortured, and he'd caused such horror. Why would the dragon knights turn on Merlin? Was it Arthur? Stephen wasn't sure, but that didn't feel right. They'd been such good friends. Tessa soldiered on. You said no more theatrics. Will you tell us where the Holy Grail is? Uh, that's what we call Icharam's gift. It kind of got Christianified. Quinestri began to fade. The answer will be in three very special eyes, forged by Icharam himself. Three places on the water, free from wind, sleeping in stone. When all three open, they will show you the location of Icharam's tomb. There you will find what you seek. She vanished. An instant later, Stephen and Tessa were back at the bottom of the lake, staring into each other's eyes. Both were painted by the light of the mirrors. The mud was gone, replaced by a polished marble. The elf queen and Icharam were back in their places, but now a table with an eye sat between them. They weren't reaching out as if to hold torches, but were holding hands over the ever-seeing eye. Stephen noticed that, yes, but what he wanted to keep his attention on was Tessa. 
she had never seemed more beautiful than when she raised her weepy eyes to meet his. Stephen, I get it now. This slayer part of me, it's part bloodlust, yeah, but it's also fear. If I lost you, if you died, I would do what Merlin did. I would kill everything and everyone. It's why I'm having trouble. She lowered her face. He cupped her chin and lifted her face. It's why you're having trouble with the marriage thing? I get it. Believe me, if it weren't for the Wayne twins pushing for this, we wouldn't be talking about marriage. Hey, Chazzy yelled. It's not like we're the only ones. She emerged from the monolith to walk across the marble. All the mirrors were gone. The five widows had been returned to wherever they'd been plucked from, probably from the Dashalar jet, their plane. Thank goodness for autopilot. Prue glanced up. The water level was dropping. She winced. So, water certainly appears to be in my future, and I tried so hard to avoid it. Mouse ran into Tessa's arms, held her, and then went to Stephen, to grip him hard. Oh, let's not do that again. I go from standing on the beach to being caged up. What happened? Long story, Stephen said. Zoe morphed into a bear to hug both Stephen and Tessa to her. It was clear that the bear girl had also been traumatized by her time being imprisoned. Arya went searching for the animus daggers. They'd been cast aside in the fight. Arya then approached the newly created table. The knives were back in their torch configuration. The torch floated in the air, its light shining down on the stone eye. Stephen and his escort went over to the table. They were a collection of clothed women, naked women, and homo draconi. Underneath the clasping statues, the eye opened. The scrape of stone on stone filled the room. The table changed into a topographical map of the North American continent. The Americos chambers blinked on, each a blue star glowing across the map. Then a purple star ignited, marking the Lake Temple where they stood. When a red star came to life in Manhattan Island, the purple light faded. Another red star blazed up off the coast of North Carolina, on one of the barrier islands. The third and last red star marked one of the islands in the Florida Keys. The red light swept across the map, pointing toward somewhere in the middle of the U.S., and then all the lights vanished. Arya shifted into true form to pluck the torch out of the air. She returned to her human form and triggered the map, which again showed the three red stars, but while they pointed in the same general direction, they had not coalesced in any one point. Stephen saw the puzzle. So, these other temples must point to the location of Icharam's tomb. I think we need to go there, to all three. Then we'll see where we need to go. Arya opened her eyes, and they blazed with light. I'm the torch now. I will go to Manhattan. I can divide the torch into the daggers, and emissaries can take one to each of the other two locations. Once we are aligned, we can find Icharam's tomb. We can find Icharam's gift. That'll mean splitting up, Zoe growled softly. She pushed her face into Stephen's back and hugged him close. He heard his spine crack. Prue gave him a long look, and there was definite heat in her eyes. She smiled. He smiled back. What was that all about? Chapter 19 Nobody was happy swimming out of the temple, but the water had dropped down, and they were forced into the chill murk. The light was fading from the world, and clouds blanketed the western sky, probably the remnants of the storm that they'd driven through. Had it blown out all its moisture, or would it hit them with sleet? Growing up in Colorado, it was either snow or rain most of the time. However, Stephen had heard of all sorts of strange weather on the East Coast. What in the hell was a nor'easter? When they emerged on the beach, a single woman stood there, frowning. She was three hundred pounds if she was an ounce. Her big, meaty arms were crossed, and she glared at them from a red face. Her hair was brown and stringy. Her outfit was backwoodsy, a long-sleeved, long-john top covered by overalls. Big hiking boots, size thirteens at least, dominated her feet. She had a down-lined flannel coat tied around her expansive waist. Stephen felt her animus, and she was a dragon soul, powerful and old. She stepped forward. I'm Chickadee Hams, and you all are trespassing. The Wayne twins paid both Chickadee and Stephen no attention. 
They traipsed past them, water running off their pink scales. The twins were not amused. Mouse walked with them. She paused to nod her amber-colored head at Chickadee. Yeah, you'll want to talk to my manager. She then followed them into the woods where Prue gathered dry wood under the foliage and Chazzy lit it with her inferno exhalant. Aria and Sabina, as full-sized dragons, flanked Stephen. Tessa stood next to them, her hand on a holstered peacekeeper. Chickadee stared at Stephen. I thought you were dead, he thought for a minute. I was dead. Didn't like it. I have way too much to do for that action. Zoe came traipsing up and shook the water out of her fur. Stephen, in his homo draconis form, didn't wince when the water struck him. He kept a straight face. Hello, Chickadee. I think you know who we are. Chosen Ben sent you out here to talk to us, didn't he? She nodded. He's being careful. He came back from Chicago with no memories, and he's not sure what to make of it. It could be Morty Flint is playing with us. He hasn't moved on us in a hundred years, but that don't mean nothing. Tessa moved forward. That's pretty brave of you to come here all alone. You're pretty brave, Tessa Ross. You went alone to Eve Downfire, you in the skin there, she motioned to Sabina. Sometimes we have to take risks for the greater good. You know that better than anyone. Tessa nodded. Aria rumbled over them. We have need of your prime and his vassals. We have enemies striking at us in Kansas. If you want an alliance, you must commit troops, or we have nothing to discuss. Chickadee squinted up at her. And what do we get out of it? The way we see it, we're low on your to-do list, but we're still on it. We figure you'll go and wipe out Ugly Ellis and his Inferno dogs, Louis Lelou and his Gree Gree, and whatever military might Victor Nutgrass has gathered. Then you'll come rolling through the New England primacy. Oh, and I forgot about Juice Juice and his army of sounders. We kind of don't believe you'll stop conquering until you own this whole continent. You'll kill every dragon lord until there's no more to kill. Stephen took over. I don't want to kill anyone. You'll get the same deal I have with Javier Jones and Abner Saavedra. You'll keep everything as it is, only you'll swear loyalty to me. And you'll fight with me to end the Zotharic. And you want money, wives, and whatever? Chickadee asked. No. Just help. Stephen was tired, it had been a long day, and they hadn't really slept. A cold wind came out of the west and breezed across the lake. His head was full of new stories, new information, and new reveals. Quinestri, the elf queen, the lady of the lake, had given them a lot to think about. The smoke from Chazzy and Prue's fire drifted over and smelled good, mixed with the cold air. Stephen's mind turned to the evening logistics. They'd brought camping equipment from Nebraska, but they'd have to fly back to their vehicles to get it. They'd also have to scrounge up some food. He was ravenous. That's thin, Chickadee said. Hard to believe you'll let us join you for so cheap. Sabina's eyes winked emerald light. Then send your six dragons at us, Chica. They're in the forest back there, and there are two snipers in the trees as well. I'm waiting for them to fire, though I don't think they will. And then there's wolves to the north, warlings to the south, and a magician with them. Lois Burnham, she's good, but she isn't us. A smile finally found Chickadee's face. That's thick and rich and chocolatey. So, green butt, if you know so much, do we say yes or do we say no? You say yes, of course, Sabina laughed in a deep voice. How could you say anything different? You've never seen any power like Stephen before, and he isn't in this for conquest. He wants to free us, Chica, and change the world forever. Chickadee stepped forward. Can I touch you, Stephen? He wasn't sure where this was going, but he held out a talon. No, I mean as a human. She seemed uncertain, and her eyes turned furtive. If this big, tough woman had ulterior motives, she'd hidden them well. Stephen shifted. He was slightly amused at how his nudity made no difference to him now. Chickadee's eyes widened and she blinked. Young. You're so young. The stories are true of the boy king. You know that's what they called Otter Dro. Before Tutankhamen and before Edward VI in England, Otter Dro was the youngest ruler the world had ever seen. She moved forward. 
She seemed to melt with each step. By the time she touched his arm, she was trembling. Arya growled and snorted fire. That was a warning. Sabina, though, was quiet. She could have sensed if Chickadee was going to do anything dangerous. The big woman's eyes turned a dark brown color as magic filled her sight. You're not trying to trick us. You're not hungry for us. You're just driven. So driven. Tears filled her eyes, turning the brown light amber. It's sad, really, to be so young and to be so ambitious. No time for games or love, just the work. Always the work. You have a serious soul, Stephen Dracarys, and my prime will respect that. The divination magic left her eyes, and she stepped back. I'll talk to Chosen Ben. We know you ate at Glick's, and he's closed down for you. He has cabins out back behind the place, enough for you all. He rents them out on Airbnb, but they're clear for now. You can pretty much have your run of the place, the diner included. Chickadee shook her head. I ain't ever thought I'd see the world change in a heartbeat, but seeing you, touching you, things can't remain the same. That's sad in a way, but exciting in the way it counts. She saluted them with two fingers and walked away, tromping past the wains and mouse until the forest consumed her. A dozen gray wolves, bigger than anything normal nature could produce, raced by and passed her. They turned, barked, howled, and then continued on. Zoe shifted human and went up to Stephen. Her skin felt so good on his, and he knew he had a night of sex ahead of him. And there was that look from Prue, which had him curious and more than a little horny. Those puppies were cute, Zoe whispered. But you're cuter. They hiked over to the fire. Chazzy smiled at Stephen. Was tons of fun duly impressed with you? Tessa scowled. No fat shaming, not around me. You take that back. Chazzy tilted her head and there was fire in her eyes. She wanted to unload. That was clear. And Tessa, emotionally wrung out from the events in the Lake Temple, wasn't about to back down from a fight. Prue gripped her sister's shoulder and eased her back. Easy, Chazzy. We can be nice. So that was Chickadee Hams. She and Chosen Ben are quite the power couple. They'll certainly join us. For one, they ain't idiots. For two, coming back from Chicago with his mind wiped basically means that Morty Flint isn't on our side. You can take that to bank. Ben knows he can either hitch his wagon to Morty or to Stephen. He's a quiet, withdrawn dragon dick, but he's careful. Chazzy let out a breath and grinned. Chickadee Hams. She didn't give us two looks. She had a bad for Stevie. Right? Prue shook her head. She was all shaky when she touched him. It was kind of sweet, a big gal like that, going all soft and gushy. Stevie does impress. It's Steven. He squeezed his eyes shut. So, do you want to try out these cabins or get our camping gear? If we camp, I'll have to get drunk, Chazzy said. And I'm a bit too tired to get my drink on. I don't much care for being kidnapped by elves. Not unless they look like Orlando Bloom. So it was decided. Arya breathed arctic wind to put out the fire. They left the lake with a new objective. Find the Red Star Temples in Manhattan, North Carolina's Outer Banks, and the Florida Keys. Stephen couldn't stop now. And they might have enlisted another dragon lord to help them with the war in Kansas. He wanted to get set up in the cabins and then contact Javier to see how the fighting was going. Delegating wasn't something he enjoyed. He didn't like the lack of control. He didn't like not knowing what was happening to his vassals. Even now, the coalition of dragon lords might be racing into Colorado, torturing, killing, or mutilating any supernaturals loyal to the Dracarys primacy. And if they made it to Denver? His mom and Tessa's family would be in real danger. If that happened, Stephen wouldn't care about the Zotharic. He'd open a portal and rain hellfire down upon his enemies. The cabins behind Glick's Cafe were rustic, or that was the word Tessa used. Chazzy preferred the term shitholes. The fake wood paneling was faded. Some of the sections were peeling back, others bowed out from the wall. You didn't want to look too closely at the shag green carpet or you'd definitely see mouse droppings. The bathrooms were a mixture of mildew and rust and were kind of smelly. Luckily, the pungent odor of mothballs covered up most of the stink. 
The floors sloped to the walls and creaked with every step. There were three cabins and enough beds for everyone. That was the good news. And the sheets were clean, crisp, and cool. A clean bed was all Stephen really cared about. And even then, he could be flexible. Even the Wayne twins agreed they were too tired to go find a Marriott. The cabins would have to do. Their Walmart camping trip had basically been a nap, and car sleeping didn't really refresh you. He wanted to have a mattress underneath him and no one driving. Sleeping wasn't high on the agenda, however. Tessa set up her phone on a tiny little desk in Stephen's cabin, and they did a video call with Bud and Javier. It was a tight squeeze to get him, Tessa, Aria, and the twins inside the same cabin. Even on the little screen, Bud looked terrible. Black circled his exhausted eyes, and his face was pasty. Javier looked far better. He gazed into his phone, a small smile on his face, though he'd had to be put on mute because the wind was blowing so hard. The landscape behind him was flat and white from the storm. He'd set up his command center in a feedlot outside of Dodge City, Kansas. So far, they were holding the front. Abner Saavedra and his willbreakers had been critical in the action on the ground. As for the air battles, several times enemy dragons had tried to fly over them, but they'd brought in candy tricks from the former Sin City's primacy. Candy was keeping the skies safe along with twenty-five of her sister wives, all powerful dragons. They'd fought for Roy Wright during the Battle of the Thousand Steps, but had arrived after Stephen and his escort had made it inside the sea cave, so they hadn't taken many casualties. Candy had joined Stephen gladly. Sir Bedivere hadn't been a very caring prime, and that was putting it mildly. Javier was pleased with how things were going, but he wasn't a fool to think the worst was over. And how are things in Australia? Stephen asked, his lawyer in training. Bud nodded. Good so far. Olivia Bolivia is doing the heavy lifting over there, working her tail feathers to the bone. At this stage, it's all been a battle in the courts and hasn't gotten hot and heavy. With Liam, Schuyler, and the other widows flying over to help Javier on the front, we were a bit worried that we'd get hit right away. The three queens have been moved to a secret area near Sydney, and Olivia has warlings guarding them and the kids. We don't have a magician that can cast Magica Divinatio spells there, so we're a little blind. Stephen thought of Agatha Stipe in the Deseret Primacy. He might have to shuffle his magicians around. Having someone who could sense the future had become an absolute necessity in their operations. For now, Agatha was in Dodge City with Eve Downfire. Javier spoke. Paolo Hume, the Panama Prime, and the other Central American Dragon Lords have been running patrols up and down the coast of California, Oregon, and Washington. They have a magician, Bubu Capora, who is in San Luis Obispo, and she has her divination magic working overtime. No sign of Panga Komang. Stephen thought of Nawashi. He tried to scry the dragon with the tattoo on his neck, but he and Sabina had lost him in Illinois. Nawashi was heading east, which was troubling. Something as old and powerful as Uchiko's former teacher was an uncertain variable, and they already had so much on their plate. They ended the call. Chazzy had fallen asleep on Prue's shoulder, but the smart twin couldn't keep her eyes off Stephen. She was buzzing from something, and he wasn't sure what. However, she took a break from giving him steamy glances to get her sister into her bed in their room. Bunk beds. And they were sharing with Sabina, who had already turned in. Before the Latina magician had gone to sleep, she'd stuffed a piece of paper into Stephen's pocket and kissed him. He'd taken a look at her note. It made him reconsider a lot of things. Mouse and Zoe were in their cabin along with Uchiko, which left the last one for Stephen, Aria, and Tessa. It had two small beds. He and Tessa would curl up in one bed and Aria would sleep alone. Tessa loved to cuddle more than anything else in the world, and it had gotten to the point where she said she couldn't sleep alone. Luckily, there were so many bodies for her to hold while she dreamed. Aria stretched out fully clothed on the bed and fell asleep. Tessa glanced at Stephen. Are you tired? He was. He touched Sabina's note in his pocket and shrugged. You want to talk? Need is the better word, Tessa murmured. So sleep could wait. Chapter 20 Tessa couldn't shut off her head, and she was grateful Stephen agreed to chat. Come with me to the diner. I want a cigarette and some ice cream, in that order. 
Stephen stood with her while she smoked under the eaves in front of Glick's diner. Rain gushed down in buckets. The wet forest around them gave off such a great smell, Tessa almost felt bad smoking. Almost. The nicotine was not going to help her sleep, but the ice cream would. Then she had fantasies of smearing chocolate on Stephen and licking him to pieces. Sex would definitely help her quiet her mind. They sat on a white bench out front with the parking lot, a beautiful sparkle of wet light in front of them. Every so often, the rain-blurred headlights of a car would speed past them on the highway. Mostly, though, it was quiet, except for the rain. Wow, Stephen said. This is a downpour. It gets like this in Colorado every once in a while, but this rain goes on and on and on. Damn. At least it's not snow, Tessa let out a frustrated gasp. We're not out here to talk about the weather, Stephen. I don't know what to think about this whole Merlin is the Slayer news. And those fuckers, those fuckers killed Merlin's wife. Then they tried to kill him. And that whole situation is just so unfair. He was so close to finding the Holy Grail. You know what I think? I think Arthur and Merlin wanted to do what we're going to do. Like us, they wanted to fight the shadows of Teeth and Talon. Stephen smiled and yawned. The Wayne twins called them the shadows of fuckwads and dictards, or something like that. But yeah, I agree. Chassie and Prue, Tessa blew out a lungful of smoke. They're trying to get along. Trying. Kind of. Their kind of trying is pretty good, he frowned at her. You know you shouldn't smoke. I know, I know. She took a drag and held it. But I like it so much, and it calms me. He rolled his eyes. It doesn't. Nicotine is a stimulant. And there are much better ways to be stimulated. She knocked him with her knee. So, tell me about this marriage thing. Are you giving in to peer pressure? Maybe a little, Stephen admitted. He pulled the piece of notebook paper Sabina had given him out of his pocket. He opened it up. And here are the marriage vows. Tessa leaned in close and read Sabina's pretty expressive writing. Woman, I am your everlasting stone, man. I will be the animus that brings you to life, woman. I am your crystalline water, man. I will cup you in my hands, woman. I am your ever-changing sand, man. I will be steadfast in my love, woman. I am your nourished seed, man. I will be your nourishment, woman. I am your verdant leaf, man. I will be the sunlight that kisses you, woman. I am your leaping mind, man. I will be there to catch you when you leap, woman. I am your strong fist, man. And I will be your strength just as you will be mine, woman. I am your living soul, man. And I will be your heart just as you will be mine. Reading the words, Tessa could imagine the ceremony. She was okay until she read the last four lines and then tears filled her eyes. It's beautiful. Stephen folded the piece of paper. If I was marrying one wife, we could say it to each other. But since I'm probably going to be marrying at least six, we'll divide up each line, add some, subtract some. Tessa saw the pattern. No, don't you get it? Everything it talks about is connected. It's the world and our place in it. And it meant they'd be tied together forever, like leaves and sunshine. That called for another smoke. She shook another one out. Okay, so let's say you and I get hitched, and then in like twenty years we're both fat and unhappy, and then one of us dies. Then what? He burst into laughter. For one, we'll probably be lucky to live twenty years, and if we're still alive, you and I will probably live a lot longer than that. Merlin was a human and lived ten thousand years. Animus chain and flesh forge. Tessa held the cigarette and let the smoke drift upward. That's how they did it, but it won't be easy. Yet aging is just cellular decay. If we can fix cells, we can fix aging, I'm thinking. Maybe, Stephen paused. Anyway, it's not like we're going to have a normal human life. Those days are gone. And I don't think with how I burn calories I can get fat. I can, Tessa sighed, heartbroken. I am. No, you're not. Don't go there or we'll be here all night. And you promised me ice cream. That's the only reason why I'm here. He grinned to show he was joking. Tessa turned on him. For you, this marriage isn't a big deal. 
We're all okay with you sleeping around. For me, suddenly I have one penis and I have to come to terms with that. Tell me truthfully, would you care if I slept with another guy? And don't weasel out of the question. Fine. He pinched his lips together, then answered. No, I don't like the idea, but I don't own you. With the marriage, our animus cores are going to be tied together. I would feel it. Jazzy and Prue couldn't have sex with me when they were still bound to Carlo Bart Baxter. If you did cheat, I'd know, and I don't want to experience guy-on-guy -guy action like that. Tessa stared out into the night, listened to the rain, and then spoke. It's not even like I want other guys. I literally have more women than I could sleep with, and it's getting to the point where you and I could have a different girl every day of the year. No, it's loving you, and it's remembering how devastated my mom was when Dad died. It's scary, and it makes me feel vulnerable. Then I get pissed that I'm scared that I'm vulnerable. That anger, that fear, it drove Merlin to murder every dragon he could. Emotions, so much fun. Sarcasm dripped off her words. It is simpler for me, he leaned forward. I'm going to marry the women in my escort who want me, at least the core escort. You don't have to, Tessa. There wouldn't be an issue. You say that, and I believe you, but I know myself. If I don't commit to this, I don't think I will commit to anything. Tessa tossed her cigarette into a little puddle in the asphalt. Don't worry, I'll get it. I'm not a bad smoker. She sighed again. I keep thinking about what Eve Downfire said. I can be who I want to be. And I want to be someone who can commit. And I want to be like Merlin was before Guinevere was killed. I'm close to choosing Stephen. He patted her leg. Good thing we don't have to decide anything right now. We have a war to win. Each Iran's shit to find. And of course, we still don't quite know the full story of who killed Guinevere. Ice cream? She asked. Yes. Let's keep it simple. We'll eat ice cream and then go to sleep. This is me at my best, lowering my head and doing the next thing in front of me. The end. Tessa attacked him, pulled him close, and slipped her tongue into his mouth. Sex first, she said. They rattled into the diner. And yes, sex with her up against the counter and him behind her. Tessa loved how he filled her how excited he got, squeezing her hips and thrusting into her. He reached to cup her swinging breasts. The lights were off in the little restaurant, so no one could see them. Tessa found herself smiling while he pounded her. With how horny humans were, she was sure she wasn't the first woman to get a little lovin' in the diner after closing time. After he finished, they ate ice cream naked at the counter. There was plenty of the creamy deliciousness tucked away in huge containers in the walk-in freezer, Back at the cabin, Tessa lay in bed, smelling Stephen and feeling his body on hers. She was so comfortable. He was still tense. She felt him sigh. She wanted to ask him if he needed to talk more. Then, before she knew it, she was gone from the world, fast asleep. Chapter 21 Stephen lay awake, listening to Arya's light snoring and Tessa's even breathing. Being with them felt so perfect, so right. Why was he even thinking twice about marriage? Yet he had Tessa's doubts as well. Watching his mom suffer through Joe Whip's hijinks would have made anyone wonder why people suffered through holy matrimony. Not wanting to wake anyone, he pulled up the path of the mirror-souled dragon. Path of the mirror-souled dragon. Heart strike. Animus Chain, Flesh Forge, Enchantrix, Stellar Flight, Locked. He'd leveled again, and he could feel that extra power in him, allowing him a bit more animus. Yet the real benefit was that he could do more spells with less energy. In that way, leveling had dual benefits. His eyes went down the list. He couldn't imagine what that last ability was or how Stellar Flight worked, but he didn't have to worry about them. For now... Flesh Forge was his goal. Merlin must have used some variation of it to keep himself and Guinevere alive. Stephen found the interplay between Animus Chain and Flesh Forge and how they could be linked interesting. That was going to be the solution to curing Jared of his MS. He raised his left hand and concentrated on his missing finger. His core burned with Animus, and every cell in his body was imbued with the mystical energy. 
He concentrated. He noticed a cut on the back of his hand. Might as well fix that. To his delight, he felt the damage in his cells there, and the biochemical reactions trying to repair the wound. The white blood cells. The scab. He focused on recreating the cells, one after another, piling up, regenerating, using his very DNA. He flexed his left hand. The scab fell away and he was healed. This wasn't like Magicka Cura, which was a simpler process. This was massively complex. He felt drained. Checking his animus again, he saw that even that little process of healing the scab had cost him nearly a quarter of his energy. It was resource-intensive, certainly. Bruno Illich had given himself a shield arm and a spike during their fight at the Bali Waterfall Temple. Stephen knew he had a long way to go, but he'd taken his first steps. Before he knew it, he was asleep. A soft knock on the door woke him up, but Arya and Tessa slept on. Prue's voice whispered into the cabin. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Stephen slid out of bed as quietly as he could. He wanted to see why Prue kept looking at him and what her heated looks meant. He slipped outside. The little cabins had porches. Rain continued to pour down, but the temperature had dropped considerably. Now, big fat snowflakes joined the rain and the ground was slushy. There were brick paths, however, that led from his cabin to Glick's diner. He didn't worry about shoes. Prue wore a simple jacket and pants. With the amount of skin she was showing and with the way her chest moved, it was clear she wasn't wearing a bra or a shirt, for that matter. What's going on? Stephen asked. Prue held his hand and she was trembling a bit. You'll see my prime. I have to admit I'm a little scared. I mean, I shouldn't be, but this is certainly outside my comfort zone. I can't say more or I'll spoil the surprise. He knew he couldn't ask Prue about any ulterior motives she might have because it was important that he showed her he trusted her. They'd come a long way in their relationship, and he wasn't going to spoil things with any unnecessary questions. Lead on, he said. The shades on the diner had been closed. Prue got behind him. Okay, open the door and you'll see. It's kind of what I've been wanting since Vale, when Morty brought Denise and Femi to you as tribute. You'll see, you'll see. Stephen pushed open the door. Inside, three candles burned on the counter, throwing out a soft light. The tables had been pushed to the side. A single chair sat in the middle of the space, and on that chair was a very naked Sabina. Her eyes weren't glowing. She sat with her arms behind her and her legs slightly spread. Hola. The Latina magician called out in a shaky voice tinged with a subtle fear. Who's there? Prue came up behind Stephen. He was in sweats and a t-shirt. One of her hands went up his shirt to feel the muscles of his chest, while her other hand went down his pants to grip his growing erection. It's us, Sabina. We can see you. You're excited, aren't you? Yes, the Latina magician said in a choked voice. You can see me, can't you? You can see and you want to take me? We do? Prue kissed Stephen's neck. She licked his ear. Her voice was a whisper. We've been talking about this. I wasn't sure I could do this with the both of you, but I wanted to try. Sometimes I don't understand this dominant thing I have going on, but Sabina suggested you and I try it on her. Do you want to fuck her with me? I do. He winced at the pleasure of her hand on him, and of seeing Sabina so vulnerable and open. Sabina loved her games. She had quite the imagination. Look at her, Prue said. Look at her tits, those nipples. Sometimes she likes it when I pull on them, and sometimes she likes it when I get rough. We can do what we want with her. Anything we want. The Texas woman's perfume was sweet, but there was a definite musk there as well. She was excited. He found it hard to talk. A knot had formed in his throat. Is that right, Sabina? Can we do what we want with you? Yes, she opened her legs wider. Can I touch myself? No, you can't, Prue said sharply. I'll tell you what you can and can't do. I'm in charge, got it? Yes, she whimpered and closed her legs and writhed a bit on the chair. It was obvious she was trying to scratch her horny itch herself. No, keep them open. Prue took hold of Stephen's shirt and pulled it off him. She then pulled his pants all the way down and off. 
He stepped out of them. He was as naked as Prue was. Do you like how you feel in this place? The Texas girl asked Sabina. It's just a normal place where normal people go, and here you are, naked, excited, getting that chair wet. Do you like it? I shouldn't, but I do, the Latina woman said, breathless. He didn't doubt her. She loved pushing her limits, and that word, shouldn't, added to the taboo nature of the encounter. Prue stroked him. Stephen is naked. I've got him in my hand, and he's getting so excited, looking at you. You want us to go over there to you, don't you? You're going crazy. See, I am so crazy. Sabina closed her legs again, then remembered that was against the rules. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I won't do it again, I promise. But you did it once, and I'll have to punish you. Get down on your knees. Prue left Stephen. She unzipped her jacket and dropped it. Her sandals went next, followed by her pants. All three of them were naked now. All were breathing heavily. Animus swirled around them in the diner, so much so, the candles flickered. The rain beat down on the roof. Stephen stayed where he was. He wanted to see what kind of punishment Prue had in mind. Sabina slid off the chair and knelt there on the yellowed linoleum floor. Prue approached her. Her ample ass rose and fell. Her curves caught the candlelight. She got in front of Sabina and pushed her sex into the kneeling woman's face. You certainly know what to do. You certainly know what I want. Do it. Do it to me good. Sabina followed directions, pleasuring Prue while she stood over her. Sabina's brown hands looked so dark compared to the pale, freckled hips of the Texas woman. Prue called to Stephen over her shoulder. Come on, Stephen. Because she didn't follow directions, you get to punish her too. He came around to the side to appreciate Sabina's heavy breasts as she leaned forward, her face between Prue's legs. Sabina's nose pressed into Prue's pubic hair. When he got close, Sabina switched to him. Her mouth felt so good. Right when he thought he would lose control, she switched back to Prue, who clutched the kneeling woman's head, her fists full of Sabina's dark hair. Yes, I know you want your turn. I know you're so hot. I know you wanted to rub yourself, but I didn't let you. I didn't let you. She turned to Stephen. You know what's going to happen. You're going to watch me come. I'm watching, he said thickly. Prue lost herself in the bliss, her skin glowing as the animus filled her. Sabina sat back, breathing hard. She lifted her face to Stephen. Can I do him now, Prudence? Prue went around to her back. You better, and you better do it well. I'm going to ask him, and if he's not satisfied, there'll be consequences. Sabina went to work on him. Prue got up close to them, kissed him, and then sucked on his tongue just as Sabina was sucking on another part of him. Is she doing good? Do you like it? Do you think she's giving it her all? He couldn't talk. The question, the sensations, the oddity of being naked in such a normal place was too much for him. Sabina knew what was coming, and she didn't slow her movements. In fact, she used her hand and mouth with more vigor. She wanted to taste him. He'd been with Tessa that night, in the diner, but his libido had become as supercharged as everything else about him, and he knew, with how hot these two had gotten him, he wasn't going to be satisfied with just one orgasm. He was tossed into ecstasy. Sabina knew enough to stop, to let him enjoy the pleasure, as every cell in his body rejoiced in the animus. Again, Sabina eased back. She wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Have I done well? Is it my turn now? Grady, Prue snapped. But I'm feeling generous. You can get on the chair. You can touch yourself now, but give us a show. If Stephen likes it well, I might just let him fuck you, but only after he fucks me. Sabina found her way back to the chair. This time she caressed a nipple while she rubbed herself into a climax. It didn't take long. Her skin glowed as well as she took in the mystical energy of life itself. It was a good show, without a doubt. Prue was true to her word. She ordered Sabina off the chair, sat Stephen down, and rode him until she was satisfied. Then the Texas woman sat on the chair. Sabina, still on the floor, kissed her way up Prue's thighs until she found the Texas woman's sex. 
Stephen got behind Sabina and sank himself into her body. He started off slow, but watching the two, it wasn't long before he was thrusting into her, loving her squeals so much that he was flung into an orgasm. Sabina crawled up Prue's body, straddled her, and held her. It took a minute to realize that Prue was weeping softly. Stephen knelt beside the two on the chair. He kissed Prue's face, then Sabina's. He wasn't sure if it was okay to ask Prue a question, but he was curious. Why are you crying? Prue laughed through her tears. I'm not crying. I mean, I am, but I shouldn't be. And he asks me why I'm crying. Shit, I don't fucking know. I'm a Wayne, and Wayne girls don't cry. Uh, much. Sabina kissed the woman softly, then turned and kissed Stephen. We are in love. We are daring. We are strong. Prudence, you took a risk tonight being with us both. And it was scary, but we not only accepted you, we celebrated you. Cry all you like me amore. You have been mighty tonight. Prue shook her head, rolled her eyes, laughed a little, cried a little. Well, dang, when you put it that way, I guess maybe crying is just okay. Stephen saw how powerful their bond was. His conversation with Tessa came back to him. His doubts about marriage were gone. He wanted to spend 10,000 years exploring these women, getting to know every part of them, and like Sabina had said, celebrating them. If a tough soul like Prue could break down and show such emotion and vulnerability, it pointed to how deep the mystery of their marriage would be. At that moment, Stephen knew that Merlin had felt the same way about Guinevere. Losing her had shattered him, and he'd taken his vengeance out upon the entire world. Yet what had happened to him? And what had happened to his friend Arthur? He didn't know, but he knew he'd learn more of the story when they traveled south. He, Arya, Tessa, and Mouse would go to New York to find the Red Star temples there. Sabina, Mouse, and Uchiko could journey to the Outer Banks, and that left the Wayne twins in the Florida Keys, though Stephen was kind of sad not to be there when they went bar hopping. Also, the Wayne twins in bikinis on a beach surrounded by palm trees? As a teenager, that would have been a poster he'd have bought twice. The plan was solid. He only hoped Javier and his troops held Kansas. And that his enemies would be so focused on the battle, they wouldn't look to the east. Not until they had the location of Icharam's tomb and the gift that lay there. Chapter 22 Stephen woke to the smell of bacon cooking. That would be Callahan Glick, hard at work in his diner, serving up breakfast to hungry travelers and his regular customers from Barlow, Maine. Aria gave a last snort and then rose. She rushed over and jumped onto him and Tessa, kissing both their faces. The Indian woman was in a good mood. Good morning, lovers. There is magic in the air today. Can you feel it? I can. Tessa's sparkle wiped the sleep from her eyes. The magic smells like bacon, which is the best thing anyone can ever hope to smell in the morning. We'll eat bacon and then we'll road trip it down to New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Heck yes. Stephen pulled the two women to him. Arya's kiss turned into something more. Stephen felt her animus spin in excitement. Do we have time? she asked. Tessa kissed her quick. We always have time for that. Keeps us safe and strong. You two go at it and I'll gather the troops. The barista dressed quickly. By that time, Arya was naked. Stephen felt her taut muscles under her skin. Being with Arya alone felt special. She'd woken up excited, and it didn't take long before both were satisfied. They showered, dressed, and joined Stephen's escort, Sans Uchiko, in the diner. The rowdy women were eating big, round, and crispy waffles, sausage links and patties, eggs cooked to order, and of course, bacon. Tessa gave Glick's coffee a passing grade. It wasn't good, but its level of bad passed the acceptable limits. She took a sip and narrowed her eyes. Yes, slightly scorched, this cup is weak, but the last one was strong, which points to a cavalier attitude toward the ever-important mid-pot pour. The beans are old, rather dry, and probably cheap. However, I'm not just drinking this cup. No, I'm drinking the ghost of coffee past, brewed day in and out, year after year. I am drinking in the history of a million breakfasts eaten by people who love each other. Jazzy and Prue glanced at each other, and then they applauded Tessa. She stood up and took a bow. 
Cal Glick came over and told them that Chosen Ben had paid their bills. That drew more applause. Inside, the diner was cozy. Outside, a cold mist hung trapped in the trees. It wasn't raining, or maybe it was. Stephen found the weather baffling. Growing up on the Great Plains, which was semi-arid at best, a full-on desert at its worst, all that moisture felt cold, wet, and wrong. Yet it was pretty, the vapor drifting through the budding trees. While the twins packed up a Macy's worth of clothes, the rest of them mingled around the vehicles, stowing their own gear. Uchiko, helmet on, remained aloof by her motorcycle, watching them. Her kusarigama filled a saddlebag. Zoe was hugging Mouse, and it was funny to see the two women together, a great big bear girl embracing the prickly blonde half her size, but the two were as thick as thieves, without a doubt. Sabina drifted over to Stephen. She took his hand. You'll need as many of your escort as you can get in New York. There will be trouble there, I can see it. Stephen grinned. Trouble in New York City? I thought Giuliani cleaned it up. He lost his smile and shook his head. Never thought I'd leave Denver, and here I am traveling all over the world. Will you, Zoe, and Uchiko be okay in North Carolina? Sabina drew him in and kissed his cheek. See, we'll be fine, but maybe Uchiko won't be there. You don't need to ask about the twins. If they can stay just a little sober in the Florida Keys, they'll be fine. She drew back. But I feel like I have to tell you something. She had a strange expression on her face. What is it? Sabina lifted her head. She sniffed at the wind. A breeze blew droplets on them, and she laughed, brushing the water off her face. This is the end game. I feel it. I know it. And I am glad to be a dragon skin as well as your magician, yet I feel the pull of her, this little life, wanting to exist. At first, Stephen didn't get it. Then he saw what she was getting at all too clearly. You mean Reggie. Regina Maria Drocaris, Sabina nodded. Our daughter. You will marry us. We will have your children. The others are satisfied waiting. I don't think I can. She pulled him away from the vehicle so they could talk in private. Stephen followed along, feeling a bit overwhelmed. Being a father was a stupendously big responsibility, and already he felt bad for not visiting the kids in Australia. Cooper, Isla Keller's little boy, looked up to Stephen as a father, and yet he didn't see the three queens or their children much. Time, distance, and responsibility separated them. If he could take out the distance part by using portal magic, the situation would be far better. Once under a tree, Sabina touched the bark with a dark hand. I think of myself as a magician first. Your magician. I am part of Stephen Dracaris's escort, and you took me in when I was helpless. Then, I am a dragon skin. I can fly. I am working on the Inferno Exhalant, but I'm not there yet. Soon I will be your wife. I love all of these roles, I do, and they bring me meaning and joy. Am I ready to be a mother? Maybe not, but I can't wait. Reggie calls to me. Her soul longs to exist. It makes me happy. No manches, it also scares me. Stephen was reminded of the Wayne twins. You know, Chazzy and Prue had to go through their fear to join us, like Mouse did. They weren't sure about me, and Prue didn't think she could let herself be vulnerable, not after all the time she spent playing games with dragon lords. Now, they're a part of the team. You are strong, Sabina, so strong. If you want to be a mother, you'll be great. I'll be there with you every step of the way. Sabina shook her head. But you won't. Once you find Icharam's gift, you will need to gather up the rest of this world's dragon lords, and then you'll have the war of wars to fight. That is why I am torn. Do I start Reggie's life now, or do I wait? Can I wait? I don't know. I don't know either. Car doors slammed. Chazzy and Prue were almost packed. You and I will walk through our fear, Sabina said. Getting married scares you, I know, just as being a mother scares me. You and I, though? are accustomed to walking through our fears. How hard can family be when compared to fighting dragons? Stephen rolled his eyes. You and I both know that fighting dragons is far easier than family. Family tests us like nothing else. Come on, Mouse called. I want to sleep more and I want to do it after we get the mandatory morning road trip banter out of the way. Ugh, people are the worst. 
Stephen took Sabina in his arms and held her close. She was wondering who she wanted to be. Magician, dragon skin, or mother. Well, like Eve Downfire had said, she could choose. Yet her choice affected his life as well. And that was family. When you were so connected that your choices affected the web of people around you, he took in a deep breath, kissed the top of Sabina's head, and then let her go. He and the Latina magician walked back to the three vehicles. Zoe grabbed him and pulled him into a not-quite-literal bear hug. Again, he felt his spine crack. She growled into his ear. I understand that I'm going to the Outer Banks to protect Sabina and help, but I hate being away from you. I hate it. Soon we'll be together for a long time, he said, trying to ease her. She nipped his ear. You better be right. I'm getting stronger, but I never want to be so strong that I don't need you. He hugged her and cracked her back. His embrace said it all. Zoe laughed, kissed his nose, and got into the poupon with Sabina. Chazzy stood on one of Jeeves's running boards. Let's get to it, primey boy. We have shit to do and each your arm's gift to find. And the rest of Arthur and Merlin's story, Prue shouted and climbed into the driver's seat. Stephen got into the orange crush with Aria, Tessa, and Mouse, and they took off with Uchiko following them down the wet pavement. It was six hours to New York. That was where they finally split. Sabina and Zoe, with one animus dagger, would drive to Wilmington, North Carolina. There, they would find passage to an island in the Outer Banks. Uchiko would ride her motorcycle to protect the Latina magician and the morphling. The twins had the other animus dagger, and they were headed toward the Florida Keys. The Dragon Lords had found them at the Sap Brothers. They might still be on someone's radar. However, no one had attacked them since Nebraska, and there was the Kansas War to consider. Day two, and Javier Jones and the rest were holding U.S. 283. Liam Strider and the five widows had landed in Denver and used Dragon Flight to rendezvous with Javier. With the five widows around, any enemy prime and his vassals weren't just going to waltz into central Kansas without having serious, life-threatening issues. Good. Stephen's team turned into the heavy traffic of New York. It was 3 p.m., and already things were slowed to a crawl. The Hutchinson River Parkway was basically a parking lot. They inched across the bridge spanning the East River, and traffic stayed bad in Queens. Or was it flushing? He was having a hard time keeping all the various places he'd heard about in a zillion movies and TV shows straight. Yonkers was a thing, right? Some kind of play? He didn't know. He did know he hated being trapped in his car with everyone in their cars equally trapped. He struck the wheel in frustration. Tessa sat next to him, the Dragon Knight book on her lap. A piece of paper lay on the book. It was the Dragon Soul marriage vows. She'd been looking them over, memorizing them. Stephen had also given them a glance, or three, but every time he read them he felt like hyperventilating. The other women in his escort already knew the ceremony by heart. It's okay, baby, Tessa said. I know you're nervous about splitting up, but you're with me and I'm amazing. Totally amazing, he agreed. Aw, oh, you guys are cute in a fuck-me-I'm-going-to-puke way, Mouse griped. Where are we going, anyway? New York is not a small place, and it smells like crime pizza and hooker burgers. I won't have fries with that. Stephen glanced in the rearview mirror. I will find the Red Star Chamber, Aria said, raising a hand. How? Mouse asked. You're not the divination magic maven. I'm thirteen. Aria let lightning crackle around her hand. I'm the torch. We have opened both eyes. A map appeared there, snapping and hissing, and she moved it to hover over the dashboard. The two other teams would use the animus daggers to cast similar magic. Stephen had to smile at the map in front of him. This brought back memories of their first adventure together, when they'd searched for the first Rakaris grimoire, the power of the pen, and the magic of ink. It was like a GPS map made of electricity. He saw the orange crush on the streets, and the numerous rivers and canals running through New York City like veins. The Red Star Chamber gleamed on a triangle of land sticking out of Brooklyn. The Red Hook neighborhood, Tessa said. She had her phone out. Yeah, that's convenient. The Red Star Chamber is in Red Hook. Stephen gave up on fighting the traffic. He exited the jammed highway and immediately found a parking garage and took a hard left into it. 
It would cost them several hundred dollars a second to park there, but money wasn't the issue. He wanted to find the Red Star Chamber, and soon. What are you doing? Tessa asked. We're dragons, Stephen said. Dragons don't sit in traffic. We'll fly there, if that's okay with you. She grinned. Uh, yeah, I can fly now. Merlin's daughter here, but with less maniacal revenge rage, yay me. Arya furrowed her brow. She let her animus map fade. But we have the time. The B team won't get to the Outer Banks for another fourteen hours at least. As for the C team, it's more like a full day of travel. The twins had thought about using Dragonflight to get there, but they didn't want to abandon their guns, and long-distance Dragonflight was uncomfortable and a lot of work. The Wayne twins did what they could to avoid discomfort and work. Ha, Mouse barked. The twins of the C team, that makes sense. Both of them are such cunt. Wow, Tessa cut her off. Just wow, they're trying. I should have been on the B team since I am such a B, Mouse joked. Stephen parked them at the very back of the underground garage. They got out, gathered some bags, and then walked up to street level. It was a busy place full of cars, people, and restaurants. A busy little city inside a huge city. Stephen had Samael's lash, but no one gave him a second glance. They were busy, he was weird, whatever. Even Arya didn't garner much attention. She was just another person in a city crammed full of people. Beautiful? Sure. So were 50,000 other actresses and models walking around. They found a dark alley full of trash and dumpsters. It ran behind a strip mall and a taller apartment building behind it. It was the perfect place for transformation. A defensio spell and flight. Flying around in New York City, Tessa couldn't stop smiling. Is this really our lives? To quote Sinatra, we're going to get a bird's eye view of the city that never sleeps, and we're going to do it our way, Mouse said. Let's get this show on the road. Chapter 23 Stephen rose on wings, a long, black, glistening dragon soaring above the cityscape. The traffic was snarled at every turn. They had several defensio spells going, so no humans would see them. That protection extended to Tessa, who floated in a glow of pink magic that was part shield, part telekinesis, and all awesome. Arya led the way, eyes sparkling with white electricity. She said she knew where the mysterious Red Star Chamber was, and they would follow her. Mouse trailed them keeping watch. Sabina hadn't been very specific about the trouble they'd find in New York, but it was clear they were not going to get out of this encounter unscathed. Did that mean another Dragonlord attack? Or would there be guardians like at the Bali Waterfall Temple? He closed his eyes and reached out with Animus Chain. Millions of humans were below, living fast, full lives. The amount of energy was staggering. Buildings, streets, houses, they stretched out to the horizon. This was a city. Denver was a cow town compared to this mass of humanity. Aria flew toward a body of water, splitting the buildings. The skyscrapers of Manhattan rose like man-made Mount Olympuses, each and every one of them. Was that the Empire State Building? He wanted to take a picture. He had his phone, but it was in his bag, and he wasn't there to be a tourist. Later. He promised himself he'd come back. Chosen Ben could show him around. New York was part of the New England primacy, and Ben was friendly to Stephen. Or he seemed to be, at least. They flew over rougher parts, more urban blight, big warehouses that looked empty. Some lots were nothing but tumbled-down piles of bricks. Abandoned cars littered the streets. Aria landed on a ten-story apartment building, clearly ready for the wrecking ball. Tessa floated down gently, and her pink energy blinked off. Stephen and Mouse joined them. In front of them, across the water, was the Statue of Liberty. Each of them was speechless for a second. Okay, Tessa said, laughing. This is pretty freaking amazing. I mean, Seoul was awesome, but I'm looking at landmarks that are as American as Type 2 diabetes, barbecue, and mom's apple pie. This place is strangely intoxicating, Arya agreed. Rahab had an airy here, which means we have a place to stay. It's in the Empire State Building. I reached out to Bud to confirm. He has vassals getting it ready as we speak. They were surprised to hear from us. Tessa grinned. 
That's a great job. You get paid waiting for someone to call you to clean. Not that you ever really clean, but you are ready for it. If my sorceress gig doesn't work out, I'm going to do that for Stephen. Never, he said. Then, maybe. He winked at her. Mouse dropped her bag, shifted, and stood there as a homo draconis holding the slayer blade. Yes, this is all very cool, but I want to see what a red star chamber looks like. I'm assuming we go down. Arya shifted into her partial form, as did Stephen. Yes, let us commence, but we must be careful. There might be humans here. There might be dragons. Stay alert. Stephen used ion claws to slice through the locked door on the roof of the condemned apartment building. They started down the staircase. After descending five floors, they checked a hallway. A long corridor of doorways greeted them. All of the actual doors were gone, and they went through a couple of apartments, but they'd all been stripped. Graffiti, mattresses, and a few crack pipes littered the place, but they didn't see anyone. No normal humans, and nothing supernatural. Five stories of staircase later, Tessa was breathing hard. Okay, I'm out of breath, but I'm feeling good. I'm glad Zoe has been making me go on runs with her. If you'd have asked me to do this last year, it wouldn't have gone well. They reached the ground level and kept on going until they hit the basement. It was full of derelict machinery. Printing presses, maybe. It was hard to tell. Maybe hardcore machinist equipment? Stephen didn't know. The basement was packed. Tessa quoted the Elf Queen. Three places on the water, free from wind, sleeping in stone. Worst haiku ever, Mouse sighed. They threaded their way through the old metal until Arya stopped at a grate in the floor. She stooped, picked it up, and set it to the side like it was a pizza box. A ladder led down into darkness. Somewhere a rat squeaked and water dripped. Tessa leaned over, turned to Stephen, and whispered a single word. Chud. What's that? Arya asked Mouse. The blonde shrugged. Stephen was equally oblivious. What's Chud? The barista rolled her eyes. Cannibalistic, human, underground dwellers? It's a movie from the 80s, never mind. New York does have a vast underground city under it. They had to shift human to fit in the tunnel. Stephen went first. His sword was strapped across his back. The ladder was rusted, but it held to the wall. They descended maybe twenty-five feet until the ladder abruptly ended. Defensio. Stephen stepped onto a shield spell. He unsheathed his sword. Using a simple encanto spell, he imbued the blade with light. Underneath them was a vast chamber hundreds of feet deep and maybe a hundred feet wide. He lowered the shield down and raised his bastard sword, chunks of dragon scales sharpened to an edge connected by a strong cable of enchanted steel. A round culvert was on each wall, but no water flowed out of them. Around the culverts were ornate friezes carved into the stone, so intricate there was no way any human would have taken the time to create them. In the middle of the chamber was an exact copy of the statues they'd seen in the temple under Lyra Lake, Quinestri and Icharam holding hands over an ever-seeing eye. This was the place, all right. The floor had a mosaic of tiles, but moss and muck covered large sections. There was a picture there, but it was partially obscured. The place seemed ageless, and it stank. A dark, wet smell, maybe from the sewer system, maybe from something else. Tessa used her magic to lower herself, Arya, and Mouse to the floor. They went to the round table. On one side, carved into the stone, was the outline of a clawed hand. Arya shifted back into her partial form. She checked the size of her hand to the size of the engraving in the table. If I touch that, it will trigger the chamber, I know it. We will have to wait until the B and C teams are in place. Mouse kept glancing at the culverts. Would something awful come pouring out? Hold on just a second. Tessa scraped a boot through the muck on the floor. There's a picture on the floor. I have to do a quick bit of cleaning, but how? I don't have a wash spell. Mouse hefted her sword off a shoulder. I have a sword, not a mop. You wanted to offer Stephen janitorial services, Tessa? Here's your chance. Tessa cocked her head. I do love sweeping, but Stephen is the master mopper. Let me try something. Stand back. Defensio. He saw what she was trying to do. 
He, Mouse, and Aria climbed up onto the table. He hoped they didn't trigger anything, not yet. The barista cast a wind spell that they normally used to combat the toxicity exhalant. A hurricane breeze struck the floor, pushing the dirt and grime off the tiles. It was like she had a leaf blower in full destructo mode. She walked around the chamber, cleaning off the image. Stephen used a shield spell to lift them high into the air. The light of his sword rained down, illuminating the picture. Tessa was sweating when she floated up to them, standing on a gleaming platform of pink light. Yes, there was a series of images there. The first picture was on their left, three dragons flying toward the earth, a blue-green gem. One was white, another silver, and the last one had black scales edged in gold. They were the three Alferos that had fled to Earth, through space, using stellar flight. The next image was of two dragons, Rahab and Mathal, standing alone, while each Aram went forward into an oasis of people, mostly women. Time had faded the multicolored tiles, the water was a pale blue, nearly white, and the palm trees were a dull green. Lines of white, silver, and black left the hands of the Alferos, corresponding to each of the brothers. The lines twisting across the floor marked three men. The artist had painted dragon script on the robes of each man. Otter Dro, Min Lear, and Mulkred. Tessa's sweat-stained face grew confused. Okay, I know about Otter Dro and Min Lear. They were the legends. I don't remember reading about Mulkred. He was a quitter, Mouse joked. He quit before he made it into the stories, which is why we should never give up, kids. The odd family tree continued, crossing a picture of Icharam, lying in a pool of blood. He knew his brothers were going to kill him, Stephen whispered. That's why he hid his gift. He didn't want Rahab and Mathal to know. Tessa nodded. Yeah, divination magic might have warned him, but look... Walking out of each Aram's blood were two more men. On their robes were their names. Arthur Dracaris and Merlin the Magician. Lines of tiles connected them back to Otter Dro and Min Lear. The truth hit Stephen like a club. He had to say the name out loud. Arthur Dracaris. You are indeed the lost son, Stephen, Ari amused. Tessa connected some of it together. It's why you have such power. Otter Dro was your great, great, great. Add several more greats if you want. Grandfather. And then he had a baby, and yeah, Arthur Dracaris. The start of the great Dracaris line. Stephen saw that each of the robed men looked exactly alike. Otter Dro had his clean-shaven, handsome face, and so did Arthur. Min Lear had his big black beard, and so did Merlin. No, they're the same guys. Both lived for thousands of years. No, their names changed over time, but they are the same men. So I'm distantly related to Mathal, Tessa murmured. Through Merlin. Mouse blinked. Wow, we probably should have been nicer to the old guy. He was family. The rest of the mosaic was clear enough. Somehow Stephen knew it had been fashioned by Icharam himself. He was telling a story he'd divined before his death the creation of the ever-seeing eyes and the gathering of dragon knights. They clustered around a glowing sword. Tessa was kind of baffled. Okay, that's Excalibur, but there's not much about it in any of the books, and we don't know what happened to Arthur or to Merlin once he became the dragon slayer. I don't think they're still alive. Around the dragon knights was more dirt and moss. Tessa flew over and cast another wind spell. She cleaned off the tiles to show Merlin holding the hand of a woman, his Guinevere, without a doubt. Each of the dragon knights was named. It was odd. Nine of the dragon knights in the mosaic didn't have weapons. Three did. Mordred, Lancelot, and Bedivere. And those weapons were pointed at Merlin's Guinevere. Those three knights had killed the woman and unleashed Merlin's fury. A single silver line connected one of the knights, Mordred, to the mysterious Mulcred, and then back to Rahab. Stephen felt his brow furrow. Rahab to Mulcred to Mordred. And wait a minute. Mulcred, as in Mulk, as in Rahagan Mulk. The feud between the brothers had continued on down through history. Rahagan Mulk was dead. 
Stephen had the idea that Mordred was still around, maybe the last descendant who could trace his lineage all the way back to Rahab. Mulcred and Mordred looked nothing alike, but they were related. And so the mystery of the Dracaris family has been solved. Arya put a claw on Stephen's scales. You are a descendant of Icharam, who just might have been the most powerful of the Alpharos. All of this makes a great deal of sense. Mouse shivered. Okay, we got the story. Let's get out of here, get something to eat, and check in with the other teams. We can't trigger the chamber until the others are in place. Stephen agreed. They left the building and flew out and up to the top of the building, where they grabbed their bags. Clouds had come to block out the light, but that didn't slow down the vibrant city any. Finding the area at the top of the Empire State Building was easy. It had a hidden floor like the one at the Antlers Hotel in Colorado Springs. His vassals must have triggered the magic to reveal the landing area, recessed into the building. For being an airy, the place was rather small. It had three rooms, a kitchen, and a living area that gave them spectacular views of the city. No one was there, but there were signs that his vassals had been there. It smelled clean, the refrigerator was fully stocked, and wine was chilling on the counter. The wood floors were polished to a shine, the carpets vacuumed of any dust, and the furniture all in place. Books and bookshelves lined the walls. The Alferos liked to read, even Rahab, and Tessa perused the shelves while Arya had a glass of wine and Mouse went to shower. Stephen walked back onto the landing strip, listening to the city, smelling the smog, and wondering about what they'd seen. A part of him wasn't surprised. His father might not have consciously known his destiny, or maybe he had, but it was clear that Stephen was meant to finish the work Icharam had started, to liberate dragons from their exile. Questions remained, however, including the fates of both Arthur and Merlin. And what was Icharam's gift? No one in the history of the world had been closer to finding out for over ten thousand years. Mouse came out, dressed in a black dress, hooking an earring into an ear. Okay, it's pretty fucking obvious that you tourists want to see New York. We have money, we have time, so let's take a bite out of the Big Apple. Stephen was about to say that he wanted them to rest and get ready for the coming fight. However, when Tessa squeed, he knew it was a lost cause. Javier, Saavedra, and Liam, along with the five widows, were holding Kansas. Sabina, Zoe, and Uchiko were still on the road, heading toward the Outer Banks. The Texas Machine Gun Twins wouldn't get to the Florida Keys until the next night. They did have time. And a lot to think about. Chapter 24 Mordred stood in the Queen's parking garage facing Stephen Dracaris's orange bronco. Even if he hadn't known the plate number, the scorch marks on the top were a dead giveaway. The vehicle had been hit with dragon fire at least once. There were also bashes and gashes that showed it had survived the battle. Somehow. Somehow the Dracaris child had survived every fight. There was a lot of Arthur in him. Arthur's magic and Arthur's luck— Yet the goody-goody white knight fool had encountered the ultimate misfortune in the end. Betting one's life on luck was a risky, tricky thing. As long as fate was on your side, it was all victory and smiles. When fate turned on you, you had no recourse. Zuzana, in her gauzy black dress, sniffed around the bronco, her eyes glowing, lost in a divination spell. She turned. There is nothing. We have the truck. We don't have him. Lancelot, known to most as Louis Lelou, emerged from the shadows wearing a black suit with an orange shirt and matching tie. We, oui, sweet Susanna, no one has him. He jabbed a finger at Mordred. You put your trust in stains in his technology. That will not win this. Dracarys is in New York, but New York is big, no? Then what do you suggest, Lancelot? Mordred asked the dragon lord in his garish black and orange suit. Lancelot shrugged his slender shoulders. He is searching for the Holy Grail in this city. We cannot scry him, but what if we scryed his search? Zuzana limped over to them. I felt the powerful magic in Maine, near a lake, the same lake that held the temple that did not let you pass, for you stood there once, Mordred, with the other dragon knights. Mordred remembered. 
It had been happier times. If only he hadn't made his grand mistake. If only he'd killed Merlin first. Alas, he couldn't take it back, and he'd paid for the sin over and over. And yes, he'd swum to the depths of the temple, but the Lady of the Lake had nearly killed him. He narrowed his eyes. Yes, we wait. We find a perch and wait, and when the time comes, when he does whatever he is here to do, we strike. Lancelot took a cigarette and placed it into a holder. He lit it, inhaled, then breathed out smoke. We will come in as if to fight, and perhaps we might get lucky, but that is not our main purpose. The grail is why we are here. Susanna anticipated Mordred's desires. She removed a cigar from his pocket, bit off the end, and lit it herself. A shadow broke from the darkness, running faster than sight. Umbra plucked the cigar out of Susanna's hand and placed it in Mordred's mouth. Then the dragon was gone, back to where she was hiding among the cars. Mordred laughed at her play, then took in a mouthful of smoke, which he blew out his nose. And we have other business, Lancelot, do we not? The dragon knight nodded. The angel knife, yes, full of animus and ready. We have the body. I can have it flown anywhere in the world. We just need to wait for the right time. Agreed, Mordred paused. And your Gree Gree are ready with their spells? We've been playing with Tracardus's vassals, but when we are ready, we will need them to push forward. I want to be in Colorado as soon as possible. That will give our enemy pause, distract him, while we find the grail. Lancelot laughed. And find it we will. We have waited long enough, brother. We shall rule this world, finally. Mordred pondered the we. For a long time now, he'd seen himself as the Dragonlord Prime ruling over a primacy that covered the blue-green gem. Yet now, he wasn't so sure he wanted it all for himself. He'd been with Lancelot for a long time, and they'd survived a great deal. Perhaps they could rule together. He laughed at himself. Perhaps. Mordred would play the game one move at a time. Panga Kamong has disappeared, Susanna said quietly. He is in America, that is certain. Lancelot cackled, smoked, cackled some more. Of course he is. We all feel the end coming. The wheels of history are coming to crush us all. Mordred wasn't sure why Lancelot was laughing. What the hell? Mordred laughed along with him. He was surprised at how good it felt. A car pulled up. Inside were Mordred's most trusted soldiers, two women, needles and clutch, as well as a man. Court Collot. Do we have a plan? Court asked. He leaned a cheek on his assault rifle. We do indeed, Mordred replied. Twenty-four hours passed quickly for Stephen. It was dizzying keeping up with Tessa in full shopping mode. They bought outfits, tried them on, ate thin crust pizza, which he liked, but Mouse wasn't sold on. She proclaimed that Chicago pizza was the best possible pizza in all possible worlds. It was the platonic ideal. Aria went off script and protested that the Colorado kind was the best. All hail Bo Joe's. Given the number of times he'd trekked to Idaho Springs to eat it, Stephen wholeheartedly agreed. They went to Times Square, they flew around the top of the Statue of Liberty, and they even rode the subway just for fun. Of course, they had to run Central Park, and they all said how much Zoe would have loved it. She and Sabina had found their Red Star chamber in the Outer Banks, and it was set up the same as the one in New York, but without the mosaic history lesson. The Wayne twins reached the Florida Keys without an issue. They took shots of tequila and found their own chamber, under an island, weeping seawater. Instead of a claw print in the stone table, however, there was a slot for an animus dagger. They agreed they would all activate their various chambers at precisely midnight that night. The hours went by quickly, and soon enough, Stephen, Aria, Tessa, and Mouse were back in the vast chamber underneath the abandoned apartment building in the Red Hook District of Brooklyn. Stephen and Mouse shifted into their true forms. Tessa was ready with revolvers and spells. Aria, as a homo draconis, approached the round table. Stephen counted down to midnight. Three, two, one. Now, Aria. She slammed her talons onto the table. Her eyes lit up and she let out a scream. 
The round culverts on the walls gleamed. Fire coughed out of one, ice tumbled out of another, and from a third crackled lightning. The last opening lit up, the air alive and vibrant, and there was a whomp, followed by a terrible silence. It was chromatic fury. The apocalyptic energy spat from the culvert and struck the table, turning the statues of Quinestri and Icharam to ash. Arya, thankfully, was thrown back. The table shot upward, bashing through the rock, which melted around it, dropping lava to the floor. It continued to rise, shooting upward. After it, Stephen cried. The hole it created wasn't wide enough for their wings, but Tessa was there grabbing them up in a telekinesis spell. Stephen and his dragon soul wives followed Tessa up to the opening, racing up through ten stories of ruined hallways and apartments. Stephen kept his sword and arms tucked close to his body. The minute they reached the sky, he shifted into his partial form and opened his wings. Arya turned into a full dragon, as did Mouse. The table was a blinding light. Stephen figured Icharam would have used Enchantrix or some other spell to hide it from human eyes. Sabina's voice filled Stephen's mind. I'm in the sky, over the island, and look, look west. Stephen turned and saw that the table was throwing a spear of light across the night sky to the horizon. The supernova of magic filled him. His consciousness was flung across the countryside, the lights of New York fading into the dark strip of the Appalachian Mountains and across the farmlands, where small towns lay like glowing diamonds of light on the black velvet of the land. And then, into Kansas, and then into a raised hill, dotted with tombstones. I'm seeing it, Tessa cried. I think we all are, Mouse answered. Stephen didn't know how he knew, but the name of the town came to him. Dodge City. That was where Icharam's tomb lay, in the cemetery to the west of the city, a place called Duquesne Hill. Of course, his adventures would take him back to the west, to that iconic town. He was kind of surprised it hadn't pointed to Boot Hill, or was that even around anymore? Then he was back above New York City, and after seeing how empty most of the American lands were, the vast metropolis seemed even grander. They had the location of Icharam's gift. Four other dragons shot forward. Stephen recognized the tiger dragon first. The orange on his body caught the fading light of the table, which had turned into a piece of charcoal, crumbling away in the winds. The tiger dragon's black beard hung low off his chin. Though he was small, he was definitely male. Another dragon, small and black, flashed upward, and he recognized her as well. It was Umbra who'd served Bedivere, and now had a new master. Her banded magical staff was connected to her wrist by a length of cable. The last two were mysteries. One was a bright metallic silver creature with needle-like spines rising up from her back. The other female was a dark brownish-red, burgundy. Her claws were massive, too large for her body. Each of her talons was as long as a sword. Both of those females had been altered using flesh forge. Neither the needles nor those huge talons were natural. The tiger dragon snaked through the sky, flying fast, and before they could stop him, he grabbed Tessa around her middle and then dove back down to the top of the abandoned apartment building, which had been torn to shreds by the table. Stephen had to grin. That dragon had grabbed the wrong woman. Chapter 25 Tessa's first bullet bounced off Tiger Boy's shield, so she encantoed the hell out of him. Then she punched him right in his spirit using Animus Chain. He let out a grunt of pain and dumped her on the top of the building. She rolled across the roof and nearly fell down the hole the ever-seeing eye had blown through the building. There must have been electricity because the hallway lights were on. She had a good view all the way down to the basement to the chamber beneath. Bullets peppered her pink shield from some big awful machine gun. From being around the Texas Twins, she recognized the chugga-chugga of the weapon. A man in Call of Duty armor fired at her as she bounced to her feet. She'd lost her revolvers in the landing. That was the best-case scenario. Worst case, they'd fall into the streets below. Next to the Whirling stood Morty Flint, naked with his big belly covering most of his private parts. That was a blessing. He lifted a hand. Purple light collected around it. Tessa needed to communicate with her people, and she needed to anticipate whatever spell Morty was going to cast. From the looks of it, whatever magic he was about to lay down was bound to be a doozy. Divinatio, 
Names flooded her mind. Morty Flint? Nope. Welcome to Mordred. Population asshole. The tiger dragon was Lancelot. Needles had the needles on her back, duh, and Miss Burgundy Big Hands was Clutch. Those two wives were famous. Lastly, the warling was Court Calot, a total battle dog. Mordred reached into Tessa's core. She could feel his awful fingers in her, but she encantoed that spell away. Just in time. Defensio. She used telekinesis to shove Court into his master. That gave her a minute. She reached out and let Stephen, Mouse, and Arya know the names of their enemies. They shouldn't be surprised since Mordred and Lancelot were players in an ancient drama and the Dracarys escort had just run onto the main stage. Full center. Thank you very much. Chromatic Fury, from one of the dragons, tore out a good chunk of the floors directly under them. The entire roof tilted to the side. Tessa saw a vision of her pistols to her right. She grabbed one, then the other, before she spun down into the hole. She wound up on her ass in an apartment. Above her, Mordred had turned into a white homo draconis, with dark purple edges to his scales. He breathed fire down on her and she rolled to the side. The floor caught fire. Of course it did. A swaying, half-destroyed apartment building wasn't any fun unless it was also wreathed in flames. She took off running into the hallway. She got to the edge of the building. It was still smoking from the chromatic fury. The concrete had melted away, showing rebar glowing red hot. Tessa caught a glimpse of needles flying back first into mouse. At the last minute, the amber dragon turned into her partial form. Green flames enveloped her sword. She sliced into needles. It was a nice, solid, bloody strike. The scales healed over in seconds. A magic Akura spell, no doubt. She went to bite at Mouse, but the smaller dragon flew off before Needles could get her teeth into her. Tessa lost sight of them. Her divination spell was still in effect. She could anticipate the next enemy who would come into view. That would be Clutch, chasing Arya. Tessa aimed and put a hole in the burgundy dragon. The wounded worm roared, but she didn't stop. Then there was Lancelot, exchanging impetum fire with Stephen. Tiger Guy took a break to heal Clutch. Then he pumped his wings and came smashing down into the building. Tessa couldn't see it, but she pictured him slamming his feet into windows and holding onto the roof as he opened his mouth to breathe death upon her. His fanged maw took up the entire hallway. Tessa thought about putting a bullet in his gullet, but there were other assholes coming in after her. Mordred and his whirling dog. She cast a shield spell just in time. Shadow flame turned the hallway into hell. Everything not burning burst into flames, even the concrete. Tessa coughed in the smoke. She turned and ran through the fire to the hole and then used telekinesis to float down through floors trying to get away. She'd made it down to maybe the sixth floor when a tail caught her and flung her against the wall. She landed at the feet of Mordred. The villain just had to sneer. You look like Merlin, Tessa. Do you have his rage and bloodlust? She'd cast multiple spells back to back, and she felt the drain on her. Good thing Morty had a big ball of purple animus inside him. She grabbed a handful. He clawed her. She managed to dodge most of the attack, but he opened a gash on her forehead. The blood blinded her. She tried to get a revolver up, and it was knocked away. A sickle on a chain snuck out and hacked into Mordred's shoulder. He was yanked back by Uchiko, who'd stayed behind after all. It was nice to have a rogue ninja on their side. Another batch of chromatic fury burst through the wall behind her, taking out another bunch of apartments and melting the concrete of the hallway. Umbra snaked in and turned into her human form, complete with a staff glowing orange. She was getting up her speed to become a blur, but Mouse was having none of that. The amber homo draconis tackled her. The two rolled across the floor down from Tessa. In seconds, the two were up fighting, sword against staff. Mouse wasn't going to be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Umbra, not with how fast the black dragon lady was. Tessa, choking, blinking the blood out of her eyes, grabbed a revolver. She raised it and put her sights on Umbra. Nope, she wasn't going to risk a shot, not with how fast that chick was and not with blood in her eyes. Her divination spell had ended. Tessa reached out and pulled a good dose of animus from the speedster. That slowed her down enough for Mouse to drive her sword into Umbra's gut. The other side of the hallway exploded. Sheetrock dust and debris billowed through the corridor, and now everyone was going to have trouble seeing. 
In the swirl of destruction, Tessa caught a brief flash of Stephen, in his human form, fighting Lancelot, who had changed both of his arms into bone swords. The Dragon Knight was showing off his flesh-forged skills. Great. Mordred broke free from Uchiko's sickle. He grabbed the ninja and hurled her down the hole in the floor. The disgraced dragon skin had saved Tessa, and the barista was going to return the favor. She threw herself down after Uchiko, using a telekinesis spell to grab the ninja and float them down another few floors. They were close to the chamber below, which was puking up steam from where the magic in the four culverts had washed down into the cave. Fire... Ice, lightning, and chromatic fury energies crackled and spat. Tessa and Uchiko landed on the hallway of the first floor with a thud. Uchiko was unconscious, but alive. Tessa had somehow managed to keep her peacekeepers. She holstered one and readied the other. She didn't have to wait long. The thunder of the battle followed them. Needles came crashing through the floor of another apartment, followed by Clutch. Both were homo draconi with smiles on their faces. The burgundy dragon's hands were huge talons on her slim body. It was somewhat unnerving. Tessa could ignore it, though. She felt their dragon soul energy, and she wanted it. She powered up her revolver with ion gun. It became so bright that both of the homo draconi had to squint. Needles ran toward her. For a split second, Tessa thought about using heart strike, but knew there was a high price to pay for that magic. And these dragon souls had underestimated her aim and her gun— Tessa shot Clutch right between the eyes. She wouldn't be healing that hole any time soon. Needles let out a guttural howl. She didn't have to suffer the loss of her friend for long. Tessa shot her twice in the chest and once in the head. She went down, turning human as she did. Finally, they were evening the odds, and the animus Tessa collected made her head swim. She couldn't help but giggle. Hot damn. Slaying dragons was fun. Someone struck Tessa hard in the back, and she was sent flying into a wall. Debris rained down on them, and the entire apartment building was swaying back and forth. The structure creaked, cracked, and moaned. It was going to come down on them at any minute. She turned. Court had a gleaming purple knife in his fist. He went to drive it into her chest. Stephen, though, had other ideas. He stood behind them along with Mouse and Arya, scratched to shit and bleeding. They'd had to become human to fight in the hallway. Excrucior! The tip of his chain whip sword erupted from Court's chest. His heart had been shish kebobbed. The whirling fell to his knees and toppled forward onto his face, as dead as dead could be. Mordred had somehow found his way down to them. He was on the other end of the hallway in his human form. Unbelievably, he smiled. This has all been very interesting, but Lancelot and I have a package waiting for us in Dodge City. We were there. We saw the location of... What is it called? Oh, yes. Ichiram's gift. How prosaic. It will finally be mine. Finally! He spun around and ran directly toward the wall at the end of the corridor. Tessa raised her gun and fired. Her shot went wide. Mordred was growing ever bigger, from human to homo draconis and then into his true form. He rammed his way out of the wall and took off. The apartment building had taken a beating, but losing another wall so close to the ground was the final straw. It's like a bad Jenga move, Tessa whispered. The entire structure came crashing down on top of them. Stephen's shield saved them. The black force field snapped and popped above them, stopping car-sized chunks of concrete from crushing them. He was on his knees, hands over his head. Tessa's peacekeeper still glowed from her ion gun ability. That gave them light, but it was still hard to see. Not only did drywall dust swirl around them, but steam from the chamber below coughed into their little cavern of safety. Mouse coughed. Well, that went well, kind of. I don't think I killed Umbra. She got a belly full of Slayer Blade, but I didn't feel the burst of animus. That'll make the twins happy, Tessa said weakly. She wiped blood from her eyes. The gash on her forehead continued to bleed. They tried to kill Umbra as well. Enough, Arya shouted. She was pale and she looked five seconds away from a heart attack. We need to get out, or we'll suffocate, we'll die. Trapped under this place. Trapped! Uchiko in her ninja garb tried to rise, but she slumped back down. 
Stephen was surprised to see her. He assumed Sabina had seen something and sent the dragon skin back to help them. He was glad. Going up against the dragon knights and their vassals had nearly destroyed them. This is bad, but at least Mordred is down to forty-one wives, Tessa tried to joke. Arya was too far gone for humor. She flung herself against a slab of cement next to them. She clawed at the concrete until Tessa eased her back. Arya, we'll get out of here, I promise. We'll find a way. Girlfriend has the claustrophobia, Mouse murmured. How are we going to get out of this one, my prime? He didn't know, but his shield spell would fail at some point. With the shifting wreckage above them, they'd be crushed before he could cast another one. Even if they tried a second spell, getting it in place would be tricky. A mistake would be fatal. Mouse sighed at his silence. Well, this is terrible. We know where Icharam's gift is, but so do our enemies. Hooray for them. Tessa pulled Arya away and the Indian woman clung to her. The barista locked eyes with Stephen. She turned deadly serious. I'm tired of being attacked. I'm tired of these dragons coming at us. I'm going to kill them all, Stephen. Once we get out of here, and we will get out of here, I'm going on the warpath. He didn't mention that she sounded like the dragon slayer. He closed his eyes and reached out. Someone was coming. Their animus was off the charts, and it reminded him of a dragon knight. Who could it be? Not Mordred or Lancelot. They were on their way to Dodge City. The chunk of concrete marked by Arya's claws tumbled backward. The building shifted again, and the weight on Stephen grew exponentially heavier. His shield flickered. More cement was moved, until a narrow channel opened. A yellow and green scaled Homo Draconis stood there, his jet black face solemn. He had an ornate dragon image branded on his neck. A spicy smell wafted off him cardamom, cloves, nutmeg. It was Nawashi. But that simply meant gardener in Japanese. He had to have a different name. Come with me, the mysterious dragon soul said. Tessa thrust Arya away. The barista blew the dragon backward with a flick of her hand. She then charged him. Tessa, wait, she ignored him. While Arya might have lost her courage, trapped under the building, it seemed Tessa had lost her mind. Chapter 26 Stephen, holding Uchiko, squeezed through the opening and out onto the street. The apartment building was a pile of devastation above them. Mouse and Aria had already made it out. They were both in human form, bent over, coughing. Tessa had blown the dragon known as Niwashi onto his back. She pulled a peacekeeper. Stephen dropped Uchiko and threw a shoulder into the barista, knocking her off balance. She stumbled to her left, but didn't fall. Defensio! She crushed Stephen into the building with a force field. Encanto! He canceled her shield spell and then cast Animus Chain. Just as he was about to steal her energy, she countered that with another dispel magic charm. She reached into his Animus, but he struck her attack aside with a force field. She dropped her pistol and cast another shield spell. Her pink force field hit his black one, and the pair grunted against each other, trying to force each other back. Stephen had to grit his teeth to speak. Tessa... We have a lot of fighting ahead of us. We don't know what Nawashi wants. He saved us. We should at least talk to him. Angry tears tracked down the barista's cheeks. So he can turn on us again? So he can toy with us like Mordred did? No, I am not going to trust anyone ever again. Look! Stephen thundered. Uchiko had crawled over to the downed yellow-green dragon soul. The ninja was stroking the mysterious dragon's cheek. She spoke softly in Japanese. The dragon soul's eyes fluttered open. If I move, will I die? He asked the question wryly, a little grin on his draconian face. He spoke with a slight Japanese accent. Yes, Tessa said. No. Stephen gave a final growl and shoved Tessa back. Her shield failed and she was sent sprawling. She pulled herself to her feet and stalked off. Sirens wailed in the distance. The humans were coming. Stephen knew that once they removed the ruins, they'd find Icharam's cave underneath. By that time, it would have been wiped clean by the magic pouring out of the culverts. They might be mystified, but there would be nothing left for them to link the destruction to anything supernatural. Chosen Ben would probably tell them it was a gas leak and not to worry about it. Stephen was shaky after his fight with Tessa. He'd had to fight his escort before. Mouse and their duel came to mind. 
but he'd rather fight an entire army of Zotharic than face down one of his own. The yellow-green dragon eased himself away from Uchiko. I'm moving. Don't kill me just yet. I would like a cup of coffee, just one more before I die. It's been a long journey here, but full of wonder, and fried rings of dough. They are delicious, but I cannot remember what they are called. Tessa came storming back. They're called donuts, you fucking moron! Mouse spat out a sarcastic cackle. Well, if anything can bring us together, it'll be fried rings of dough. With icing or chocolate or colored bits of sugar? What's the word? The yellow-green dragon stood and turned human, a powerfully muscled Asian man with black hair flecked with white. A little bit of grizzled beard covered his neckline. His eyes were wrinkled with age. Sprinkles? Tessa offered, still breathing hard. Nawashi snapped his fingers. Sprinkles, yes, that is it. I'm Panga Komong, and I have come to see if Stephen Dracaris is who I think he is. Panga Komong owned an empire as mighty as Stephen's. Of course he did. This ancient dragon soul was so old and powerful. Arya let out a long breath. She was still pale, but she was gathering her strength. Stephen is the lost son, the last scion of the Dracaris family, and in him runs the blood of Icharam. Well put, Thirteen. Nawashi inhaled deeply. Now, let's find clothes and a coffee shop, preferably one that serves coffee and doughnuts, one with sprinkles, as many colors as possible. Fashion should not be a part of food. They stopped off at the Empire State Airy to get more clothes and a pack for the coming flight out to Kansas. This time it was going to be hardcore dragon flight, as fast as they could fly, to get to Dodge City. Stephen checked in with Javier. Bad news on the Kansas front. A hundred magicians had broken through Javier's defenses. Casualties were light. Liam and the five widows had survived. But the fighting was brutal. Worse yet, Dodge City had fallen to Mordred's forces. They were going to have to land inside enemy territory to claim Icharam's gift. The rest of Stephen's escort, Sabina, Zoe, the twins, were already on their way. They were going to meet in Hutchinson, Kansas, about a hundred miles east of Dodge City. Hutchinson had one of the largest grain elevators in the world, as well as a space museum. Sabina had a vision of them camping outside of the town, near a river, and she said amazing things would happen there. She wasn't specific. From their secret camp, they would strike at Dodge City. In the bedroom of the suite, Tessa pulled Stephen aside to apologize. Seeing Arya upset had shaken her up, and she'd been riding high on the animus from needles and clutch. Court Kalat's energy had been far less satisfying for Stephen. Tessa wound up in his arms, holding him tight. She didn't cry. She merely clung to him, head buried in his chest, as he smelled her slightly cherry scent. This journey had been hard on her, but she was coming to terms with her history, and they were about to get the rest of Merlin's story. Because Panga Komong wasn't simply another dragon lord hiding in the shadows, he'd known the dragon knights, and Arthur had even offered to knight him. Panga had declined. Stephen remembered he'd had a vision of that conversation. Uchiko was taking the appearance of her old teacher well, given the circumstances. She said it was Stephen's love that gave her strength. In the end, she'd helped kill Rahab, which was what Panga had trained her to do. But why had Panga wanted Rahab dead? They were about to find out. They found an all-night diner off some busy street in the heart of New York City. They didn't have donuts, but they had beignets, and that seemed okay with Panga. They had a big back booth, so Uchiko could join them, wearing her anti-pollution dust mask and an NYU hoodie, both black. Panga ate the last of the beignets and licked his fingers. Well, now, this fried dough is exceptionally good. No sprinkles, though, Tessa frowned, hand on her coffee mug. Can you forgive me for hitting you? The Asian dragon cocked his head to the side. I was very surprised. I thought I would get the hero's welcome. Then I found myself on the ground. He laughed and then grew serious. Your temper is like Merlin's. He could be sweet and funny until he lost himself in his rage. That's our Tessa. Mouse was eating waffles, as many as she could cram into her little body. They were all ravenous. Stephen had pretty much eaten a pig all by himself. He was itching to get going, and Panga saw it. So you've told me that you know the location of the Holy Grail. Panga paused to smile. 
Sorry, that is obviously the human term. Icharam's gift is more to the point. Arthur and Merlin never called it that, though. I see you are worried that Mordred and Lancelot will find it first. That will be impossible, I assure you. How can you know? Stephen asked. Ponga furrowed his brows. How can you question me? He realized how that sounded and he took a few steps back. He softened it with a grin. My grandfather, Mathal, he said that it would be very hard to find, and that only someone his brother truly trusted would be allowed to take control of it. Back then it wasn't the grail. He called it the weapon, and even grandfather wasn't sure it existed. Icharam hid it well, so well. Wait, back up, Mouse said. Tessa sat there blinking. What? Who? Wait, what? You're Mathal's grandson? Ponga shrugged. Yes, we were related, but then all dragon souls can trace their lineage back to one of the Alferos. I'm his grandson. We were never close, however. Merlin was kin to Mathal as well, I think. He was, Tessa affirmed. We saw a mosaic that traced his lines back to him. Mouse swallowed a big chunk of waffle. No offense, but you weren't mentioned in the tiles. So yeah, awkward, but you might be just one more asshole trying to trick us. Punga laughed at that. It was clear he liked to laugh. No, I won't trick you. I want to join you. I see much of Arthur in you, Stephen. You have made such an impression in your short time. Icharam had such strong blood. You will win his gift because you've already been given the Lady of the Lake's blessing. Mordred tried to reach the temple under Lyra Lake and he was rejected. The same will happen in Dodge City. You have time. There is no hurry. And while I like the beignets... I would like a donut with sprinkles on them before this long night is through. Stephen checked his gut. What Ponga was saying felt right, yet he still had to ask, Why join us? I didn't join the Dragon Knights before. It is one of my many regrets, and I have grown bored with Dragon Lords, their incessant drive to collect more primacies, their greed, their lust. Let's get ourselves off this bit of rock floating through the nothing. Ponga searched their faces. My mind isn't as clear as it used to be. I fear I might lose my wits like my grandfather did. I do not want that to happen until I've explored more of this universe. That put a somberness in the air. Even Tessa ate her pancakes without making another joke. Ponga continued. My primacies are yours, Stephen. My vassals, even my wives, if you want them. With my forces behind you... The two remaining Australian primes will fall into line as well as many, many others. No dragon lord has ever had your might. You are missing but one thing, Icharam's gift. With that, we will be ready to end the Zotharic threat. Question, Tessa said abruptly. What's the best kind of bear? Mouse asked. Aria waved her hands. No bears, no beats, no Battlestar Galactica. You two and your popular culture references. Tessa, please, just ask your question. Before the barista could speak, Uchiko broke in. Why did you want me to kill Rahab? Why train me at all? Ponga was wearing a dark green t-shirt. He pulled down the collar to reveal the brand of a dragon marking his flesh. Stephen had thought it was a tattoo, but no. It was scar tissue with a definite pattern. Rahab gave that to me. He mocked me, telling me that I had to remember I was a dragon and not a human. I lived too freely with the people of this world. He thought it was despicable that his own brother's kin didn't sequester himself away. I hated him. When you came to me, sweet dear Oe Uchiko, I saw a way to strike at him. I was too afraid and I'm ashamed. Sometimes I have great courage. Other times I am cowardly. I hope I have improved over the millennia, but I most likely haven't. And thus I am a mystery to myself. He paused. His smile grew wan and his eyes unfocused. It was a different time back then, with the Dragon Slayer murdering every one of us he could find, friend and foe alike. Stephen shivered. He could sense the truth. The Dragon Slayer had killed many of Ponga's friends. Tessa could feel it too. She broke in. Merlin killed Arthur. Ponga smiled sadly and nodded. There were tears in his eyes. Merlin was on the cusp of finding Icharam's gift. Mordred and his dark brothers knew it, and they feared that a human with such power would try and rule them. They went to murder Merlin and killed Guinevere instead, thinking to break the magician's spirit. 
Merlin's spirit was broken, but his vengeance gave him new life. Arthur went to both comfort and confront his old friend. The pair fought, and in a fit of rage, Merlin slew his greatest friend, perhaps the greatest dragon lord this world has ever known. Arthur fell. Merlin didn't slow. We were all afraid we'd be next. Tessa leaned in close and gripped Stephen's hand. Their fight seemed ominous now. He'd sworn he'd never again raise a fist or spell against one of his own. Perhaps Arthur had thought the same thing. Even Mouse had slowed eating. Arya leaned forward. And Merlin's fate? After decades of slaughter, his rage finally cooled. He came to this continent heartbroken, alone, knowing a sadness few could ever understand. I met him in the Rocky Mountains one winter, and he asked that I forgive him. I did, but the damage was done. He drifted to Oregon, where he created a message for his daughter and Arthur's lost son. Arthur had many wives, many daughters, but only one boy. He would become the first Rakaris. Stephen took in a breath and let it out slowly. We called the chamber with the twelve statues on the Oregon coast the Dragon Knight Chamber. That's where we found Arya's animus daggers. And I miss them so much, Arya put in, breaking the somber tone a bit. I love you all, even you, Mouse and Uchiko, but I love my daggers more. Liar, Tessa said a little loudly. You totally love us more than your electricity knives. A few of the late-night patrons threw them a disapproving glance. Tessa leaned in closer to Stephen. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry I've been so... so dark side lately. You need to stop that shit like yesterday, Mouse said, feigning annoyance. Being the kind, loving wife has exhausted me. Being nice and non-sarcastic all the time is fucking unbearable. It took a minute and then Tessa let out a laugh. Stephen joined her and even Arya smiled. Ponga had no idea what was going on. He still laughed raucously. It was a welcome relief to all the seriousness. They paid their bill and left. The traffic had died down a bit and they walked down to Central Park. They found a place to transform, picking up their bags and their claws. Tessa was in her heavy gear, which would work for lower altitudes, but when they climbed higher, she used shield spells to wrap herself up in a protective layer of magic. She and Steven could share energy, thanks to Animus Chain. Uchiko stood aloof. What about me? she asked. Ponga turned to give her a long look. I can carry you and help protect you from the worst of the winds. I truly hope that you will be made whole someday. Can you forgive me for turning my back on you? She bowed. I can, Pangasan, I have. And soon, very soon, Stephen and his friends will restore me. We are close, very close. He bowed back. I hope so. I feel honored to have been your teacher. You have played an important role in the rise of the great Stephen Drakaris, and you served my grandfather well for many years. You are a fine person, Uchiko, a very fine person indeed. Uchiko put on her warm motorcycle gear, including the helmet, and climbed onto Ponga's back. Are you sure we can't Uber there? Mouse hated long-distance dragon flight more than anyone, and no one liked it at all. She gave Stephen a mournful look. Ugh, what about the orange crush? We can't just abandon her. I know I could drive the old girl back to Cheyenne. Chosen Ben can take care of it in time, Arya responded. No more delays, Mouse. We must go. The five dragons left the lights of New York City behind them. It was going to be a long night of flying. Chapter 27 Tessa pushed her face into Stephen's scales. The wind whistled over them. Long-distance dragon flight involved gaining altitude, then swooping down using a mixture of gravity and wind speed. Albatrosses did a variation of this, and they could fly 60 miles an hour. Stephen added a dragon strength and serpent grace to fuel him further. With her on his back, he couldn't go his full 500 miles an hour, but he was eating up the distance. She took a break from the screaming winds every once in a while by casting a shield spell that covered every inch of her. It was the same magic she'd used to dive down into Lyra Lake. She had long hours to think about her fight with Stephen. He'd forgiven her, and yes, she hadn't used anything lethal against him, not her pistols, and not even her telekinesis, yet she still didn't like that they'd fought at all. She loved him. She adored him. 
and she was going to marry him. She went through the dragon soul vows again in her head. I am your strong fist, and I will be your strength just as you will be mine. I am your living soul, and I will be your heart just as you will be mine. Those words touched her so much. No, their short fight was her low point with this bloodlust thing. She'd never ever do that again, and she wouldn't have to. They would defeat the evil dragon knights and win Ichiram's gift. And if Stephen fell, she'd fall right along with him. Either they would have their thousands of years together or they wouldn't. She wouldn't follow Merlin's path of murder and vengeance. It was unlikely that Mordred would be able to complete the quest, but they had other things to worry about. His army was nearly to the Colorado border. If they removed the Dragon Knights, their forces would fail, and their vassals would have to embrace Stephen as their prime. Chosen Ben already had. Sabina was in contact with the New England Dragon Lord. The Latina magician had reported that both the Prime and Chickadee Hams were on their way to reinforce Stephen's armies at the Colorado border. They were hunkered down in Burlington off I-70. The New England Prime had a good squad of warlings, morphlings, and magicians. The Colorado border would hold. It had to. If it didn't, the Dragon Knights had a straight shot to Cherry Creek. And Jared. Though that kid was used to war, he'd been fighting a losing battle with his body for most of his life. Tessa wanted to change that. She'd been practicing Flesh Forge. Like Stephen, she'd been able to heal cuts and bruises by rebuilding the cells. Both were close to breaking the mystery of the magic. And it could be that Panga Komong could help them. She was glad he had joined them. The wily old dragon soul was a powerful weapon in their fight. Nevertheless, Tessa knew that the final conflict would end up between Stephen's escort and Mordred's forces. It always had in the past. Tessa watched the land go from shadows to a ghostly gray as the sun rose behind them. The Midwest had record temperatures after the blizzard, and the land had become a morass of mud, the rivers swollen and brown from the runoff. Farms created a patchwork quilt on the landscape, their little homes looking so cozy. The sun warmed her. The shield spell was nice and kept her insulated, but there was nothing like sunlight to really make you feel alive and comfortable. She was half-plant. She knew it. She and Stephen swooped down into a clearing of cottonwood trees. Tents had been set up for them. These weren't just little pup tents, but big, multi-people tents with an entryway, a place for your stuff and nice awnings. Inside would be bedding. They hadn't been able to stay at a hotel or an airy because Kansas was now officially owned by Mordred. Word had it he ruled the Miami Dixie primacy as well as the Carolina primacy. Sabina had taken over the logistics of setting up the camp. She had chosen an elevated sandy bank so they wouldn't get too muddy. The river itself was below them, a good twenty feet. They weren't on the floodplain. Nevertheless, they would have to keep an eye on the river. The Latina magician had enlisted the help of local vassals who were still loyal to Stephen. They'd never liked Candler much, nor Morty Flint. One magician told Sabina that Candler was dead. They didn't have the details of the Dragon Lord's death, only that his wives had felt his passing. The rings on their left ring fingers had melted away, and they could sense his animus no longer. Tessa wondered at how powerful the marriage connection would be. Well, she'd soon learn. She slipped off Stephen. They'd been flying for six hours. They'd only taken a couple of breaks because they all wanted to get back together with Stephen's full escort. Zoe accidentally knocked the barista over, getting to Stephen. The big bear girl banged on his scales. Turn human, now. I want to hug the shit out of you. He agreed by shifting into a very naked prime. Zoe squeezed him hard, kissed him harder, and then dragged him off to a tent. Stephen called over his shoulder. I could use the animus. I'll be back. Ponga was dressing when the twins approached. Well, shit, Prue, if it ain't Ponga, come on. Both were in pink parkas with tight jeans and hiking boots, normal and brown. Tessa wondered if she should be worried. The twins looked relatively tame. Were those L.L. Bean hiking boots? She would have thought the twins would be allergic to such a well-known brand. The Asian dragon quirked an eyebrow at them. Should I know you? I feel like I should know you. Chazzy knocked her sister with an elbow. Told you he was real, and he's kind of cute in an older Asian man sort of way. Yeah, kind of cute, and very grandfatherly. Do we bow? I feel like we should bow. 
Both twins bowed. Uchiko shook her head at them, but kept quiet. Handshakes work as well, twins. Tessa took the sisters and shoved them forward. Chazzy shook Ponga's hand, then pruded. When the Wayne sisters heard that the great dragon lord was backing Stephen, their smiles grew wider, their eyes cooler. Like Tessa, they weren't about to trust anyone. Oh, really? That certainly is interesting news, Prue said. So did you bring your millions of vassals for this fight? Ponga grinned. I thought I would be enough. Uh-huh. Chazzy pierced the Asian dragon with her gaze. Well, now, it ain't every day you meet a myth, so, uh, there's that. Prue raised her eyebrows. Maybe someday we'll even meet Spiderfinger. Do you myths hang out like that? I've heard of Spiderfinger, Ponga replied easily, but he wasn't at the Myths and Legends Conference. I believe it's held yearly in Denver. The twins glanced at each other. Their eyes spoke volumes. They turned to give Ponga the fakest smiles in the history of pretty girls smiling at men they didn't trust. Tessa didn't think Ponga noticed. At least, she'd only tried to kill him. The Wayne sisters would do more diabolical things to the poor guy if he turned out to be a villainous turncoat. He did seem to be a mystery, smiling one minute, serious the next. Tessa hoped they could trust him. She wasn't sure she would handle being betrayed very well. Stephen looked up into Zoe's eyes. The blue material of the tent shined from the sunlight. He lay on his back. She straddled him, and both were naked. They'd pushed the sleeping bags and mats away, and so he felt the cold, wet ground on his skin. He'd just finished inside of her, and she was breathing heavily, her face sweaty. Those blue-green eyes, so pretty, bore into him. They remained there, motionless, both drinking in the other's face. Stephen didn't feel like he needed to talk at all. They'd grown so comfortable with each other. Zoe was the first one to crack. Missed you. Her grin was lopsided and adorable. Missed you too. He pulled her down to feel her small breasts flatten against the muscles on his chest. He stroked her back. You did great going off with Sabina. I did, didn't I? She murmured into his ear. She laughed and gave him a nibble, which made him shiver. They got dressed and left the tent. Tessa was making coffee, frying up bacon and whipping together eggs. Zoe hurried to help her. They were waiting on a report from Javier Jones. Saavedra and his willbreakers were running recon in Dodge City, scoping out the landscape. They would relay their communication back to Javier, who would then get in touch with Sabina. Stephen found Uchiko by the river, watching the brown water flowing through the greening grasses and the cottonwoods heavy with buds. He'd gone on his first adventure last spring, and the smells were similar. Wet spring scents of mud, rain, and new buds emitting their subtle perfume. Uchiko was still dressed in her warmest motorcycle gear. She wasn't wearing her mask. Her face was split down the middle, one side human, the other serpentine. The divide included her scalp. Her black hair on the right side of her head hung to her shoulder. Is everything okay? He asked. I am tired, she whispered. And the memories of the past haunt me. Seeing Iwashi, Panga again, makes me wonder about myself, who I am, who I was meant to be. Perhaps I am not meant to live. He took her hand. Instead of saying a word, he closed his eyes. The animus from the sex with Zoe was still fresh inside him. He'd gotten used to feeling the power in his own cells, and so he reached out to feel the energy inside Uchiko. He felt how her flesh had tried to become malleable, to change from human to dragon soul, and how it had failed. Her scales, her eyes, her mouth, her body, it could all be changed. He saw that it could. He and Tessa had linked the illusion spell at the Infinity Ranch to Denise's and Femi's animus cores. Bud had been relatively quiet lately, probably working overtime on the Australian legal battles as well as keeping his babes full of energy. Good thing he was young. Maybe that was why he'd looked so exhausted on the video call they'd done in Glick's cabin up in Maine. Denise and Femi were running him ragged. Uchiko raised a claw and touched his face. What is it, my prime? What are you seeing? A way of adjusting both your animus and your body. I think Tessa and I can do it. I want you to try now, before this battle, 
Nothing would please me more than to walk into this war with you, to show Panga that I am restored and that I am strong. If I survive, I too want to marry you. Both of her eyes, round pupil and vertical slit, shined with fire. I will be your wife, if you will have me. Tessa approached them. Whoa, what's going on? You two are ultra serious. I could feel all that seriousness from the camp. Zoe took over cooking. I have a minute. What's up? Stephen was speechless. This was the worst time to try anything like this, but he knew Uchiko wouldn't back down. He shouldn't have said anything. Of course, she'd jump on the chance to be restored, and that was what he would do. He would return her body to that of a human. She might lose her pugna abilities, which gave her powers, but he didn't think so. She'd been accessing her animus core for a thousand years. That wouldn't change. Now? Tessa asked in wonder. Uchiko nodded. Now, I do not want to wait. Tessa thought for a minute. Hey, Stephen, remember when I had that bad burn on my leg, but we couldn't do magic Akira spells yet? During sex, you got the power to use that spell. Maybe with Uchiko, we could do something similar. When our bodies are connected, it feels like our animus is too. That might make a difference. You're going to try and link Flesh Forge to her core, right? He nodded. Uchiko unzipped her thick leather coat. I will have sex with you both. I've been with men and women before. In the Onori Guard, we found comfort in each other to endure the long nights of our lives. My old lovers have been gone a long time. Until Stephen touched me, I thought I would never again find solace in the body of another. Are you sure, Uchiko? Tessa asked. Uchiko nodded and unzipped another layer, then another. He saw her scales on the left side of her chest and a breast on the right. He felt a knot of lust tingle in his core. His heart beat a little faster. Tessa glanced over to the camp. She then pointed to a thick grove of old cottonwoods, their trunks wide enough to hide them. With the sun rising higher into the sky, the air was getting warm. Stephen liked sex outside. The air on his skin felt good, and he enjoyed the taboo nature of it. Of course, if he got caught by anyone in his escort, most would simply join in. Not this time, though. This time they had to be careful and concentrate. Stephen, Tessa, and Uchiko hurried forward. Sabina's voice came to them. I know what you are doing, and I won't let the others intrude. I wish you luck. Dios mio, this is dangerous business. That didn't make Stephen feel any better, and yet Tessa was right. He'd learned how to cast cura spells in the middle of sex. He could do the same with Flesh Forge. The big, rough-barked trees closed in and gave them a little space, almost like an enclosed room on the banks of the river. Tessa took off her shirt and bra. Her breasts caught the sunlight, and the cool air tightened her nipples. She brushed her arms across her tits, then pressed her thighs together, still in her jeans. Wow, this is just... Wow... I could use the animus, but doing this with Uchiko is kind of blowing me away. Uchiko pulled down her bodysuit. She had it pushed down to her waist when she stopped. Tessa, I know you cannot find me attractive. You don't have to pretend. Tessa went to her and put her forehead on Uchiko's. She looked into the dragon skin's eyes. I can look past your looks, Uchiko. I can see your bravery your gentleness and your sadness. I can see you, and that is what I'm attracted to. Tessa then kissed her mouth. Chapter 28 Stephen watched the two. Tessa had her hand on Uchiko's left breast while their tongues met. He'd kissed Uchiko before, and he knew she liked him to focus on the right side of her face, where her lips were. He approached and put a hand on each woman. He had his clothes on, but he knew that wasn't going to last long. Uchiko turned. Tessa eased back. She likes it like this. Stephen kissed Uchiko, concentrating on keeping his lips on the right side of her face. Tessa crouched, took hold of Uchiko's bodysuit, and pulled it the rest of the way off. Now the slender, half-Japanese, half-dragon woman stood completely naked— Tessa kissed her left scaled leg and the skin on her right. She brushed a hand down Uchiko's stomach until she came to the top of Uchiko's slit. 
The scales divided her body but scooped out to leave her sex completely human. She's so pretty. The lust in Tessa's voice was evident. Can I get you ready, Uchiko? Hi. I mean, yes. Uchiko was trembling. Her hand went to Stephen's pants. He undid them and she reached for his erect length with her scaled hand. The claws tickled his belly. And the feel of her scales around him was so alien, so different. And that made it better. She gripped him hard when Tessa parted her lips and licked her center. Uchiko breathed into his mouth. Tessa, she wants me. Me. Stephen nodded. If this doesn't work, we will still love you. What you look like doesn't matter to us, and when I change the world, it won't matter at all. Uchiko let go of him to fill both of her hands with Tessa's hair. Both of you here. Both of you. Both of you. Stephen licked the side of her neck and sucked on her ear. He liked the way his spit smelled on her skin. She was getting closer to her climax. Stephen cast Animus Chain and looked into her core. It was spinning, buzzing, drawing in power, and yet it rotated lopsided. Uchiko cried out as the orgasm took her. Her skin didn't glow, but she did collect Animus with her off-kilter core. I like it in me after I take my pleasure, Uchiko gasped. I like it in me right away. She grabbed a cottonwood tree and widened her stance, showing him her hairless pink lips. Her wet channel looked snug and inviting. Tessa had stripped. She led him over. She tisked him. We always get naked, but you never do. Always the impatient boy. Uchiko wiggled her little butt. Please, I like it in me right away. Stephen shouldered off his coat and flung off his shirt. He got Sandy taking off his shoes, socks, and pants. He didn't care. Tessa was by Uchiko, rubbing her hands up and down her skin, her scales, kissing her face and rubbing her fingers up and down the dragon skin's sex. She's so ready, Stephen. You better hurry before I fuck her myself. I do not want fingers, Uchiko complained. I want him. I want Stephen inside me. Tessa playfully smacked Uchiko's butt. I like this side of you, Uchiko. I like it a lot. I like you. The ninja woman turned her head and suckled on Tessa's big right breast. The barista kept her left hand on Uchiko's ass, pulling her cheeks open a bit. Tessa's other hand went between her legs. Stephen lined himself up to Uchiko and sank himself into her. Then he cast a divination spell. He synced up with Tessa, who'd also cast Magica Divinatio. Tessa was loud in his head. Almost there, Stephen. I'm so close. She's so hot, and feeling her body and feeling her energy, it's so hot. Feeling her excitement, he nearly came. Their minds were so close now, so buzzed with sex and energy. If you adjust her animus core, I'll link a flesh forge spell to her energy. We should come first. I won't be able to think straight until I come. You should too. Then right after that, okay? Okay. Stephen thought she was making a lot of sense. Tessa's mind was insistent. I want to feel you in her. I want to feel what it's like to fuck her. He kept their minds connected, and yet he was also there with Uchiko, his hands around her hips, pulling her back into him even as he thrust forward. The cold of the late morning was gone, and he was sweating. The smells of their sex mingled with the murky river water. The cold breeze caressed their skin. Birds chirped. It felt normal. It felt wild, and it felt right. Tessa orgasmed first, feeling what Stephen was feeling as well as her own ecstasy. It was a brand new sensation for them both. The power of Tessa's climax triggered Stephen's own. Yes, take me, take me, take me, Uchiko whined. The uncertain, shy woman with a tragic past had melted into a confident woman, not afraid to tell him what she wanted. Animus lit up every cell in his body and filled his core. Okay, Uchiko, we're going to try it. We're going to try. Uchiko took in a sharp breath. The mystical energy was swirling around all three of them. Tessa was still in his mind. I can see how to adjust it. It's off-center because of her failed dragon skin rituals. I see that now. She wasn't focused, 
and so she was able to draw animus into her core, but she lost her concentration. I'll adjust it now. Stephen didn't think it was a good idea to wait on casting Flesh Forge. He went on instinct. As Tessa realigned Uchiko's core, he used the new magic to adjust her dragon skin scales as well. He was still inside her, his hands around her slim waist, and he watched as the scales around his left hand turned into smooth brown skin. He brushed his hand up, and those scales also disappeared. He then crouched. Stand, Uchiko. She did. Tessa had a hand on the ninja's belly where her animus core now spun, a perfect orb of red, yellow, and orange energy. Meanwhile, Stephen turned her talons into toes, removed the scales from her legs, and continued to adjust her, making his way up her body. When he rubbed a hand over the left side of her chest, a breast grew and a nipple appeared, and then he was at her neck. Tessa gently turned the ninja to face him. Kiss him. Stephen leaned in. He pressed his lips against her face and he felt the change. At this stage, he only needed to guide the Flesh Forge skill a little because her body wanted to change back. It had been in an altered state for so long that now that her animus was a perfectly rotating sphere, the rest of her cells wanted to come into alignment. They wouldn't have to link them together. Tessa and her animus chain had solved the problem. She was Merlin's daughter, after all. Stephen felt Uchiko's scalp grow new hair. It filled his hand and then overflowed. Uchiko sobbed. She stepped back, away from their touch. Her hair covered her face. Her hands were outstretched. Her toes were sandy from the riverbank. And yet she had ten toes now, and two shapely human legs. Her breasts hung from her fully human chest. When she finally raised her head... Her black hair fell back, and it was the Uchiko he'd seen in his visions of that young woman in Japan a thousand years ago, and it was the woman he'd seen in Nye, Montana, at the general store. She was restored. She blinked. I'm... I'm human again? Tessa's laughter was bright and cheery. No, not quite. You're a warling. Otherwise, you'd have become a crone a thousand years' worth of time catching up to you in a heartbeat. We'll have to watch for any kind of aging. Report all gray hairs to us immediately. Uchiko closed her eyes. I can feel my power inside me. I still have my dark armor, which allows me to hide in the shadows, and dragon strength, which allows me to strike and strike hard. And my serpent grace, I still have that, to end my prey quickly and then escape. When she opened her eyes, she wasn't crying. She was beside herself with joy. I wish for Panga Komong to see me restored. I am Oe Uchiko, and my long exile is over. Tessa pulled herself into Stephen, and he liked the feel of her skin on his. He checked the path of the mirror-souled dragon. He was down on Animus, and yet, when his eyes went to Flesh Forge, he had to grin. He'd done it. He'd adjusted Uchiko's cells, kicking off the healing while Tessa adjusted her core. I'm worn out, Tessa whispered. How about a little something for me? Or would you rather fight a bit more? No fighting. Uchiko ran to them, kissed Stephen, and then kissed Tessa. Watching the two women together, their breasts pressing up against each other, restored Stephen's libido. He took Tessa from behind while Uchiko kissed and caressed the barista's breasts. This time, they didn't have any agenda, only to make love and refuel. Afterwards, they had to stick their feet in the water to get the sand off, and then balance on flat rocks before putting their clothes back on. Zoe had kept their breakfast warm, and she gave all three smiles. Then, when her eyes really saw Uchiko for the first time, she let out a surprised shout. It was the sensitive Zoe who first wept with joy. Ponga stood back while all the women in Stephen's escort lavished love on the ninja. Even the Wayne twins came over to give Uchiko hugs. When the women parted, Uchiko raised her face to Panga. I am Oe Uchiko again. He smiled warmly at her. You always were. Through these long years, you always were. Your heart has been troubled, but it has been strong. He bowed at the waist. Konnichiwa, Oe Uchiko. Konnichiwa. Panga Komong. 
Sabina stepped forward. Glittering emerald light sparkled in her eyes. Saavedra and his willbreakers have reported back to Javier. They say that Dodge City has been abandoned. There are neither humans nor dragons there. Morty Flint is in St. Louis, or that's what our spies have said. There is a storm coming, high winds, lightning, thunder, maybe tornadoes. But other than that, it seems as if Icharam's gift is ours. The Wayne twins exploded with laughter. Stephen couldn't blame them. Morty thought to trap them by clearing a path to the very place they wanted to go. It was too perfect. He wasn't about to be tricked. They would have to go, but they would proceed with extreme caution. There was a reason why the last two dragon knights had survived the dragon slayer. They were not to be underestimated. Chapter 29 Mordred knelt next to the bed in the master bedroom of the nondescript airy in East St. Louis. It was in a warehouse district. The buildings were all thrashed and decayed, including the rambling structure where Candler had built a hidden palace. The fat prime might have grown stupid and lazy in his later years, but at one time he had been a true conqueror with forces that stretched across the entire Midwest. His East St. Louis airy had been a safe house, a posh one. Gold fixtures filled the bathrooms, and polished oak floors sat under Persian carpets and high-end furniture. Like his Galu Island airy, he liked the duplicity of the warehouse-turned-palace. The illusion, however, was short-lived. When he, Zuzana, and Umbra had come here, there had been food everywhere, moldering pizza boxes, rats, and a surplus of cockroaches. He'd had to cast an enchantrix spell to permanently fix the mattress in the master bedroom— the bed was a feasting table for roaches, green hot dog buns, shriveled sausages, and other decayed foodstuffs. Mordred had the idea that Candler had lost his mind. That wasn't a problem any longer. Zuzana, though. Zuzana was a definite problem. She lay in the clean bed, her cough a death rattle. And when she wasn't coughing, she was wheezing. Her body had lost its fight against time despite the magic he'd given her. Another flesh forge spell, please, she begged. Mordred shook his head. No, your time has come. Have you enjoyed your life? Her eyes closed. Yes, I was given far more than a simple magician deserved. Perhaps I should have been a warling. They live far longer. Her cackles turned to coughing. End me, my love. Mordred stood. He slashed through her throat with ion claws. The long life of his most trusted wife was over. The timing was good. Zuzana was his past life. Icharam's gift, that's what they were calling it now, was his future. And if he couldn't have it, no one else would lay their claws on it. He and Lancelot had gone to Duquesne Hill, and while walking around the hillside they found a statue of an angel. Well, the locals would have seen it as an angel— as for Mordred and his friend, they recognized the Lady of the Lake's face. Her pointed ears might have been hidden by locks of tumbling hair carved into the lichen-covered stone, yet that didn't fool them for a second. They went to break through the cement slab in front of the angel, to unearth whatever secrets lay buried in the ground. The mossy cement held. Both dragon knights were flung back. Neither Mordred nor Lancelot was the lost son, nor were they Merlin's daughter. They were the supposed villains in the story. Mordred didn't think that was right. He was simply a dragon lord doing what dragon lords did for 50,000 years. Yes, he'd made the grand mistake, and yes, the business with Merlin was tragic, but Mordred had won. That human never got access to the Grail. They'd survived the Dragon Slayer. They never would have survived Merlin if he'd had a gift from Icharam himself. Mordred's victory was bittersweet, but it was still a victory. Umbra was in the kitchen with Lancelot. Outside, cars crept by and ragged humans did whatever ragged humans did. They wouldn't bother with the warehouse. If they did, they would die. Lancelot had used the espresso maker to brew up coffees for them. Umbra had spent hours cleaning up the kitchen and had filled a dumpster. It was better she kept herself busy with Zuzana dying. Now dead. Zuzana was dead. It didn't seem real. Did humans have eternal souls? Did dragon souls? 
Mordred thought not, which made his life all the more precious. He'd lost Needle's clutch and court Kalat to the Drakaris child. He would not be so careless with his own life. He could get other vassals. There was always someone who wanted what they shouldn't have. Lancelot gave Mordred a small cup of bitter coffee. Mordred sipped it. The experience was missing cigars. So he lit one. They all stood in silence. No one was going to speak of Zuzana's death. Lancelot didn't care. Umbra cared too much. He'd caught her with tears in her eyes, which she hid from him. Are we ready? Mordred pointed his cigar, leaking smoke, to the garage, where there was the body as well as the angel knife. We, oui, it will be good to see him again, Lancelot said. Umbra took off running, headed for the garage, using her speed. Mordred cast shadow strength and caught her in a strong grip. With her weakened, he wanted to look into her eyes and know that she truly understood his act of mercy. Do you understand why I had to do what I did? What? Umbra asked. Those tears again. This time she couldn't hide them. Kill Zuzana, or kill Merlin's wife? She didn't mention Candler and Helga. She didn't know about Victor Nutgrass or the legions of others that Mordred had ended through violence or subterfuge. Mordred had his cigar between his teeth. He breathed smoke into her face. Guinevere I've paid for. Zuzana was dying. I couldn't save her. No flesh forge spell for her. No animus adjustments. Her time had come. When my time comes, will you be as merciful? She asked, those dark eyes flashing. That is a trick question, Mordred growled. You are a dragon soul. You'll live for a long, long time. I healed you after you felt the mouse bite. I find it very satisfying that a lesser dragon has the famed Slayer Blade. After Merlin died in Oregon, it passed through the hands of many primes. When it was my turn to own it, I buried the truth of it. I laughed at people who thought it special, and I killed the idea of the sword. You know I can kill things, and you know I can give life. I want to hear you say it. Umbra said what was expected. I know, Mordred. I understand. I will serve you. You'd better. Mordred tightened the grip on her arm. Lancelot approached them both. He was far shorter than either of them. Please, my friends, the death of a vassal is never easy, and Zuzana was with you a long while. I believe our passions are inflamed. There is death in this place now. Let us bring life. Mordred let Umbra go, and she dashed away. He and Lancelot walked through the living room of the place. In the middle was a pile of hacked-apart dining room furniture stacked on sofas and chairs. They would need fire when it came time to strike. They entered the garage bay. A corpse hung from the rafters by heavy chains. They circled his armpits and gave him a puppet-like appearance. His feet were only a couple of inches off the floor. He was naked. On a greasy rolling table were three black candles, two lit and one dead. The angel knife lay in front of the candles along with some parchment, pens, a few books, and three cans of gasoline. Umbra had retreated into the shadows to watch them. At first glance, Mordred thought it was Zuzana, but no, she was gone. A single sharp feeling of loss surprised him. He'd felt bad about Brunor's death for a brief moment. That brief moment had passed, and rather quickly at that. Mordred picked up the angel knife. It vibrated with the life energy of Candler. Lancelot lit two of the candles with a puff of his inferno exhalant. He gave him a rundown of information Mordred already knew, but Lancelot liked to talk when he was nervous. We have reports that Drokaris's vassals are still in Burlington, holding on to Colorado as a last desperate attempt to protect Stephen's very human mother. As for our forces, we have some in place there on the border to make a show of an invasion. In reality, our forces are... elsewhere. There is a storm we... but we have fought in storms before. My Grigri will make sure Tessa Ross's shield spells never work. Ugly Ellis and his inferno dogs will gun her down. I do enjoy those warlings. Monsieur Staines has provided us with a few more tanks from Fort Riley. That is in Kansas and not too far away. 
After our magicians and soldiers reduce Merlin's daughter to ashes, we have Juice Juice and his sounders to clean up the rest of the wives. As for you, me, and Bedivere, we shall kill Stephen Dracarys. Finally. Finally, Mordred whispered. He walked around the body of Sir Bedivere. They'd kept the corpse intact by using a combination of shield spells and enchantrix. It had taken a toll on them, but the naked form of the Dragon Knight hadn't rotted away. His heart had been ruined by Merlin's daughter, but the rest of him was whole. His eyelids were open, showing the diamonds there. He'd lost his eyes in that initial fight against Merlin. They'd been lucky then. They didn't need luck now. Mordred gripped the angel knife. It was slippery with his sweat. He was anxious. That was laughable. We wait. When Stephen gains access to Ichiram's gift, then we strike and take it from him. Lancelot chuckled. He lit a cigarette stuck onto the end of his ivory holder. Zut alors, it is a funny thing, no? It is the same plan we use to find this Duquesne Hill. We will do the same thing. Stephen will not wait. No, he won't, Mordred called to Umbra. You, go pour gasoline on the furniture in the living room. I want us completely ready. Fire. Fire was good because once they reached Dodge City, he assumed it would get very cold, very fast. Chapter 30 Stephen dropped from the sky and flew over the empty streets of Dodge City. The place seemed abandoned. The sky above was black with clouds, but there was no wind. Yet. A few fat raindrops splattered onto the sidewalk in wide silver dollar explosions. There were some cars, but they looked abandoned. The gas stations and all the stores were closed, shuttered in tight. In the distance, off a lone stretch of asphalt, was a hill rising from the landscape. At the top was a tall tree, and underneath, a scattering of tombstones that stretched down it and encircled it. That wasn't the legendary Boot Hill. Those corpses had been moved a long time ago to a place called Maple Grove. A school had been built on the ground, and students used to find bones during recess. There was the Boot Hill Museum there now. Tessa had been on her phone researching Dodge City graveyards. Duquesne Hill was actually the biggest, oldest cemetery in Kansas. Few knew how ancient it really was. Stephen came floating down out of the sky to land on the asphalt. A few ridges had snow on their northern sides, but mostly it was green with spring. The temperature wasn't cold enough for snow. Rain and chaos storms filled the bruised and blackened clouds to the west. Was there a green tint to the sky? It seemed so, which meant they might be facing a tornado. They could have waited to explore Ichiram's tomb, but Stephen wanted to end this sooner rather than later. He didn't like Mordred's sword hanging over his family. It was clear the evil dragon knight wanted to take Denver. Stephen could imagine a hostage situation where Mordred bargained Stephen's mother for Ichiram's gift. That was not going to happen. Stephen shifted into a homo draconis and unsheathed Samael's lash. He was an eight-foot-tall dragon man with a sword walking down Kansas asphalt to Duquesne Hill. So far, Tessa hadn't made a get-out-of-dodge joke, but it was just a matter of time. He pushed the creaking gate open and walked by the tombstones. Some had visible names and dates on them. Others had been wiped clean by the elements. A voice spoke. Stephen Dracarys. His name was on the wind, the whispered words as ghostly as the bodies around him. It was Quenestri. I'm here, he growled. I am as well. A light flashed on the far side. The storm was creeping in on a light breeze, but that breeze was a lie. His claws churned up grass and mud as he made his way to the light on the northern side of the cemetery. Rounding the hill, he saw a statue of an angel standing over a slab of concrete with a little chain gate surrounding it. The chains were rusted, lichen and moss, in a symbiotic relationship, colored the cement yellow and green. Nonetheless, that concrete was incredibly new compared to the grave it covered. Quinestri must have found a way to create the gravesite before the humans planted their dead around the ancient tomb. 
She was alive. Somewhere. Probably behind the eagle door on top of the St. Vrain Airy. You have enemies waiting for you, Stephen Dracaris. They are watching even now with their technology. Satellites. I know, he said out loud. But I thought you were done, that you'd fulfilled your promise to Icharam. Did I miss something? I find you and your cause intriguing. I'm not intriguing. I'm just bait. A raindrop struck his face and rolled down off the scales of his chin. Can you give us all a light show? A show of light? I do not understand. Stephen had to smile. Just make it look like all is well, that I'm worthy and that I can get my hands on Icharam's gift. I'll do the rest. Very well. Perhaps someday we will meet. Perhaps. You have a long road still in front of you, and while you have done well against the descendants of the Alferos, you have yet to test your mettle against the Zotharic. Farewell. I shall be watching. The angel statue turned into the Lady of the Lake, the same work of art they'd seen time and time again over the past few days. The rusted chains surrounding the concrete slab blazed with light as the concrete crumbled away to reveal steps leading down into darkness. The smell of smoke struck Stephen, followed by the crackle of flames. Hurricane winds swept down. He saw a spinning ring of fire appear on all four sides of the hill, four portals opening to unleash an army on him. A hundred yards from where he stood, a big armored boar thundered out of the north gate. That was Juice Juice, and behind him were hundreds of morphlings, ready to come pouring through. Out of the west fire gate rushed men and women in battle gear, the runes on their Kevlar vests glowing orange. They didn't have guns or swords, but each raised hands, gleaming with all different colors. These were the Grigri, pulled from the front. Those were Lancelot's sorcerers, of all shapes, colors, and sizes. To the south of the hill, a spinning ring vomited out other people, also in Kevlar, but these had big assault rifles, pistols, even a few RPGs. Tanks rumbled toward them as well and running among them was a dark green dragon with dark blue highlights. A scraggly beard hung from his chin, so he was a male. A scar cut across his face. Ugly Ellis was ugly, all right. Four Homo Draconi emerged from the eastern portal. Mordred, Lancelot, Umbra, and a tall, lean dragon man whose eyes gleamed like diamonds. Bedivere. Sir Bedivere, back from the dead, Stephen had almost forgotten that Umbra had stolen the angel knife from the Infinity Ranch. She'd given the magical dagger to Mordred so he could bring the fallen dragon knight back to life. Mordred and his cronies showed their desperation by casting Magic Aporta spells. Stephen had guessed their ploy when he'd first heard that Dodge City had been deserted. Stephen was the bait. His escort was the trap. In Canto, Tessa appeared from where she'd been hiding using a derivation of a defensio spell that only she could cast. She snapped closed the gree-gree doorway on the north side. Sabina and Panga Komong came streaking down from their hiding place in the clouds. Only a single tank came careening out of the portal before it snapped closed. That was from Sabina, her green eyes gleaming. Panga Komong came swooping down, a flash of yellow and green. Encanto! The flames of the sounder's portal spun away into nothing, the magic disrupted. Only a handful of Mordred's armies made it through. Yet in the distance, coming in from the east, was a storm of dragons. Riding on the winds out of the west were just as many. Javier Jones, Saavedra, and every wing they could muster. Stephen didn't know which side would hit first, but the storm beat them both. It swept into them, bringing torrential rains and hail, the ice balls bounced off the ground and smacked into Stephen's head. The Grigri all turned on Tessa and hit her with spells, but not in Petum spells. No, they covered her in Encanto spells. Ugly Ellis crackled out lightning that Stephen blocked with a shield. The Inferno dogs topped the hill and opened fire on Tessa, who stood there, unprotected. She'd be riddled with bullets in seconds. 
Mouse saved her. She came flying in, breathing out a devastating cloud of dark fire right in front of Tessa, who stood behind the flames. Some of the warlings fired, but they were shooting into a wall of fire. Black and orange trails followed every bullet. Even with their obvious enchantment, those rounds melted in the heat of Mouse's shadow fire exhalant. Tombstones turned to molten rock in her conflagration. The wet ground hissed. On Mouse's back clung a terrified Zoe. She was dumped onto the ground as Mouse shifted human to stand in front of Tessa. The blonde didn't want to be a big target for the warlings. She held the slayer blade, green flames racing up and down the sword. Face somber and focused, Mouse cast a shield spell to stop the next round of bullets. Mouse could only protect against gunfire and other physical attacks. Exhalants and spells would go right through her force field. Zoe, a huge bear, charged the Grigri. If she couldn't get her hooks into the magicians, at least she could draw their spell fire. The problem was, if all those wizards hit the bear girl with impetum spells, it would kill her. And if she survived the magicians, she had Juice Juice and his sounders to deal with. The cult of morphlings threatened to overwhelm them all. Tessa pulled her guns and grinned. Yahoo! Glancing up, Stephen watched as Chazzy and Prue descended toward the tank on very pink wings awash in rain. The tank didn't just have its main cannon. There was a machine gun turret on top as well. The twins landed on the war machine, first as dragons, then as homo draconi. Prue turned into a very busy, very human woman. She pulled open the top hatch. Chazzy in her partial form jumped in head first, which meant teeth first, which meant the warlings in that M1 were about to be ripped to pieces. Oh boy. The Texas machine gun twins had won themselves a couple of really big guns. Good. They would need them against Mordred, Lancelot, and their undead friend. Arya landed in front of Dragon Knights. The Indian woman's animus daggers sparkled with energy. I am the thirteenth knight. You have betrayed Arthur and his vision. You are Dragon Knights no longer. All three of the Dragon Knights attacked, breathing out various energies. Shadow flame, arctic wind, and chromatic fury. Stephen sank a force field in front of Arya, saving her life, but only for a second. The chromatic fury blew his force field to pieces. However, it gave Arya the break she needed. She took to the air and flew over the warlings at the top of the hill. She covered two in fire before flying away. Lancelot took after Arya. Bedivere took three running steps, shifted into his true form, and grabbed wind with his long wings. Only for a second. Ponga came in and drove his claws into Bedivere's back. The two went bouncing across the landscape, scratching the shit out of each other and breaking through tombstones and statues. Meanwhile, Mordred rode a gust of wind up, only to dive down toward Stephen, who was ready with another shield spell and encanto spell magic. There was no way he would leave the entrance to Ichiram's tomb. He would not let these bastards in. Not after what they'd done to Arthur and Merlin. Chapter 31 Tessa pulled the animus out of a magician, one of Lancelot's Grigri, and she shot three more. It was a tiny victory, since Zoe and Mouse were in a bad way. Zoe had tried to get to the line of magicians, but unlike her previous heroic charge on the Thousand Step Beach, this one had failed. She lay in a heap of hurt bear, parts of her fur smoking, other parts of her fur blasted bald. Mouse was protecting them from the Inferno dogs and their guns, but they weren't the problem. Juice and his sounders were racing in from the west, and the magicians were hurling impetum spells at Tessa and Mouse, constantly. Some threw fireballs, others blasted them with long lines of blue light like Star Wars blasters, and still others tossed sparkling green energy that exploded on impact. Mouse had a new trick. Imbued with serpent grace, she deflected the impetum attacks with the slayer blade like the Jedi boss bitch she was. Tessa had to duck the energy bolts. Every time she tried a spell off the Venificium limb of the skill tree, someone would dispel her magic. At least they couldn't stop her bullets. And they were focusing on her, leaving Mouse alone. Thank heavens they'd shut down that portal when they had. Only a few dozen of each of their enemies had made it through. Tessa ducked, and she ended two of the magicians with a single inferno bullet. 
They screamed as the flames ate them. Then Tessa got smart. She fired two arctic wind bullets into the ground. Huge blocks of ice rose from the wet mud and took moisture from the wind to make them even bigger. She'd wasted two powerful bullets, yet now she had ten-foot-tall icebergs for cover. It would put a dent in the magicians and their spells. A roar filled the air. Bitch! The green and blue male flew off the top of Duquesne Hill and soared down with his claws outstretched. He opened his mouth and hellfire filled his throat. This was ugly Ellis, with his scar and scraggly beard. No one was going to call him pretty any time soon. Tessa had one bullet left in her right peacekeeper. This dragon lord was going to taste so good. She ion gunned up her revolver, and it supernova as she sent a blinding white light of pure pain into ugly Ellis's chest. When she took his animus, her eyes fluttered. So good. He was a big old thing, and his energy filled her up in places she didn't even know she had. Something reached into her core, and she felt half of her energy sucked from her. A black flash swept by them. Mouse barely caught the glowing orange tip of Umbra's staff with her sword before the blonde had her skull split. Mouse fell to one knee, but she kept her force field up. Amber-colored explosions sparked her shield from the warlings firing on them. The black blur went running off, the light trails of her staff glowing in the storm. Rain continued to pound down, but at least it was really fucking windy. And, oh yeah, the hail was a nice touch. I hate that bitch, Mouse complained. Zoe moaned from her pain. Her paws kicked and her eyes fluttered. Tessa tried a cura spell and it fizzled. She could use animus chain, so she reached out for Umbra's core, but she was going too fast. She was coming around for another attack. Tessa chose another magician and pulled out her energy, and she was at full strength. We have incoming mouse, Tessa said casually. It was only war, after all, and ugly Ellis had tasted so good. A fireball exploded into Tessa's wall. A crack appeared in one wall while the other melted. More missiles struck it breaking the ice and splashing them with melt. The magicians? Mouse asked weakly. Worse, Tessa replied. Demon pigs? Juice, with his armor clanking, galloped toward them with two other boars, huge beasts the sizes of Kia Fortes flanking him. I just don't dig on swine, Mouse quoted, but she didn't look too confident. For a second, Tessa only saw a tiny, naked blonde woman holding a huge sword glowing bright with green flames racing up and down its blade. I love Pulp Fiction. I hate this juice juice douche. At the sound of the name, Zoe let out a shriek. She turned human. Getting to her feet was easier as a woman than as a bear since there was simply less bulk. No matter what form she took, her wounds looked just as painful. Some of her burns were bleeding. She staggered forward. Juice is mine. He's mine. She was going to go after him with her bare hands. Now is not the time for revenge rage. Tessa tried to grab Zoe's shoulder, but the bear girl ducked out of her reach. Mouse cackled laughter. At what, Tessa wasn't sure, but this was the insanity of battle, and not much made sense. At least she was keeping her shield spell up so the warlings couldn't get to them. How to stop Zoe... There was only one thing to do. Flesh Forge. Tessa tackled the bear girl, which normally would have been impossible, but the morphling was human, dead on her feet, and dizzy. Tessa hooked an animus chain spell into one of the magicians and channeled his energy into Zoe using Flesh Forge. Sure, the Gree Gree magicians might have been able to disrupt normal magic. Whatever. Tessa was casting next-level Alfarian shit. Zoe's burned skin healed over in seconds. It wasn't really meant to be used as a heal spell, so it was like putting a jet engine in a Ford Focus. Zoe threw Tessa off and grew into her huge bear form. She roared, turned, and met Juice right there in the mud. Mouse whirled and turned into her partial form. Gripping the Slayer Blade, she chopped off the head of the monster boar on Juice's left, which meant Tessa had to handle Porky on the right. That was going to be a problem without her spells, and she dropped her pistols during the whole Flesh Forge Bear Girl maneuver. She was going to be gored by the boar and then trampled underfoot. 
A chain tangled the charging battle pig's hooves. It went down, tusks first, and crashed through a tombstone, flinging stone fragments. A slender figure in a form-fitting black motorcycle onesie had leapt on top of the boar. Uchiko brought her sickle down into the skull of the pig, and it wasn't just her own strength, she was channeling a pugna ability. Definitely. Her hook went through the pig's skull and into the brain underneath. While all that madness was going on, Zoe went low on the charging juice. She got her massive claws underneath his chin, and she raised him up onto his hind legs. His hooves whirred uselessly. Zoe held his head up while she found a chink in his armor. She ripped down with her claws and opened a gash in Juice's belly. The armored pig threw himself back and rolled over a few times, his armor clanking. He came up, legs whirring as he came in for another run. Zoe wasn't thinking. She went for him without a plan. Juice fainted to the right, Zoe fell for it, and he rammed a tusk into her belly. I just fixed her, you asshole, Tessa shouted. She'd taken cover behind her crumbling ice walls. Juice shook Zoe off his tusks. This shit was bad. At least the Grigri weren't charging forward. No, they were following orders. Keep Tessa's magic turned off and try and kill her with impetum spells. Well, that plan just might work after all. Mouse couldn't help with her magicians. She had another task at hand. The blonde leapt over the boar she'd killed and turned into her true form, to snap wolves in half with her teeth, bathe enemy bears in fire, and breathe lightning into pigs, crackling the skin off their bones. Fried pork skins. Sabina would have appreciated that since she was fond of chicharrones. Where was she? Uchiko fought with Mouse. The ninja swung her kusarigama overhead to smack morphlings with her sickle or pound their bones into jelly with the heavy weight on the other end. A werewolf went low, and Uchiko easily dodged him using her super speed. For a second, she blurred, like Umbra. Could it be fixing her core had improved her skills? Maybe. And how could Umbra move so fast? Tessa didn't know, and she had more pressing questions at the moment. How was she going to survive a charging boar who had not one but two stupid names? Juice fucking juice. Tessa was low on animus. That flesh forge had cost a lot. Tessa saw a revolver in the mud in front of her. Impetum spells filled the air and another chunk of her ice wall exploded. That gun was her only chance. She just hoped it was loaded. She hurled herself forward and grabbed it. Juice was almost on top of her. She hit him with a glancing blow from an arctic wind bullet. His entire head froze over, but he kept on driving his hooves toward her. Tessa leaned back, aimed, and fired. This was a normal bullet. It flashed pink over his head. She missed. Before Juice could trample her, Zoe hit him from the side. She held him down with one giant arm while she slashed into the same wound she'd caused before. She must have gotten a hooked claw into a seam because she peeled back a metal plate like she was opening a can of sardines. Her next attack flung gore behind her and splattered her fur with blood. Zoe was roaring something over and over. It was almost the sounder's motto, but she altered it in a very significant way. The me is not the we. The me is not the we. The me is not the we. The sounders probably needed a new motto. They definitely needed a new leader. Zoe had ripped out Juice Juice's guts. He died with his head encased in ice. Sabina, in her dragon form, landed hard and shifted human. She fell to her knees as a fireball sailed over them and exploded. The Latina magician had been gashed up badly, and she was clinging to consciousness. Her eyes winked off. Chica, I'm out of animus and hurt. Tessa reached out a hand. Magica Cura, and her spell fizzled. Damn it! The barista was tired of getting her butt encantoed over and over. She felt like one of those football players who was intentionally double-teamed because she was so tough. Thank God Rob Gronkowski was retiring. Rain spattered Tessa as she pulled Sabina down before she got hit with impetum spells. They crouched behind the ice wall, out of hope until Ponga came through with a chromatic fury that swept through the Grigri like a nuclear blast. It was Alamo Gordo, and Ponga had just dropped an atom bomb on their asses. Tessa felt the Encanto spells loosen their grip. 
She hit Sabina with the magic of Cura, and it worked. Now the barista had to get Zoe and fix the hole the juice had ripped into her. Too bad the warlings, known as Inferno Dogs, hadn't scattered just because Tessa had ion-gunned out their leader's heart. They charged down the cemetery hill. A green spell caught their gunfire. Sabina grinned up at her. Okay, maybe I had a little animus left. I love you. And Tessa kissed her right on the lips. The creaking and squealing of tractor treads filled the air as the tank rolled forward, crushing tombstones in its path, its machine gun thwacking. On top of the tank was a living fantasy, a naked, heavy-breasted woman with flaming red hair and adorable freckles working a badass big gun, rocking and rolling. Prue had to be human because in her partial form she wouldn't fit in the gunner's seat. The rounds cut down the first wave of whirlings, then the chunk of the cannon firing, and another batch of inferno dogs was torn to ribbons by an explosive shell. Chazzy and Prue might have known the names of the guns and shells and bombs and all that, but Tessa had zero idea about how all that worked. All she knew was that the Texas twins had rolled right in at the exact right minute, and when they got done blasting the whirlings, they turned the war machine onto the last of the sounders. Watching a tank take apart werewolves, boars, and bears was kind of fun. It just was. Tessa went to heal Zoe. They had to go help Stephen. He was fighting the Dragon Knights, and he would need help. A Grigri charged forward, a purple shield spell in front of her, and her other hand glowed like she was clutching a lavender-colored length of neon light. She went to hurl that purple light. The magician went down, a black arrow sticking out of her leg. She tried to rise, and another arrow pierced her throat. Who on their side had a bow and arrow? For a second, Tessa had no idea, and then a name came to her. The Shadow Archer. Chapter 32 Stephen, a thirty-foot-long black dragon, stood over the entrance of Icharam's tomb. Mordred, a purple and white worm, faced him on the slope of the hill. It was just the two of them for the moment. Around them the battle raged, mostly to the north, where Mordred's people were concentrating on taking Tessa out. Cold rain covered them. Mordred reached for his animus core. Stephen was barely able to stop him with a combination defensio and encanto spell. Both grunted and struggled, two dragons in battle, hands and talons outstretched, feet and claws gripping the wet ground. Mordred tried to rip out his animus, and Stephen stopped him by shifting into his homo draconis form, moving his core. Samael's lash lay on the ground. Stephen snatched it up, and with an excrucior, he sliced into Mordred's chest. Blood flowed. Mordred spit a long stream of black acid at him, but it splashed against his shield spell. The viscous fluid dripped to the ground, smoking in the dirt. It ate through tombstones as if they were made of sugar. Stephen hurled his black impetum stars. They flashed harmlessly off Mordred's shield spell. Flicking his right hand, Mordred used flesh forge to change his fingers into long tentacles, each tipped with a sharp claw. Stephen wasn't ready for that kind of an attack. The coils plucked Samael's lash out of his hand and seized his arm. The chain-whipped sword snicked back together and fell to the ground. Stephen tried his true form. Those tentacles didn't relax their iron grip. Mordred's left hand reached out and more serpentine fingers shot out. The tentacles circled Stephen's mighty throat and slithered around until Stephen couldn't breathe. He didn't dare shape change. His partial and his human form didn't have the muscle structure to stop the coils from squeezing out his guts. He reached to try and get at Mordred's animus, but the Dragon Knight had set up some kind of shield spell. There was no accessing it. Stephen reached and grabbed the coils to try and free himself. He wasn't strong enough. Darkness creeped into the edges of his vision. He felt panic, wanting him to flail and struggle, but that would only get him killed. He couldn't breathe. The cartilaginous rings in his throat creaked as his spine cracked. He was seconds away from having his throat crushed. What would Tessa do if he died at the hands of Mordred? Nothing good. He could picture her taking the Slayer Blade from Mouse and using it to butcher every dragon on Earth. Tessa had a dark side, definitely. But then he saw another possible future. He saw Tessa weeping in Arya's arms. Zoe was there, holding them both. 
and Mouse would squeeze in, saying something sarcastic. Sabina would pull Prue over, Chazzy would be alone for a second, and then she'd roll her eyes, say something cutting, and go over to join the embrace. Uchiko would as well. And Tessa would get through her grief. She wasn't Merlin. She was stronger. Stephen would have to be just as strong. And just as smart. Mordred was protecting himself from Animus Chain, but not from Shadow Strength. Stephen took the strength from him, then turned human. The coils were slack enough, weak enough, that he could slip free. Stephen grabbed his sword and hacked off one finger tentacle. Then another. Then another. Mordred howled and pulled his newly forged fingers back into his hands. Blood gushed from his hands. Stephen went forward to finish the Dragon Knight. Mordred coughed up a cloud of poison gas. Stephen was forced to retreat. The wounded Dragon Knight staggered back, tripped over a mausoleum, and went rolling down the hill, until he reached the feet of Bedivere, who had pulled himself upright after Ponga's brutal attack. His rotted flesh was marked with scratches. Stephen triggered his divination spell and reached out to his escort. Guard the entrance to Icharam's tomb. I'm going for Mordred and his dragon knights. He didn't wait for an answer. The wind had taken care of Mordred's toxicity cloud, so Stephen could charge forward. He glanced to his right at the south of the hill. Lancelot had finally gotten his claws into Arya in her true form. The dragon knight ripped four long, bloody lines through Arya's back thigh. She breathed fire into his face, then escaped. Lancelot's tiger-colored scales were slashed and smoking. He'd felt her animus daggers over and over and had the wounds to prove it. Arya lost her true form and came crashing down, tumbling across the mud between the tombstones. She must have had her animus sucked from her. She refueled by throwing lightning from a dagger into the warlings on the hilltop. Arya got to her feet, but it looked like she'd been through a wood chipper. The Warlings should have retreated while they had the chance. The twins and their tank weren't going easy on them. When Prue wasn't shredding them with the machine gun on top of the tank, Chazzy was blowing them to shit with her cannon. Both twins had to be grinning. Most of the Grigri and Sounders had been taken down as well. They were doing well, but the main event was in front of Stephen, the three evil dragon knights also known as the Americos brothers. They'd been manipulating events in the U.S. for hundreds of years— and they'd been good at it. But not good enough. Mordred's forces were ten minutes out, coming in on dragon wings. Stephen's vassals, Javier, Saavedra, and the others, would arrive around the same time. Stephen needed to end the fight before they arrived. If he could kill the primes, many of those brave dragon skins would switch to his side. Umbra was somewhere. Stephen had to keep an eye out for her black blur. He faced the three dragon knights. All were dragons, rising above the muddy ground. Cold rain washed down on them. There was an eerie silence for a minute as they eyed each other. Bedivere's diamond eyes gleamed. There was an intelligence there. We could join you, Mordred said quietly. Would you really kill us when we could help you fight the Zotharic? Stephen narrowed his eyes. You are such a duplicitous asshole. I'd rather fight every demon in the universe than give you my back. Don't listen to his lies, Panga Kamong roared. He came flying in, his black face furious against the yellow and green of his scales. A black dragon careened into him. Umbra hit the Asian dragon like a cruise missile. They both went spiraling down to smash into the ground on the other side of the hill. The dirt kicked up by their impact was scattered by the howling winds. Mordred reached and pulled Lancelot to his left and Bedivere to his right. All were chanting something, their voices eclipsed by the winds and rain. Stephen watched as their bodies melted together and they tripled in size. This was Fleshforge, turned up to eleven. This was just wrong. When the transformation was complete, the monstrosity had a single body with a long, spiked tail, two legs, two arms, and huge wings. Three dragon heads rose from the multicolored chest. The left side had tiger stripes. The center body and the biggest head had Mordred's white and purple markings, and the right side was gold and orange. Bedivere's diamond eyes glimmered from the black scales on his face. All three heads roared. Stephen had to crane his neck to look up at the beast. He'd had a vision of a three-headed dragon at some point, although he couldn't recall the details. 
Or had it been a dream? He knew one thing for sure. This fight was the culmination of centuries, if not millennia, of bad blood and dark treachery. His family's drama with the Dragon Knights would end that day, for better or for worse. Stephen realized something else. The beast in front of him had one heart. Three heads, three animus cores, but only one heart. The angel knife would be there, giving Bedivere life. It was too big to fight as a human, and he wasn't going to chance a strike as a homo draconis. Stephen, in his true form, ignited his ion claws and attacked. The left Lancelot head breathed lightning, which crackled off Stephen's shield spell. The center head breathed chromatic fury. Stephen was able to duck it by sliding behind the right Bedivere head that tried to chomp down on him. Stephen sliced off a piece of Bedivere's neck with his gleaming claws. Magica cura, Lancelot roared. The wound on Bedivere healed in seconds. So it was a self-healing monstrosity that could breathe death and cast spells. Using serpent grace, Stephen flew onto the beast's back. He clawed through the three-headed dragon's scales as fast as he could, but the wounds were healing. Then he felt spectral fingers grab his animus core. Stephen encantoed the spell before he lost all of his energy, but the beast had taken over half. The tiger head swirled around like a cobra striking. Fangs knifed into Stephen. The Lancelot head threw him down onto the ground. Stephen went smashing through tombstones. The stone ripped off scales while the dust choked him. Duquesne Hill was probably not going to recover from the dragon battle. Stephen got to his feet and cast another shield, though he was low on animus. He needed two force fields. Lancelot, Mordred, and Bedivere showered him with shadow flame. The grass was too wet to catch fire. It smoldered, stank, and billowed smoke. He was blinded by the heat, the sheer power of this thing he was fighting, and then he felt Tessa's mind in his. Compared to the sound of the fire, the noise of the conflagration, and the caterwauling winds, her voice came as a whisper. Heartstrike, my prime. Use our animus to power yourself up, and then rip his fucking heart out. The flesh-forged dragon breathed the last of its shadow flame. In that moment, with his shields smoking and dripping flame, Stephen flung both force fields into Mordred's face. His bones cracked and he staggered backward, taking his two other heads with him. Stephen followed it up with the last of his animus, an electro-arc exhalant attack. He made the beast shiver and howl from the electricity, the damage enhanced by the rain. Stephen's escort had formed a line behind him. Even if they all attacked, the Dragon Knights could heal most every wound, and they were all experienced at protecting their energy cores. Arya stood at the end of the line to Stephen's right. She called out, I am your everlasting stone. The marriage vows. I will be the animus that brings you to life. He pulled a bit of animus into him. He didn't take it all. What is this? The dragon roared from all its heads. Sabina's eyes flashed green. I am your crystalline water. I will cup you in my hands. Stephen eased some of her animus into him. He felt the strength fill him. It was working. The three dragons tried lightning, but Tessa was there to shield him. He didn't even flinch. They had to yell the words of the marriage ceremony now, but they weren't about to stop. Mouse was next. Tears filled her eyes. I am your ever-changing sand. Yes, she was. I will be steadfast in my love. At his words, Mouse couldn't hold back a sob, and a tear trickled down her cheek. He took from her animus. He readied his right talon. He was going to use Ion Claws to power up. Chazzy was crying by now as well. I am your verdant life. The way she said the words, she meant them. Stephen paused to wonder why the women were crying. Then it struck him. This was their marriage. These words meant everything to these dragon souls. He smiled. I will be the sunlight that kisses you. He channeled Animus out of her and filled his right talon in a blinding white light. Even Prue had tears in her eyes. She smiled as she said, I am your leaping mind. Again, the ritual had gotten her exactly right. And Stephen replied, I will be there to catch you when you leap. Prue was overflowing with energy, and he siphoned away a good portion of it. He raised his glowing right hand. I know what you are planning, Mordred thundered. You think to use heart strike on us. We will stop you. We will spoil your spell. Uchiko's voice carried far. I am your strong fist. 
Her face was so beautiful, so complete, and while her skin was still new thanks to years as a whirling, her eyes were old. There was a peace there that was new. She wasn't crying. She was his strong fist. And I will be your strength just as you will be mine. Stephen powered up Heartstrike despite Mordred's words. Tessa came forward, her peacekeepers in her hands. Her voice was hard, her will strong, and yes, this was their marriage day. I am your living soul. She fired both guns into the beast and then yelled, Encanto! Sabina echoed her. Whatever spells Mordred and his cronies had been preparing were ruined. Magica impetum, the Wayne twins called out together and hurled small bullet-sized bits of pink light that struck the enemy beast like shotgun scatter. Chazzy laughed. And y'all thought we were just drinking in the Florida Keys? We done studied up. Stephen turned and gave Tessa a long look. His voice caught as he felt the emotion choke him. Tessa, I will be your heart, just as you will be mine. He whirled forward and charged, casting both Serpent Grace and Heart Strike. His claws flashed as he drove his fist into the heart of the flesh-forged dragon. All three heads screamed in pain. The animus from all three struck Stephen at the same time. Three Dragon Knights worth of power supercharged him. He still had his hand in the heart of the beast, but in that second, in that brief flash of time, all that power gave him a vision. On Gaia Beta, the Apocalypse Earth, where they would face down the Zotharic, he saw a figure in black robes. His face was covered by a mask, not unlike the ones that Uchiko wore. A foul orange wind blew around him across a blasted landscape of yellowed grass, completely dead. The figure raised his left hand. Curling out, the man showed him his finger with the extra joint. Spiderfinger wasn't on Gaia Alpha, Stephen's world. He was on Gaia Beta, the battle world. And Stephen knew they would face off soon. When he pulled his hand out of the fried chest cavity of the Mordred beast, the angel knife came with it. The dagger fell to the ground. Stephen backed away. The three dragons came apart, and yet in the chests of all three, there was a mortal wound. Bedivere fell, and the diamonds in his eyes came rolling out. His flesh immediately decayed and shrank. Lancelot let out a wheeze and fell to the side. Dead. Mordred stood straight and tall, angling his head upward. He breathed out a last inferno exhalant, and the fire coming out of his throat glowed in the hole in his heart. He struck the ground gave a last sigh and closed his eyes. Gone. The last of the rain fell and the wind died. The storm, as well as the battle, was over. Stephen lost his true form and turned human. The heart strike hurt, and he knew he would be weak for days on end. Maybe Tessa could do that magic from here on out. She bounced back quicker than he did. Then Umbra struck. She blurred up to him. She raised her glowing orange-tipped staff, seeking to smack his head off his shoulders. Stephen didn't have the energy for a single shield spell. He was about to die. Umbra dropped her staff. An arrow protruded from her chest. The fletching was jet black, as was the shaft itself. Another arrow pierced her leg. She went down on one knee. Stephen had seen other arrows like that before. The Shadow Archer's arrows. Umbra looked into Stephen's eyes. You really are blessed. You really do want to change things among dragon souls. Mordred murdered Zuzana. You would never murder me. Tessa walked forward and touched Umbra's hair. Oh, you do have a tasty bit of animus in you, Umbra. It's like a chocolate donut with extra sprinkles. I could kill you easily, but I have a better idea. You lost your prime. Would you like a new one? The woman blinked. But I tried to kill him. I would have if it hadn't been for the Shadow Archer. She spat blood from her mouth. But perhaps I would like a new prime. Might I recommend my fiancé? Tessa asked. This was kind of like the most violent rehearsal dinner in the history of the world, but I don't think he'll run from the altar. He's too good of a guy. She paused. She looked up at Stephen, and yes, there were tears in her eyes as well. He's my heart. And I am yours, he whispered to her. 
By this time, the escort had gathered around Umbra. The woman's eyes went from face to face to face. Yes, I would like to be healed. Sabina used Encanto to turn the arrows to ash. Meanwhile, Tessa healed Umbra. The minute she was whole, the Incan dragon soul took off running. Tessa crinkled her nose. But she said that she perhaps wanted a new prime. Mouse frowned and squinted. Well, I think we can take that as a perhaps not. Stephen wasn't so sure. He knew they'd see Umbra again. But would she be friendly, or would she strike at them again? Look on the hill, Sabina said quietly. They all turned. Under the tree, with loose black clothes flapping in the breeze, stood a woman with a complicated compound bow. A quiver of black arrows was on her back. A black hood covered her head. A black cloth covered her face. Lightning flashed. The flesh around her eyes, the only skin showing, wasn't white, black, or brown. She had dark blue skin. She drew back her hood to reveal white hair, as white as bone. The tips of two pointed ears peeked from her ivory curls. Another flash of lightning, and the shadow archer was gone. Chapter 33 the day after their official wedding, Tessa was the first person up. There were people sleeping everywhere, literally everywhere. A tent city surrounded the Infinity Ranch. Trailers and RVs lined the driveway. It was like a rock concert or a bluegrass festival, and that included the dozen porta potties sitting squarely on the ruins of Wayne Manor. Eve Downfire and her fellow wives were sleeping in the great room, some cuddled up on the floor on sleeping mats, others sleeping alone on the sofas. Imogene Summers and the old PNW wives were in trailers, as were Abner Saavedra and his willbreakers. Javier Jones was staying in the hotel in downtown Cheyenne, as were many of the Central and South American primes. Of course, Bud was there, along with Denise and Femi. When they'd come home, Bud was sexed out. Days upon days of keeping his babes full of animus had taken a toll, and he'd not stopped working, juggling primacy business and the legal battles in Australia. He was thrilled to get a few hours off in the hotel downtown, alone. Denise and Femi had their own rooms. He'd made it clear that he needed a break. Chazzy and Prue had debated the pluses and minuses of staying in a Cheyenne hotel. In the end, they couldn't be away from their new husband. They were staying at the top of the central tower, and they had redecorated with lots of pink and fluff mixed with rawhide and bullwhips. There was even a Bud Light neon sign they'd gotten somehow. It was part roadhouse and part best little whorehouse in Texas. Sabina had her little bungalow, and Prue was invited to join her there. Liam had his home next to her. As for the five widows, they had their houses to the east. Panga Kamong had settled on a little tent in the northeast corner. Tessa and Uchiko had helped him set it up. The Onari guard had set up their tents near him, excited for the rituals that would return them to being human. So far, Uchiko had showed zero signs of any aging. The change seemed permanent. Tessa stood in the kitchen in front of the espresso maker. She looked down at the simple gold band on her hand. Wow. Marriage. And babies. Sabina was going to take the first trip into motherhood. The Latina magician was anxious to meet little Regina. In truth, so was Tessa. A baby at the Infinity Ranch. Hmm. Speaking of kids... The three queens had flown in from Australia, and they were with their kids in a big trailer in the driveway. A baby, a toddler, and the little boy named Cooper, who adored Stephen. He owned all of Australia now. Once the two remaining dragon lords had heard that Panga Kamong had joined Stephen's primacy, they immediately contacted Novak, Boaz, and Jessup to end their legal war and sue for peace. Bud liked to think he was the one who broke their will. It was more the fact that Stephen owned Indonesia as well as most of the Americas. There were a few holdouts in Canada, and there were a lot of European and African primes that were dubious that this child king could really keep his territories together. As far as the coming Zotheric Wars, many were flat out against it. The most outspoken was Silas Forcade, the dragon lord of the Prussian primacy. He didn't like Stephen, he wasn't going to be ruled, and he didn't want to risk the shadows of teeth and talon. Stephen wasn't worried about any of the dragon lords. Tessa had to shake her head at her man. 
True to his nature, Stephen let the Wayne twins plan the wedding while he had his head down, studying Icharam's gifts. Because there hadn't just been a single gift deep underground in Icharam's tomb, there had been five items decorating a statue of Icharam in his partial form. Armor, orb, vambraces, cloak, and crown. This chamber didn't have a Quinestri statue. It didn't need one. They were all pretty sure it was the elf queen who had created it under Icharam's instructions before he died. When they'd come up to the surface bearing the prizes, the place had been surrounded by dragon souls, dragon skins, magicians, morphlings, and warlings. The war was over. Mordred and the other dragon knights were dead, and Stephen Dracarys was victorious. All of the United States was his. Those who weren't sure about Stephen had fled like Umbra. Others immediately began to make arrangements with Javier Jones and Stephen's other lieutenants. Stephen now commanded the biggest force of dragon souls the world had ever seen. And he'd married eight women. Stephen never did anything small. And he was twenty-one years old. Not a bad start. Or so he would say, grinning. Her husband. Wow. It was weird to think that. The ring felt weirder. They were now even more connected. If she closed her eyes, she could feel him, especially when he was excited. The wedding itself had been anticlimactic after facing down a fucking three-headed dragon. Oddly enough, the women who hadn't cried during the battle cried at the wedding. Arya couldn't stop sobbing and was barely able to say her words. Then again, it was late. Dragon souls married at midnight on Sunday night, Monday morning. Ponga offered to do the wedding, but they wanted Liam Strider, who got a little emotional himself. He'd lost his escort fifty years prior, and he'd never gotten over the loss. The five widows and the three queens smiled and cried happy tears during the ceremony. The women didn't want to rush things with Stephen. They were content to wait on marriage. Tessa scooped coffee into the portafilter. She should have been sleeping. Her brother was. Aria had given up her room so Jared could stay in the house. Mouse had as well, so Tessa's mom, sister, and future brother-in-law had a place to crash. However, the barista wanted to start up the coffee. They had their wedding gifts to play with, and they couldn't do it around the humans. Only they were going to. This was the day Tessa was going to show her family who she was and what she could do. If all went well, that day would live in their memories forever. Tessa couldn't wait to see Stephen's mother's reaction when she found out that her son was an actual dragon. They were going to drive out to the cliffs near Guernsey Reservoir. Vassals had driven the Orange Crush, Jeeves, and the Poupon back to the ranch. Chosen Ben and Chickadee Hams, personally, had made sure their beloved Ford Bronco II found its way home. At the sound of the hissing espresso maker, Eve Downfire raised her head. Her sister wives, Agatha Stipe, Hannah Cannon, and Son Savage, gophered up. Coffee? Hannah asked, excited. Let's go help, Agatha bubbled. Tessa was joined in the kitchen, and then the morning was coffee, breakfast, marathon chatting, naps, and another party. Caterers showed up, and they were back in the big event tent as the feasting commenced. Bud said he would cover for them while they were gone. Stephen's escort, Uchiko included, drove up to the reservoir along with Mrs. Whip and the Ross clan. Tessa drove her family in their special van, which had a lift for her brother, Jared. Monday afternoon in early April, the place was deserted. The sun was out, and it was a hot 80 degrees with a wind that had just the right amount of cool to it. Miles of sagebrush perfumed the breeze. Stephen gathered up his mom and Tessa's family. We've been keeping a secret from you. His mom rolled her eyes. We know that you're not just friends. I thought we established that. Chazzy winced. Oh dear, here we go, Prue joined in. He's gonna have to get naked in front of his mom. That's gonna be awkward. Awkward AF. Chazzy cleaned that up. Jared shook in his chair, laughing. I know what AF means, twins. He called them what Tessa did, and that made her smile. Tessa went and stood with Stephen. No, not that. You were at the wedding last night? You know that what we have isn't platonic. Butterflies tickled her belly. Mom? Abigail? Jared? 
Stephen is a dragon, and I'm a sorceress, a descendant of Merlin. I'm kind of a big deal. Mrs. Whip tilted her head. At least the breeze couldn't make her hair any crazier. It was all over the place. She put her red-knuckled hands on her hips. A dragon? I don't believe it. I bathed him when he was little, and I've never seen a single scale. Stephen stripped off his shirt. They'd brought extra clothes. It's true, Mom. Watch. He burst from his clothes and grew into his true form. Sunlight sparkled off his long black body. To emphasize his transformation, he snorted out twin flames from his nostrils. Mrs. Whip frowned and nodded. Yeah, a dragon. I would much rather you be a dragon than a drunk or a gambler. Is it safe, though, this dragon business? Not one bit, Stephen growled. Why do you think we put you in a compound with security? Haru is actually a half-dragon ninja, long story there. But Mom, we just won a war against our enemies. Everything has changed, and we have magic to protect you. I've never been safer than I am right now. Tessa's mom went forward. I have to touch him. I have to be sure. I feel like I'm going crazy. She laid a hand on Stephen's scales. She turned to Tessa and scowled. He's warm. Of course he is. She laughed shrilly. He's a dragon. Abigail and her fiancé Peter both had their mouths open. If their eyes got any wider, their eyeballs would roll right out of their sockets. Jared screamed at the top of his voice, Cool! He had himself propped up by his arms. Mom stomped over to Tessa and grabbed her arm. Tessa Ann Ross, you have never, ever been an easy child, but this, this, this is too much. Then what is this business about being a sorceress? Tessa had to admit she was a little hurt by her mother's reaction. They'd fought, a lot, but this wasn't anything she wanted to be ashamed of. She was proud of who she was and the powerful magician ancestors, warts and all. She could have killed Umbra and eaten her soul, but she hadn't. Watch, Mom, watch. Magica Defensio. She stepped onto the pink platform of her horizontal shield spell. She raised the force field to float out beyond the cliffs and above the lake. She then lifted Jared in his chair with her telekinesis ability. Wow, force powers, Peter the fiancé muttered. Tessa flew back and set Jared back down onto the ground. Tessa, Mom uttered that one word and then closed her eyes. First there was your rebellion, then you were gay, then you were gay and polyamorous, then you were this pansexual, bisexual thing, and now you are a sorceress, a real-life sorceress. Well, I'm at a loss. Jared wasn't. What else can you all do? Zoe came up to him. In her hands was a gold necklace, one of Icharam's gifts. Do you want to see something cool? Not only can I change shape, but dude, I have armor. Jared's eyes widened. Like in the golden compass? You tell me. Zoe put the gold necklace around her neck and then changed into a huge bear, bigger than a Kodiak. She stood over Jared. Watch this next part. Her voice came out as a bear's growl. The necklace glowed and a shimmering golden armor covered her, more energy than iron. The armor necklace could take her animus and shield her using that energy. It held up nicely against spellfire and gunfire. It wasn't so good against exhalants, yet Zoe loved it. She'd become a real tank, able to soak up damage. For someone who liked to charge into battle heroically, it was the perfect gift. B -b -b bear Jared stuttered. Armored bear? Armored bear! Tessa went to her brother and motioned to Sabina. Zoe isn't the only one with armor. Sabina... Do you want to show what your cloak can do? I have a gun in the trunk, Chazzy offered. Mama Ross went pale. Sabina shook her head. No, Chica, it's okay. Just throw your new impetum spells at me. The cloak was black with a slight green tint to it. The magic item had tied itself to Sabina's animus. Chazzy and Prue both hurled pink shotgun scatter at her. The cloak swirled around her and caught every single impetum missile. Magica impetum. Sabina shot her green sparkles into the air and they arced across the lake and disappeared as they fell from the cliffside, vanishing completely before they hit the water. So far, the cloak was great against magical attacks, channeling the animus back into Sabina. Stephen growled in a great voice over them.
We got some wedding presents from a long-lost relative. Like fifty thousand years lost, Mouse sneered. Did you get anything? Jared asked the blonde. Mouse shrugged. A husband? She lifted her hand to show her simple gold band. And this ring? I guess those are cool. I guess. She grinned mischievously to show she was kidding. I do have an ancient sword that burns with a green fire. It's pretty sweet. Merlin had it for a while. Merlin? Jared was vibrating with excitement. Merlin, like if my sister is related to Merlin, then I must be too. Mouse shot him a finger gun. Totally. Jared turned on Chazzy and Prue. Hey, twins, are you just sorceresses, or can you change into cool stuff like Zoe and Steven? Want to show him? Chazzy asked her sister. I certainly do, Prue sniffed. Of course, we're probably not going to be as cool as Zoe and Steven. I mean, wow, a bear and a little boy dragon. Woo! She walked to Jeeves, opened the back, and took out two golden vambraces. Prue slipped one on and threw the other to her twin. Chazzy slid hers on. You like these clothes? Chazzy asked. Not really. Let's give the kid a show, Prue said. Tessa winced. Were they going to get naked? Poor Jared. A boy shouldn't see beautiful naked twins at that age, or he might be ruined forever. What else could ever compare? Instead, the Texas twins turned into homo draconi. Chazzy showed him her teeth. See, we're dragons too, but we do it just a little bit better than the others. Ready to shake and bake, Chaz? Prue asked. You know it. Chazzy vanished and reappeared next to Prue. She disappeared and stood behind Jared. She gently poked his head with a claw. Chazzy then teleported and squatted in front of him. What's awesome, pink, and has limited teleportation abilities? You guys, Jared said with real excitement. Mama Ross tisked the twins. Don't change, human. Just stay as, er, uh, pink dragon ladies. They smell like bubble gum. Jared shouted. He was sweating, slightly pale where he wasn't pink from the sunshine streaming down. Her brother didn't spend much time outside. What else did you guys get? Jared asked. Normal wedding presents, Tessa said. Dishes, a popcorn popper, a toaster, and oh, this might be less flashy, but in the end I think it might be cooler. She walked to the orange crush and retrieved a black velvet bag. Inside was something roughly the size of a small bowling ball. Stephen had slipped behind the Bronco, too, and was putting on clothes so he wouldn't be naked. They had something very special planned. We're going to join a bowling league, Mouse said. She grinned at Chazzy and Prue. And I'm personally inviting the twins. Those girls love to bowl. Guilty pleasure, Chazzy said. Tessa loved that they were all getting along so well. The Wayne sisters were smart, geniuses, in fact, and they were brilliant enough to know how to get along. It's not a bowling ball, Tessa said. She reached in and pulled out a black orb, perfectly round. It turned a dark pink where it touched her fingers. I can cast spells using animus, and this orb here can store animus. It's like a battery. For now, though, it's not going to be for me. It's going to be for you. She gently laid it onto his lap. What? I don't understand, Jared frowned. You'll need it, right? I mean, you're basically superheroes, and you need it to fight crime or whatever. I think we're fighting intergalactic, interdimensional demons next, Mouse said, sighing. Thrilling, miserable, terrible, horrible. Stephen came around and bent down in front of Jared's wheelchair. We'd like to help you, big guy. You won't be able to tell anyone just yet, but soon. It won't matter who knows and who doesn't. Tessa's mother gasped. Abigail looked like she was about to squeeze off her fiancé's arm. Jared's eyes went to Tessa, then to Stephen, then back to Tessa. You have healing spells, don't you? Like, real healing spells? We do, Tessa murmured and took her brother's small hand. We'd like to try healing you. Mom was crying now, as was Abigail. Jared smiled at them. Gosh. Lots of tears last night and today. Whatever, let's try it, Tessa. Let's do this thing. She reached out and felt the autoimmune disease affecting his body. His animus spun perfectly in his body, but that body was damaged. 
She cast Flesh Forge, as did Stephen. They began to adjust his body, channeling the changes through his animus. As they healed his nerves, he laughed. It tickles, but I feel it working. I feel stronger. Tessa smelled Stephen's smoky orange blossom scent, and she loved him, loved how giving he was. The Flesh Forge was temporary, but with each Aram's orb acting as a battery, Jared's body would heal. They hoped that with a few more sessions, they might be able to link the Flesh Forge to his own animus. As long as he rested, ate, and hung out with friends and family, that would be enough to keep him charged. For now, he could just keep the orb near him. Inside were the remnants of each Aram's own energy, and Stephen knew how powerful Alfarian energy was. Mathal had given Stephen the last of his animus before he died. However, the orb was a battery that either Tessa or Stephen could refill using Animus Chain. Jared's muscles were still badly atrophied. That didn't stop him. Tessa and Stephen helped him out of the wheelchair. He stood on his own and turned to his mother. It's a miracle, Mom. She had her hands covering her face, and she was weeping freely. Thanks, man, Jared said to Stephen. Did you get a gift you want to fork over to the poor crippled boy? Stephen mussed his hair. Looks like you won't be crippled for long. I got this crown thing. Pretty lame. I can't figure out what it does. Mrs. Whip rushed over and took her son in her arms. I always knew you were special, she hissed. I love you so much, Stephen. I'm so proud of you. And the most powerful dragon on earth was speechless. What could he say to that? Abigail threw her hands up in the air. This is impossible. Impossible! She stomped away to stand on the cliff overlooking the Wyoming lake. Tessa went to her and took her sister's hand. That wasn't enough for Abigail. She threw an arm across her sister's shoulder. Okay, so you're this powerful wizardess person. But are you happy, Tessa? Tessa smiled and smiled. I've never been happier. You beat me getting married. Abigail hugged her and Tessa closed her eyes. They were alive. Their family now knew about their secrets. Jared was healed, and for the first time in a long time, they were safe. Happy wasn't a big enough word for what Tessa was feeling. Chapter 34 Six months later, Stephen walked from Wayne Manor, which wasn't as huge as the twins first planned. It was still relatively ridiculous, since it was the second biggest house in the compound and only two people lived there. Granted, the two were chastity virtue and prudence pride, and together they equaled like ten normal women. They'd called him over to see if he liked the black velvet painting of dogs playing poker. In the end, he did. It went well with the wagon wheel motif they'd decided on. The gravel crunched under his feet. August on the Great Plains was a hot, dry affair, with savage afternoon thunderstorms. At least they didn't have to fight in them. Stephen had thought six weeks was a long time without battles and intrigue. The months since the Battle of Duquesne Hill felt shorter in some ways, longer in others. This was by far the longest break he'd been given since that fateful night when Edgar Vale had shot him— He'd used it to study, of course, and to get his forces ready for their first strike against the Zotharic. And Spiderfinger, it seemed. Their divination magic wasn't showing them very much. Even Sabina was having trouble getting anything to show up on her radar. Umbra was in the wind. No one had seen her. The Shadow Archer had been a mysterious presence in the Dragon Soul community for centuries, and so they weren't surprised that they couldn't find her. She was elven, for sure, and it was interesting that she'd shown them her white hair and ears. Tessa threw around the words dark elf and drow, but they knew so little about Quinestri and Lyra that they couldn't be sure of anything. More and more, when Stephen cast Magica Divinatio during his meditations, all he saw were the doors at the top of the St. Vrain Airy. He knew that was the next step. The last pages of the third volume of the Dracaris Grimoires were no longer encrypted— they were journal entries from his father, talking about his wives, his children, and his theories on the Zotharic and Alferos. He was suspiciously quiet about the Lyra, which was the name of the elves, and didn't mention Mulcrid or Excalibur at all. Stephen had the idea that he'd taken his father's research into new territory. Stephen moved through the house, which was quiet for once. 
Arya had taken her fellow wives out into the grounds of the Infinity Ranch to train. When they did face the demons, Arya wanted everyone at their best and comfortable with their new weapons. Jared was doing well with the orb. He still went to his doctor's appointments, but he only saw Stephen's vassals. Normal doctors wouldn't have taken his miraculous healing well. Yes, at times he wondered if giving the orb to the kid was the right thing to do, but when they visited and he saw Jared running with new friends he'd made at his new school, well, maybe the universe was worth Jared's joy. Stephen climbed up the steps to where Javier, Saavedra, and Bud were waiting. They were going to do a video conference call with Robert Staines. Another one. The calls were a complete waste of time. Bud had installed a big monitor on the wall to the right of Stephen's desk. Straight ahead was the magical armory that held Samael's lash, the hellstring, Carlo Bart Baxter's rings, the angel knife, and lastly, Icharam's crown. The crown remained a mystery. Maybe it didn't have any powers at all. That didn't feel right, though. Trying to learn enchantrix was proving to be a challenge. Even Panga Kamong wasn't much help. He hadn't progressed down the Alfarian abilities. Panga was a conflicted dragon soul, all right. He was powerful, kind, giving, and yet he could also be difficult, cold, and cutting. At times he was like Tessa, but five minutes later he would be like Mouse. Flighty wasn't exactly the right word for him. Regardless, Stephen knew the higher levels of magic required a firm commitment. Panga wasn't too good at that. Javier, Saavedra, and even Bud were. They were seated in comfortable folding chairs they'd brought from the main house. Bob Staines was already on the screen. He was a thin man, clean-shaven, with strange hair. It was a toupee, obviously, and not a particularly good one. Nevertheless, it was easy to ignore because of the nonsense he spouted. Staines and Bud were at the how-old-are-you-anyway point of their conversations. Bud spat. I'm twenty-two. Saavedra leaned forward. Scars crisscrossed every part of him, including his dark hair, which was chopped up from pink scar tissue. He smiled. Twenty-two, like the Taylor Swift song. We like Taylor Swift, Javier said casually. He was in an expensive silk suit, a light color, which emphasized his dark hair and features. He held out a fist, and Saavedra bumped it. Where is Dracarys? Staines asked, exasperated. I want to talk to Stephen. Stephen moved in front of the webcam. Hey, Bob, I'm here. Are you asking what you always ask? Behind Staines was a bookcase of law books, unread, mere props. The special executive liaison to the supernatural community was in his usual Washington, D.C. power suit, including the red tie. It matched the bloom of frustration creeping up his throat. What are your plans for the humans in the U.S.? All my sources say you don't want to stay hidden. I'm telling you, you can't come out unless we say so. Get that? Stephen turned to his advisors. Did we tell him about Tessa shooting the three tanks? Last time, Javier shot him a finger gun. Oh, Stephen turned back. If we could shoot tanks, we could shoot planes, and if you nuke us, we'll just send them through magical portals. You have no authority over us, Bob? You don't. The president doesn't. No one does. I give you my word. Before we do a thing, we'll let you know. And the U.S. will be the first? Staines asked suspiciously. You talked about maybe going to the U.N. first. Fuck the U.N., Bud hissed. Stephen didn't care much about any of these human politicians. He wasn't ready to reveal himself yet because the Zotharic were still a threat. Once that was no longer an issue, he had an idea on how to change life on Earth. The current powers wouldn't want such a disruption of the status quo. Too bad for them. So can we talk again in two weeks? Staines asked. Stephen didn't hide his displeasure. Why? Staines held up a finger. Wait, one more thing. I almost forgot. This dragon skin ritual. Have you figured out how to make every man, woman, and child a dragon? Bud piped up. No, I can't be. They said so. I don't have the right animus gene or whatever. It's more complicated than that, Stephen said. In truth, the ritual had proved to be so complicated that they hadn't solved the mystery yet. At this point, the burning was required, as was the strict diet and the daily meditation. Despite how hard it was, he already had some of his would-be wives working on prospects. 
The nice thing was that Stephen and Tessa could help anyone who failed, so they could try again. However, those who failed most of the time didn't want to attempt the ritual again. Uchiko, for example, was happy being a warling. Others in the Onari Guard, like Haru, planned on trying again. Liam did say that multiple failures might be fatal. Those who tried again were risking their lives. Stephen wasn't too worried about Haru attempting to become a dragon skin any time soon. He liked Taco Bell way too much. Staines waited for Stephen to respond. Nothing new to report. So why do we need to meet in two weeks? We won't have anything then, either. The slimy bureaucrat tapped a key on his laptop. Okay, well, I have a meeting with the Pentagon, and I know I'll have more questions for you. Two months, Stephen said. Don't move against us, Bob. You won't win. I know that, Staines scowled. Thanks for your time today. They ended the call. Stephen sat down behind his desk. His eyes went to the artifacts, especially the crown, which was a simple gold circlet with a starburst on the front. He'd put it on, but nothing. What did it do, anyway? He had the idea that of the five gifts they found, six if you included Arya's animus daggers, the crown was the most powerful. Javier spoke first. I can see why the humans are scared. Before, there was a balance of power in the United States, and every dragon lord handled their business in secrecy. You made it clear those days are over. Stephen leaned back. They'd gone over all this before. Sure, Javier, right. He switched gears to talk about what was really bothering him, and it wasn't Bob's stains. Sabina wants to get pregnant. She started taking an herb called Tanaquil, which was the name of a Roman queen or a fairy queen. Wikipedia had a lot on it. Congratulations, man, Bud said excitedly. Denise and Femi have been putting out feelers, and I avoid the topic by playing Borderlands 3, a beta version. Javier and Saavedra gave each other uneasy glances. Then both cracked up laughing. What? Stephen asked, a smile on his face. Tanaquil is going to affect her sex drive, Saavedra smirked. With Sabina, that just might mean Stephen would need to bring in a whole new team of wives. He touched his simple gold wedding band. Wearing it felt odd at times. Most of the time, he was too focused to really think about it, yet if he concentrated he could feel where his wives were, but he generally let them keep their privacy. It was nice, though, to feel that connected to them. Javier didn't smirk. He got a concerned look on his face. No, S.A., that ain't nothing. The kid is going to affect your whole pinche life. Nothing will ever be the same once that baby comes. Get your sleep while you can. And you think you're this hotshot dragon lord, but that won't mean shit when you gotta deal with the shit, if you know what I'm saying. Changing diapers? Stephen raised his eyebrows. But I'm like the prime the lost son of Arthur Dracarys, the last of the Dracarys line, a descendant of Icharam. Are you telling me I'm going to have to change poopy diapers? If you don't, Javier furrowed his brow and shook his head. If you don't, you'll want to go fight the evil dragon knights again. It'll be less work. Stephen laughed and got a little nervous, then laughed some more. His two dragon lord friends left to fly back to their primacies, Javier in Mexico and Saavedra in California. Bud drove back to Denver. Stephen thought about being a father. It didn't feel right until he thought of Sabina and how her face glowed when she spoke of Reggie. She loved their little daughter, and she hadn't even been conceived yet. With dragons, sometimes it took a long time. He would enjoy the Tanaquil, though, unless it killed him. But what better way to die? He enjoyed the quiet of the house, then looked down at the stub of his missing left finger. He pulled up the path of the mirror-souled dragon. He had another level under his belt, and he'd gotten just a bit better at controlling his animus. He hadn't been able to tackle toxicity, and he frowned when he remembered Mordred spitting acid at him. He had to start working on his exhalants, and yet, he couldn't stop studying the Alfarian abilities until he mastered Enchantrix. That would give him access to Carlo Bart Baxter's ring armor, and he thought it might unlock the powers of Icharam's crown. And, to get to Stellar Flight, he had to learn Enchantrix first. And what was the sixth and final Alfarian ability? He didn't know. His eyes went back to Fleshforge. Countless times over the past six months, he'd thought of trying it to regrow his pinky. In truth, 
he didn't have the courage. What if, when he added the cells, he accidentally added an extra joint to his finger? It was unnerving and unsettling. More than that, he didn't feel like he needed the finger. It wasn't his sword hand, and he could function fine without it. Still, he wondered who the mysterious spider finger was, and why both had the same issue. Stephen listened to the quiet of the house for several long minutes, and then he made up his mind. A second later, the front door opened. The noise, shouting, and fun started right up. Bollywood movies aren't just about singing and dancing. We have stories, Arya said loudly. They were going to make her a loud American yet. Mouse had obviously said the wrong thing. Girl, I'm sorry, I take it back. Tessa was there to defend them both. Arya, you have to admit, Bollywood movies are a thing, but I say we should all start singing and dancing when we fight. That would be awesome. I can't dance in my armor, Zoe said laughing, but I can try. I'm getting a lot better. Sabina joined in. My cloak can dance by itself, I think. Can we watch Doctor Strange again tonight? Uchiko was silent, but of course she'd be silent. Then he heard the three words that touched his heart. Stephen, we're home. Tessa always shouted to him, always invited him to join them in whatever they were doing. He stood up. He would enjoy this peaceful life for another month. Then he would accept his fate and bring true change to the world. September, and the winds were cold, while the days were warm. The yellow leaves on the cottonwoods surrounding the St. Vrain Airy crinkled and spun in the breeze. The murky scent of the river rose up to them. It was running low, having sent the snowmelt from the Rockies to the east. Stephen and his escort stood on the rooftop, armed, supplied, and ready to open the wolf door to Gaia Beta. His eyes went to the mosaic of the Draco constellation on the floor, and it brought back such good memories. There were four doorways carved into the backs of the animal statues at the top of the tall spire. They'd come through the dragon door. Across from it was the wolf animal, Gaia Beta, with the eagle to the left, Lyra, and the cat to the right, Oikos. Reinforcements surrounded the airy, and it was like their wedding. Tents, RVs, trailers, and all their friends and allies supporting this crazy thing they were doing. Dragons flew over them. Stephen recognized Liam Strider, Panga Komong, Javier, Saavedra, and dozens of females, including the five widows. Stephen had led his core escort up the tower and onto the roof. There were eight women with him, so he couldn't really call them the Lucky Seven or the Heavenly Seven. Prue suggested the Lovely Eight, but Stephen wasn't sure he wanted to limit himself with the number. He turned. The twins had their big assault rifles, pink bags, and, of course, matching pink lipstick. Chazzy blinked and smiled at him. Prue and I are ready. You certainly need to speak for yourself, sister, Prue complained. We are pursuing an enemy we know very little about, and I'm scared shitless, gotta be honest. But are you ready? Chazzy teased. Prue rolled her eyes. Ready as I'm ever gonna be? Fuck. Don't worry. I've been reading up on our next batch of big bad wolves. Tessa had her pistols and her gun belt full of bullets. She was wearing the wool serape and her trusty leather satchel, which held the magical topaz pen as well as their books. She'd added a fourth tome, something she'd grabbed from Rahab's super-secret library above Mont Saint-Michel. In Dragon Script, it was called The Zotheritrix. It was a brief history of the shadows of teeth and talon, some legends, some eyewitness accounts, pretty much everything that was known about their enemy. Mouse sighed. Books. Yay. That last word came out flat. Maybe instead of dragons, we should send librarians to fight the scourge of the galaxy. Scourge of the universe, Sabina said, her eyes bright emeralds. She pulled her cloak around her tight. She wasn't pregnant. Yet. Chica, I think they eat galaxies for breakfast. Uchiko kept silent. Her eyes were on Stephen, and he met her gaze, and again, he was struck by how pretty she was, and how she'd found peace at long last. Maybe that serenity was what made her beautiful. It definitely made her deadly. She had her kusarigama. She also had the hell string and a quiver of white arrows. 
He wasn't sure that bringing the magical bow was a good idea, but Uchiko had been practicing with it. So far, it hadn't driven her insane or summoned demons. There was an animus component to it that so far remained a mystery. She was bringing the bow, and he'd packed Ichiram's crown. Zoe looked visibly nervous. Sunlight gleamed off the necklace on her throat. She was wearing a heavy coat and carried a big backpack. And we can't fight them on this world? Stephen went to her, pulled her close, and kissed her. No, Zoe, we don't want to invite demons here. My mom and the Rosses are safe, and I want to keep it that way. He went to pull away, but Zoe had other ideas. She gripped him and kissed him, long and hard. Sabina's tanaquil was working overtime, and she came in for a kiss from them both. Then the hugs started, and soon Stephen was lost at the center of his escort. He remembered his battle with Mordred and his thoughts of Tessa. If he'd died, Tess would have been saved by these powerful women. And right at that moment, he knew it was truth. Whatever nightmares they found in Gaia Beta, he knew as long as they were together, they would win. He took a moment to enjoy the warmth of their bodies and their various scents, from the Wayne twins and their bubblegum sweet to Arya's cinnamon, Tessa's cherry, and Mouse's almond smells. It felt like home. Then it was time to leave. They had a universe to explore, and they couldn't cross into other worlds until the threat of the Zothric was ended. Tessa stepped back. Okay, guys, let's get out of Dodge. Shit, Chazzy said. She dug into her clothes until she found her wallet. She fished out a hundred dollar bill. Prue took it from her. Told you she'd say it eventually. Yeah, it took seven months, but it was less than a year. You know me. I like the long game. Tessa grinned. Of course I wasn't going to say it while we were in Kansas. Too easy. But here? Now? It seemed fitting. Chazzy sighed. Focus, guys. Stephen stood in front of the wolf door. Magica in Canto, he called out. The door cracked open. Light poured out. When it creaked open completely, they were shown the blasted landscape of another world. This has been Dodge City Nights, book six in the American Dragons series, written by Aaron Crash, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Production coordination by Blue Nose Audio. Post-production by Featured Audio. Production copyright 2020 by Shadow Alley Press. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.